SAIC is a Fortune 500 technology company that serves the U.S. government in advancing our country's most critical mission. What makes us unique is the way we work hand in hand with our customers and have for over 50 years. We deliver unmatched speed to value by providing advanced technology solutions, whether they are commercially available, uniquely designed, or a combination of the two. And we identify and integrate those technologies unlike any other company. Through our cloud solutions, digital engineering, enterprise IT, or other offerings, we deliver capabilities that matter. Our 26,000 highly skilled and trained people are by far our greatest asset. And along with our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, create a competitive advantage. Diversity of thought provides the best outcomes. And we foster a culture where inclusion leads to innovation. Technology is the key to the future. And we ensure that key unlocks the potential of government to better protect and serve our citizens, especially when it comes to no-fail missions. This is why our customers trust us when the stakes are highest. I am SAIC. We are SAIC. I am SAIC Proud. We are SAIC Proud. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage INSA President Suzanne Wilson Heckenberg. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Welcome. So this is our sixth annual New IC Symposium. Six years. Crazy to think that some of us are six years older. Um, but what a delight to reflect on um, the trajectory of this event since 2017 and how time flies. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the networking. Um, there'll be plenty more of that to come. Um, we do have a jam-packed day. If I keep things on time, then, then I've certainly done my job already today. Um, but before we move on, I really would like to um, give a shout out to our sponsors. If you are with a sponsoring organization, um, when I call out your company, um, please just raise your hand. It's so important um, to help support these conversations that we're able to have today. So first off, GDIT. Raise your hand if you're with GDIT. Thank you. Guidehouse. Thank you, Guidehouse. Lockheed Martin. Mantech. Noble Reach. Northeastern University. Raytheon Technologies, and SAIC. So next up, I want to um, point out our supporting partners. These are other nonprofits um, in the community really doing great things for the IC and the national security community, also future leaders. And if you don't know these organizations yet, take some time during the networking breaks to um, introduce yourself and get involved with some of their programming. Um, first up is Amazing Women of the Intelligence Community, AWIC. If you're with AWIC. Clearance Jobs, where's Lindy back there? The Cyber Guild, one of our new partners who is hosting an event, I believe, here week after next in the same room. So get to know the Cyber Guild. Girls Security. Iron Butterfly, and USGIF. We're also well, um, happy to welcome members of the press today. Um, as a reminder, um, this conversation is on the record and being recorded. If you like what you're hearing and what you see, um, please feel free later in the week to pass the recording on to your colleagues and friends. Um, and if you plan on sharing via, via social media today, please use hashtag the new IC so we can help amplify your messages. And we encourage you all to, um, is it, do you say X now? I don't, do we call it tweet anymore? Um, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn. Um, and I'd also like to thank the amazing INSA events team. Um, some were here before 6 a.m. this morning. Um, Toya Cribs and Allie Bailey. Um, as well as our incredible INSA graduate student interns. I also wanted to mention we are um, 
having the hiring process right now for our next class of INSA interns. So if you know of any young people or even more mature people who are in graduate school who are looking to work in the intelligence community, please go on our website, forward along the link to apply. Um, it's really a really great program and take a moment to introduce yourselves to some of our interns today who are all looking for jobs in the intelligence community. Um, they've worked really hard um, with our events team to make today a reality. Um, we want today to be as interactive as possible. Um, it's a very collaborative program. I'd like to think a little more informal um, than some of our classified events and policy programs. Um, and so look around you. Um, if there's somebody you don't know, um, please introduce yourselves. Um, today really offers an incredible opportunity to expand your professional networks. So please get to know one another at your table and beyond. Um, and when the time comes for audience questions, um, these INSA interns, again, all looking for jobs with the intelligence community will either be passing around microphones or taking question cards, depending on the speaker and the panel. Um, and so also, I wanted to say that it is my pleasure to have our keynote here, Carmen Medina. Um, Carmen is recognized um, as a national and international expert on intelligence analysis, strategic thinking, diversity of thought, and innovation as well as an entrepreneur for the public sector. She is the co-author of Rebels at Work, a handbook for leading change from within. Carmen's story as a change agent at CIA is featured in the Wharton School professor Adam Grant's best-selling book, Originals, How Non-Conformists Move the World. From 2005 to 2007, Carmen was part of the executive team that led the CIA's analysis directorate. She was a leader and continues to be on diversity issues. Carmen was the first CIA executive to conceptualize many IT applications now used by analysts, including blogs, online production, and collaborative tools. She has personally given a great deal to improve intelligence in our community. In her last assignment before retiring, she oversaw the CIA's Lessons Learned program. Please welcome to the stage, Carmen Medina. Good morning. I want to uh, thank you all for coming to this event and uh, supporting INSA and uh, supporting the idea of uh, progress in the intelligence community. I was looking at the uh, agenda <clears throat> and uh, the four main topics, prioritizing workplace well-being, fear of failure, reimagining skiff life. I've read that report, and it's a good one, and diversity fatigue. And I got to thinking, what's going on here? Uh, you said this was the sixth year that you'd had this, and I bet some of these topics have been on or some version of them every year. Why is it so hard for the intelligence community to make progress on these issues? And so I want to tell you a little story about my time in uh, CIA. So when I was on the seventh floor, then it was called the Directorate of Intelligence, now it's called the Directorate of Analysis. I, um, uh, it was 2005 and uh, the internet, access to the internet was becoming increasingly important for analysts. In fact, you know, most analysts would look at the internet every day and uh, for information about their issue and much to the chagrin of sort of the old guard and, um, but we had lousy internet equipment. We had internet to the desktop, we had like two separate systems, but the system just sucked, basically, the, the internet. And so I had a monthly every, uh, well obviously every month, with the central intelligence, the central CIO, the central, the chief information officer at CIA, and at the time it was Al Tarasic. I don't know if anyone knows Al, uh, great man, and uh, so I was having my monthly, and I said, oh, well, and let me just say that for someone in the front office of analysis to actually keep their monthly meeting with the CIO was like a new thing. 
that normally we had sort of disdained them for some reason. So uh, I'm having my monthly and I'm telling him about all the issues that we have with the internet. And the internet is so balky, the, it performs so badly, and, and you know the analysts really need it. And we had been having this conversation multiple times. This is the upteenth conversation. Somehow I say something that triggers something in his mind and he goes, are you telling me that access to the internet is mission critical for the analysts? And I looked at, I swear this is a true story, and I, I, I caught on right away and I said, yes, it is mission critical. And he goes, would you be willing to sign a, an official memorandum saying so? And, I, and I'm thinking, is that what it takes? So I said, absolutely. And then he goes, good. And, and then would you support uh, me in the uh, uh, XCOM meetings when I ask for a, a higher budget? And I go, yes, of course. And that's how we slowly finally began to make some improvement. So, I'm going to give you two words, mission critical. For, <laughs> for every one of these things that have to be part of the new IC, it's in really important for you to make the case that it is mission critical. So some other, I know we're going to save a lot of time for questions, so I, I want to give you some other reflections when I was looking at the agenda. Um, on the issue of prioritizing workplace well-being, what I've learned uh, over the years is that, at least at CIA, that's all I can talk about with any expertise. I think the military is much better at this, but I will say at CIA, when I was a manager, we were incredibly ill-informed about human performance and the performance of teams. That is a huge field in organizations. It's a huge area of uh, focus for what are called high performance, high reliability organizations. People have to do something very difficult reliably, like aviation. That's, a, that's a, a, the key example. And in aviation, they spend a lot of time thinking about human performance. So all of these things I never learned as a CIA manager. The startle factor. Who knows what the startle factor means? It means when you experience something new for the very first time, your mind doesn't process it very well. So if you're expecting someone to make the right decision in 30 seconds, but it's really new, it's gonna take them much longer. And that's why at least one of those Boeing 737 MAX planes fell out of the sky because of the startle factor. Sleep and good rest is essential for human performance. And I think back on all the 12-hour task forces six days a week that we managers at CIA uh, imposed upon people. Nutty. So on this issue of uh, prioritizing workplace well-being, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. That information is all out there. We just have to make it, two words, mission critical. Um, uh, on all of these, uh, I reflected on something that I, I, I uh, concluded was an issue with the intelligence community and CIA in particular at the time I retired. And that is that somehow the IC has put itself in this position where it's at war with modernity. So almost everything that, uh, that is new in technology, for example, and in, in reimagining skiff life has to do with technology. And we're just at war with it. We, we the, the intelligence community just feels that all the things that are becoming essential to human life are never or hardly going to be essential for the intelligence community. We can do without those things. And let me tell you, you cannot fight modernity. I think eventually modernity wins if for no other reason than that people of my generation pass away, right? So. Uh, you know, I, I wish we could get beyond that, and it, it's very frustrating to me that we continue on, along these ways. I mean, I would have thought for now, we, by now we would have solved the problem of mobility, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, access to Wi-Fi in government buildings, and I know when I left in 2010, I was told, oh, a solution is coming, but I, I, I don't think it's here yet. 
Um, the, uh, and then the third sort of point I want to make about that are kind of relevant to all these initiatives that you're going to spend time talking about today is that the intelligence community suffers from what I like to call the Athena complex. Um, and the intelligence community is not alone in suffering from the Athena complex, but I think uh, because it's government and because it's high performance, high reliability, uh, it suffers particularly badly from that. Now, who knows what I'm talking about when I say the Athena complex? Who knows the birth origin of the goddess Athena of wisdom? Okay, that's the first hand I saw. Just yell it out. Yes. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, comes out from the head of Zeus, fully formed, all her combat gear, carrying her shield and whatever. What does that have to do with a new IC? When you're a change advocate and you have an idea for something new, the status quo demands that you have a perfectly hatched idea. Your idea for something new has to be fully formed like Athena emerging from the forehead of Zeus. Now, did the status quo, did what we have now today emerge fully formed on day one? Of course not. Uh, the status quo is, continues to be the result of iterative, incremental accumulation of good ideas, some bad ideas, and they just keep accumulating and growing. That's how stuff happens organically in the real world. But when you're a change advocate, you uh, are asked, first, you, first the status quo expects that from you, and then you s impose on yourself that expectation, that whatever ideas I'm going to bring forward, I have to have them completely packaged and all of the answers figured out. And that, I think, is a recipe for failure. So as a change agent, as you think about what the new IC needs, uh, you, you need to first remind people of how the status quo got to be the status quo, and second, refuse to accept that burden of being an Athena uh, from the start. Make it, as Suzanne said, collaborative from the very beginning. So uh, this month is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, and I'm a Puerto Rican. What, Boricua. Okay, any others? Okay, it's great, Boricuas. Boricua by, Borinquen, Borinquen, by the way, is the, uh, uh, original name, supposedly, uh, I'm only saying supposedly because the historical records are, you know, flawed, but Borinquen is the name we are told that the indigenous people applied to the island of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is uh, Spanish for rich port, abundant port, and uh, so Puerto Ricans have for centuries, I guess, called themselves Boricuas. The indigenous people didn't call themselves that, but we adopted that name, which I think is, is just great because um, I think we're one of the few people who still honor that original indigenous term for the place by what we call ourselves, right? So, you know, America, Americo, this whatever his name was, was an Italian, right? So, but Boricuas at least represents a little more authentically the heritage of, of that piece of land. And uh, so I, 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 know, I know diversity is something that you're gonna talk about, and, and I wanted to make uh, just a couple of comments about the diversity issue. I don't, I, you know, until diversity becomes mission critical, and it is what everyone talks about all the time, not just the minorities on certain particular days. We're not going to make progress on an issue which 
is so essential to intelligence because diversity of thought is one of the great things that, that we need to have in the intelligence community. Um, when I was uh, on the seventh floor, one of my rules was that we would talk about diversity all the time. Uh, I find oftentimes in organizations, diversity is spoken about uh, on, um, uh, on you know, one day a year when the strategic diversity plan is discussed, uh, and then not again brought up in that really mission critical meeting until the next year. And I, I think that is totally uh, inappropriate and, and uh, totally wrong and actually somewhat offensive uh, in, in, in my mind, the way I think about it. So uh, diversity has to stop being a vanity statistic, a statistic that you throw out to show that you're a modern manager or that, that you're thoughtful uh, th that has to stop. Uh, it has to be considered mission critical. And then the third thing I'm going to say is that the advancement of diversity has to stop being the job of people who are minorities. Advancement of diversity... <laughs> advancement of diversity has to be a job for everybody, and, and, and I'm gonna end with this example, um, and then we'll turn to questions. Uh, there was an article that was published online in December 2021, I'm not gonna mention the author, in the, uh, I think it's called, in the International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. And the article was called Demographic Diversity in the US, in US Intelligence Personnel, is it functionally useful? So that, that, that was the article. And the person was making the case that there wasn't a whole lot of good evidence that diversity is functionally useful. I don't have any problem with that. I think there isn't a lot of good evidence. There's a lot of reasons why there isn't a, 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 a lot of uh, good evidence. Uh, but that's not the point of what I'm trying to say. Uh, wh what struck me as tremendously amusing about that article, I mean, I laughed out loud is uh, the author quotes about, let's say, 10 individuals in the article to talk about the issue of diversity in the intelligence community. Uh, uh, Jim Clapper, he, uh, John Brennan, he quotes a couple of other analysts, three or four outside critics, talks to all these people. So let's say there's 10, right? He quoted me, and he quoted a professor, I believe, at Columbia University. Of the 10 people he quoted, only two of them were identified by their ethnic origin. Who were the two people identified by their ethnic origin in that article? Me and the African-American professor. And when I, when I realized this, I laughed out loud when he, when he wrote Carmen Medina, a Puerto Rican. I went, wait a minute, did he identify anybody else by their ethnic heritage? No. Now, it seems to me that this is a flaw in that article that any decent editor should have caught. And I, you know, I'm sorry to be so, no, I'm not sorry to be so blunt. Any decent editor should have caught that. And that is, I think, a good example of how of, of, of what it means when diversity isn't everyone's responsibility. It shouldn't be the responsibility of minorities to call out the problems. It puts us in really uncomfortable positions, frankly. And I'm happy to take an answer on that and tell the story about it. So, I don't know, did I wake you up? <laughs> well, I am really happy to take uh, questions now and, and ask me anything. So uh, good morning, uh, Carmen, and over here. 
Back here. Ah, hey, how are uh, you doing? Thank you so much. And the introduction forgot the most important part of your title, which is member of the Board of Visitors of the National Intelligence University. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> and and we're proud to have you uh, have you as our as part of our leadership. Um, so I'm fascinated that you ended your talk with a discussion about that article because that was kind of what was on my mind and what I was jotting down as I was going forward here. It seems like um, the, this whole question about diversity benefiting mission, right, and being mission critical in the, in the terms that you used. There are many people, probably most of those in this room by self-selection, who essentially take it as a given. Diversity is a good thing, diversity advances our mission, et cetera, wonderful. Then you get people like the author of the article that you talked about who, uh, you know, who say, show me, prove it, do the research, show me how it's useful. Um, and then you get the people who say, well, no, we shouldn't be proving it because it's a societal value. We should have an intelligence community that looks like America, that we should have equal opportunity for all, and that we should be doing it as a societal value without having to prove that it's useful. So I'm wondering sort of how you've reconciled that. And if I can, can just elaborate a bit further, uh, I had the, the privilege of uh, being at the International Studies Association when the author of that article um, responded um, not too kindly to the, uh, the author of an article um, rebutting uh, his his piece, so uh, so I had some personal experience of the the confrontations that are happening in academia on this issue. But um, one question I would have also is, as we're trying to de if we're going to demonstrate you the utility of diversity, is there a risk that we get into some diversity is useful and other diversity is not? And I'm thinking, for example, that the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act had some language in it highlighting the importance of diversity, but coming out of the 9-11 Commission and from the discussions that were taking place on Capitol Hill around the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, they were specifically talking about, oh, we need more heritage Arabs, Arabic speakers, right? Okay, there aren't a whole lot of heritage Arabic speakers who are coming, whose, whose origin is from Sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America. So do we only want the diversity that is, you know, directly proven relevant to, um, you know, a, a, a particular mission need right now? Uh, does that l end up limiting our concept of diversity and the utility of diversity? Sorry for the long question. Wow, there's a lot there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so on the three reasons why diversity uh, I mean, I even, I, I actually even hate talking about this in these terms because to single out diversity as a value uh, when it should just be a normal operational value of the organization always makes me uncomfortable. Diversity is not a special value. It's not a new value. It's, it's, it's just a component of you know, organic good living. This is what diversity is about. So uh, yes, I think the government should represent the, the population that it serves. Uh, yes, I think it's obvious why diversity uh, is important or valuable because like evolutionary principles and biological principles tell us so irrespective of this bizarre question of skin color. Uh, and yes, I also think diversity of thought, which is what I emphasize, that is the mission critical part of the diversity discussion. Diversity of thought improves the work of the intelligence community. And, and, and the only other thing I will say here is that the reason why it is difficult for us to prove or to document or to quantify the value of diversity in the intelligence community is that we have done a very poor job of quantifying the uh, value or the, uh, and uh, quantifying and understanding the cognitive processes that lead to good intelligence. 
what policymakers want from intelligence practitioners is insight. Define that word. You know, that's the first thing. Do we have, do we really understand what insight is? I'm really asking you to think hard about this. What is insight? We don't, we don't quite understand what insight is, and, we, and since we don't understand what it is, we don't understand the process that we should use to routinely produce it. You know, we, we don't know what to tell our analysts to say, if you do this and this and this and this, because that's what they want, you can more reliably produce insight. We don't, we don't understand that. It, and, and there was a very good paper that unfortunately has gotten very little play, was written by a fellow at the National Intelligence University. Oh, I, I should have written it down, but it's, it, it, it's about understanding insight. And he actually did a study where he talked to analysts who had moments of insight and asked them to explain their circumstances. So it was, it was an attempt to finally do some empirical work on this. Uh, and uh, just look it up on the NIU, uh, I think the, uh, the author's name is Adrian Wolfberg. I, I, I hope I got that right. But anyway, we have a big, you know, the reason why we can't quantify the value, specific empirical value of diversity, is that we can't quantify anything about analysis. There's, there's almost nothing. You know, like when I was director of analysis, and someone told me I have an extra $10 million to spend. I could not tell you at the margin what was the best place to invest that money. Should I spend that $10 million on external contracts? Should I spend that $10 million on language training? Should I spend that $10 million on uh, uh, more foreign travel? I mean, I. I I could not empirically make that decision. And I, I believe that that was wrong. And, and um, anyway, I could talk about this for way longer than you want to listen to it, so I'll stop right there. I know there's another question, and there are people with mics that, that have are. One more question over here. Where, where's the mic? Yeah, so there are people that, that want to ask questions. So, yeah. Lenora Peters Gant, I am a retired uh, senior executive from ODNI. I um, retired about four years ago and I went straight to Howard University. But when I was in the intelligence community, I had a program called the IC Centers of Academic Excellence. And in that program, I had 30 plus universities. And when I went out, when I went out, to talk with presidents of those schools, I told them, we're looking for diverse talent for mission critical needs. Now, all that being said, when I think about my time in the intelligence community, working a component of diversity, the problem is, and this happens across federal government, we embed diversity in EEO, which is mandated. Diversity is not mandated, you're right. I've been preaching diversity as a mission concept for years now, Carmen. But I would like to say when you work in the intelligence community, we have a mid-level manager um, apparatus, a structure, that sometimes we go out and recruit the best and brightest. But if we don't treat them right, let's forget about diversity altogether. Let's talk about well-being. Of course. Let's talk about belonging. Let's talk about advancement. When you bring talent in, they need to know that there is a career ladder for them, for everybody. And you train them in a way that they can serve the mission very well. You don't separate people by their skin color. What you do is train them when they come in so they want to stay. Because in many instances, when we look at the Stokes program across the intelligence community, that was initially designed for minorities coming into the community in mission critical areas. Well, what happened in that regard, the lawyers got a hold to it across the, C across the IC, and that program eventually became minority white. 
there were very few minorities, so they had to go back and look at that. It's how you interpret and interpret things and how you want to develop people. So I would say we need to develop a mid-level manager cadre of people who know how to deal with the multi-generational workforce and who knows how to develop talent consistently across the board. And fair and equal does not mean, to, mean the same thing to me. Treating people fair means sometimes treating them unequal. That's how I see it. But let's think about diversity in terms of belonging, critical advancement to do the critical mission of these organizations, and of course, belonging to a group that will help them advance in the long run. Mentoring and sponsorship. And many times that doesn't exist. Right now, I deal with the intelligence community. I have a crater at, at, at Howard University with NSA, with NGA, and I tell you, with me working with those agencies having been in the community for so long, they still having the same problems because in some instances, they've embedded diversity in EEO and it should not be there. Well, thanks, yeah, and, and you know, the, I know the topic uh, uh, is diversity fatigue, is, is, am I right? Yeah, and I think there is, there is a fatigue um, and, um, and, and it just represents, reflects things that we haven't done right for many years. I think that if we concentrate on employee well-being, I think a lot of good things will naturally flow from that that will benefit everyone. And I, I just want to make a, uh, you reminded me of something that I wanted to say about that article that I forgot to say. What I found very upsetting about being identified as a Puerto Rican is, you know, when I'm standing here, I don't think of myself as a Puerto Rican. I'm just an American intelligence community professional. That's my identity. And it's very disappointing when you see that other people don't see that first, that their gaze sees something else first. And that's deeply psychological issue that, that no diversity program can fix. All right, let's have a, another uh, uh, hopefully non-diversity question, because I didn't really, uh, go ahead. Well, if you have a diversity question, go ahead, ask it. We're then good. I'm We're about, good. I'm about to disappoint you. Um, hi, I'm Amelia. Uh, she, her, and I'm a Jewish American. And I apologize in advance for this question because it's putting emotional labor on you. So I apologize for putting the burden on you. But with all of those caveats, if we want to be good allies, do you have three actionable things that we can do to minimize the burden on our diverse counterparts and our teammates? What are the <sighs> things that we can do? And um, bonus points if they are snarky or mean, that we can no. like actually no. go hard and be real change agents. Oh my gosh, I don't know that, I don't know that I can say, th I, okay, among my uh, people here, do you have three actionable things that, that, uh, um, that you wanna share? Three actionable things. Yes, okay, we got one here. I'll keep thinking. Thank you, and thank you for that question. My name is Shaw Alexander from Lockheed Martin from the uh, California Bay Area, San Francisco. And um, when we had uh, the George Floyd incident occur, there was a lot of um, allies who wanted to try to make a difference, right? And so um, at Lockheed, they were asking, like, what can we do? What can we do? And the best advice that I've seen is that start with the people who are closest to you to try to change their hearts and minds. That might mean your uncle at Thanksgiving. That might mean your brother. That might mean your mom or your dad. Start with the people who are closest to you, have the conversations, try to change their hearts and minds, and thereby we make change. So that's my recommendation, is to start with the people who you can have a conversation with and talk to, because only then will we really be able to change 
you know, the way we think about things and the way we think about each other. Thank you. I, I, I would just say, and then we have another question here, I would just say that something I've thought about is when you notice an issue of fairness or inequity or something like that, you mention it. I don't know how many times I've been in meetings where there's been a discussion and I, I go, that's wrong. But I, since I don't want to be identified for any number of reasons as the person that always says that's wrong, because people tend not to like you when you're that person, I'm like waiting, waiting, waiting for someone else to notice that the problem and nobody says anything. I'll give you an example. Uh, 20 years ago, I was in an office where there was a senior person who would talk about th South Asian and Arab heritage people, this is right after 9-11, in horrible ways, demeaning ways. Like one of the least offensive things I ever heard him say is that India has never been the same since the British left. You know, please. And I would go, is not, is, are none of my colleagues gonna notice this? Do they actually have a filter that prevents them from seeing this or hearing it? What, what is going on? But nobody did. So actionable, you know, if you notice it, say something. Every single time. Oh. I have to tell you, can I, can I tell you this story? Am I being too whatever? No. <laughs> I, was at a, I, was at X, oh, I was at a company uh, uh, a year and a half ago, and it was a conference, uh, a workshop I was speaking at about being a rebel at work, and the room was predominantly men, and there were four women. This was a male-dominated industry, and... Uh, People are talking, you know, it's, it's a storming and norming kind of thing. And one of the guys at that far end of the conference room uses the word for a female dog as an adjective. You know, X, this was blank mess or something. And the woman who worked at this company next to me stood up and she went, literally, she went, Foul, foul, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> foul, you use a sexually charged term inappropriately in, a government, in, a, in an official meeting. And I was like, holy moly, right? So have you, has anybody ever heard, seen something like this in, in one of their meetings? But let me tell you, the guy who said that, I bet never said that word again <laughs> in that way. All right, I know you have a comment. Uh, there's a couple back here. I, you know, I think, well, I, we're approaching 10, right? So, yeah, so we'll take these two questions and then maybe, yes. Hi, Carmen. Hi. Uh, it's good to see you. Oh, um, hey, hi. <laughs> I'm Jackie Barbieri. I'm the CEO and founder of Whitespace. And I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you one more diversity question. Ugh, okay. But it I shouldn't have ended there, but I yeah. could have started there, but that wouldn't have been any good either. Yeah, it's not going to be an easy <laughs> one either. Okay. But it's very simple. How should we define diversity? Uh -huh. Because it's not just about ethnic background or race or gender, especially when we're talking about getting to the right mix of types of people to get to the best insight, right? That's what we're yeah, here for, and right? So that's my question. Yeah, so you know, I, I define it I, by default by talking about diversity of thought, which sort of operationalizes the concept and sometimes people will criticize me because, uh, correctly, because they'll go, well, there's, you know, diversity of thought may not actually capture the diversity of the nation for whatever reason. And, uh, and I would say, yes, I mean, I just think, you know, that Rick provided a, it is Rick, right? Provided a, it is Rick, right? Huh? Whatever, I got it wrong, but. <laughs> Uh, it is, um, uh, there are, I think, three 
at least three ways of thinking about diversity because it's, it's right, it's, it's like evolutionary sound. It's uh, uh, mission critical or we represent, you know, we should represent our country. And I think all three of those are equally valuable. But I think when you get right down to it, diversity of thought is the operational uh, consequence, should be the uh, operational consequence of diversity of all these other diversities. And I know when I've explored this issue, uh, for example, I was reading an article about Asian Americans who live, who are, were adopted, and so live their whole life in a you know, classic middle America community in Kansas. And, and one of them was quoted in an article I was reading where they said, I know I've been recruited because they think I'm Asian American, but really I'm not, I'm not that, anymore, or I don't present whatever is a value of an Asian way of, of uh, heritage or whatever, it's not there. So it's a very complex issue. Uh, and I, I think, you know, I think two things. We have to understand what are the best inputs for good analysis, which we do not understand. And, uh, and I think when we understand it, I'm positive diversity of ideas and thinking is gonna be a critical part of it. Next question. What, what? Hi, hey. Hi there. I had a diversity question too, but I'm gonna to pivot. Okay. You've had too many of those. So uh, thank you very much this morning. Great, inspiring speech, really appreciate it. Um, since you've retired, uh, how do you still find yourself being a change agent to influence in ways that you effectively did during your career? I'm just curious. I mean, say that again, that Since how- Since you've retired, how are you still um, getting your voice heard and well, being yeah. an agent oh, okay. for change? Well, it's a bit of a mystery to me, yeah. but- uh, uh, I mean, you know, being a co-author of a book is helpful. Uh, uh, being an engaging public speaker is helpful because people ask you to do it. Uh, I've been very lucky to be one of the founding members of the Amazing Women in the Intelligence Community. Hooray! Uh, and a founding uh, member, so to speak, of Iron Butterfly. Uh, I uh, will speak to any, any student group that invites me for any reason, unless there's a horrible uh, calendar problem, I will be there. Uh, and so I uh, am also using all the new media. I have a YouTube channel I just started, uh, because why not? Uh, by the way, if you haven't figured it out, YouTube is the way Generation Z is that's what they're into, and TikTok, obviously. Uh, but it, the, the video thing, I mean, just think about it. What we do now is we write a book so that it can be turned into an audio book because that's really how people like to consume them. So why don't we just go audio from the start? That was my thinking. Uh, my YouTube channel is called Cosas de Osos. That means things that bears do in Spanish, which was my grandmother's favorite saying about things that were crazy or nutty. Oh, that's something a bear would do. Esas son cosas de osos. All right, I think, is there one last question that someone's got the mic, and then I think we gotta stop. Yes. Hi, I'm Steve Moretto from the Department of the Navy. Um, a while back, our command had a uh, speaker called uh, Dr. Steve Robbins. I don't know if you've heard him. But he really turned me to, from a skeptic to a believer in uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, and I don't know if you would agree, but it's more about the cost of exclusion than you know, trying to quantify diversity. What if we excluded the the Indians, the Apache code talkers from our World War II effort. What if we excluded 
to dyslect six people from running for president. We've had three or four dyslexic presidents. What if, here's a personal example. I was on a championship swim team. The year before, we didn't have football players on our swim team. The next year we went from eight and eight to 13 and one, and we won a couple events by one or two points because those football players were good at sprinting. It was the difference between winning and losing. So if you're excluding people from your team because of your diversity, no mindset, or diver you know, excluding the introverts at your meeting from saying something, not making sure they're included. The price of exclusion is too high. You get a broader base to bring talent and capability to the organization if you're not thinking about inclusion in every way, in every meeting, in every interaction. Right. So do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, I hadn't heard that before, that, you know, justify why you're excluding or uh, understand the costs of exclusion. I think that that's, that's a really interesting concept. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, I think that we're at time. I, I thank you very kindly for your attention. Uh, have a great conference. So I would just like to give um, Carmen another round of applause for... <laughs> for allowing you all, our attendees, to collaborate and take the conversation in whatever direction you wanted to. Clearly there is even more of a thirst for discussions on diversity. At 2.15 we have another panel on diversity, so we will be taking it up again there. Um, but I also wanted to point out, Carmen mentioned Iron Butterfly, and you all can turn into the, tune into the Iron Butterfly um, podcast. Her interview was one of the very first back in September 2020, so would encourage you all to listen to that. Um, now, speaking of Iron Butterfly, um, we're going to move right into our next session. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Megan Jaffer, who's the co-founder of Iron Butterfly Media, the Iron Butterfly Podcast, and the Iron Butterfly Foundation. Megan's background spans corporate, nonprofit, and government, and she has helped launch and lead several organizations that support national security, including AWIC, which focuses on development of professional women serving in the IC and national security community, Noblest NSP, and the Geodata Cooperative. She is also a member of INSA's advisory committee in the 2019 recipient of our Joan Dempsey Mentorship Award. Now, please join me in welcoming Megan and the rest of our panelists to the stage. Thank you, Suzanne, um, and thank you, INSA and INSA's staff. I know what it takes to put on an event like this, and it's a lot of man hours and a lot of hard work, so a shout out to the staff and to Suzanne. Thank you. So, you know, as we reflect on Carmen's keynote, I think we one of the big takeaways we can um, take away from her talk is labeling important issues as mission critical. And I think our panel uh, today, prioritizing workplace well-being, is mission critical. And I think I challenge the panelists today in their answers to uh, use the, wor the words mission critical as you answer. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce our panel today. Um, directly to my left, we have Mr. Mark Fraunfelter. Um, he is the Assistant Director, uh, Special Security Directorate at NCSC. Welcome. Thank you. Um, 
Victoria, Dr. Victoria Hoyles, Director for the Center for Global Health Services at CIA. Welcome. Um, Cynthia Strand, VP of Customer Excellence at Lidos. And Nazareth Barhani, the Program Manager, Human Capital Office, IC Centers for Academic Excellence at ODNI. Welcome to you all. I'm Thank really you. excited, and I know everyone here is excited to have you. <laughs> You could, you could clap. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm just going to jump right in. We have, we have uh, some really great questions, um, but I know that a lot of you um, seem to be very participatory this morning, so I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions for this panel as well. So overall, there's been a progress surrounding ways to reduce the stigma of mental health within the national security community. Um, given this progress, how are previous mental health struggles now viewed during the hiring process? Is there a difference between industry and government? And Mark, I'm going to start with you. Great. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I like the way you started phrasing that question, saying there has been overall progress, because I've been a security practitioner for my whole career, and I have um, uh, frequently fielded questions about how mental well-being impacts your ability to obtain and maintain a, a security clearance. So my goal is to tamp down that perceived stigma, and, and my advice is always to the, those type of questions, take care of yourself, um, don't worry about that, and, and certainly that will not impact your ability to maintain or obtain a security clearance. So that's the message that we've been aggressively trying to um, uh, uh, get out, and I'm sure you'll hear that from my colleagues uh, today as well. But just to talk about the security clearance process just briefly of how this works, um, you know, there are uh, in seed four adjudication guidelines and guideline I talks about uh, psychological conditions, and I think people see that and they make their own interpretation of, of what that means. But I'm here to tell you that um, seeking treatment or counseling for a mental health condition is a sign of strength. It's viewed in positive light as early intervention is the key um, to facing any type of conditions, and that is shown in, in a positive light. Um, the reason there is a guideline is because there are um, uh, there there are issues which would prevent one, uh, which would affect reliability and trustworthiness, um, and their judgment. But these are very very egregious conditions, um, and obviously treatment for things like depression and anxiety do not do not rise to that level. Um, so and lastly, I will just comment on your difference between industry and government when it comes to the security clearance process. Obviously, a clearance is a clearance, regardless of, of badge color or whether you work in industry or government. But one thing I do want to note um, that I have seen is um, I'm very excited to see the partnership between government and industry. Uh, a lot of these companies that are listed, I noticed on the um, uh, sponsor board, are doing campaigns such as how are you feeling today really it's okay not to feel okay and the government's following suit in a lot of those initiatives as well so that's good to see thank you victoria did you have something to add to yeah that thank you and uh similar to mark i think i've been i have been uh, working this issue uh, across my 23 year career at cia so I'm a clinical psychologist by background, uh, have run our employee assistance program, have uh, worked to support our officers and their families uh, uh, no matter where they serve. And um, certainly uh, the nation asks a lot of us uh, in the intelligence community, and so it's important that we have a resilient workforce. But there's a real recognition uh, within the agency, and I would say within the IC, that life happens to us too. We're not immune to the stressors that we face as individuals in our lives, a breakup of a relationship, elder care uh, challenges, uh, child care issues, and certainly the pandemic, right, touched everybody. Nobody was immune from the impact uh, of the COVID pandemic. So when we, uh, from a medical perspective, are taking a look at applicants, we really are using a whole person approach uh, and fitting in uh, into the context of someone's life any previous mental health struggles. And as Mark said, and I absolutely echo this, that 
um, receiving treatment actually is viewed often as a positive. It shows someone had insight that they were having an issue and that they uh, were proactive and they had showed good judgment and uh, sought out treatment. Really what we're looking at for any particular condition is how is that condition managed? Is it stable? Uh, is, it, you know, is it well treated? That's really what's key. And it's really in the context of, uh, of the person's entire life uh, when we're looking at it. There's, just, there's not a singular focus on uh, a previous mental health struggle. Thank you. So Mark, I'm wondering, um, we know that certain mental health diagnoses, you mentioned this, must be disclosed during the security screening process. How are we reducing barriers for, for our applicants and supporting them through the process? Um, that's a good question. And again, um, we have an aggressive campaign to address this. And I think I would cite three areas to answer your question. Um, one is, the SF-86 form, for those of you who have clearances, you, you've filled out that dreaded form probably numerous times. Um, that form is getting a facelift, and during that facelift process, we've addressed question 21, which deals with mental health-related conditions. And we set up a, a working group made up of clinical psychologists and, and um, professionals in the medical area of this field to look at that question, and what we're doing is we are making the recommendation to pivot away from just listing diagnoses to more about behaviors and conduct, which is really what the information collection is intended to do. So there's gonna be a shift when the new personnel vetting questionnaire comes out, um, and that question will look a little different to pivot away and try to, um, uh, it'll be absent of the intimidation factor that I think exists now with answering that question. The second thing I would cite is we're doing a Trusted Workforce 2.0 effort, and in that effort, we have moved all of the national security population away from the traditional five-year reinvestigation process into a continuous vetting model. And this capability to um, put enroll people into continuous vetting allows uh, near real-time information to surface. So what this does, and what we're seeing, the benefit of this is there is a wellness factor to this. So you don't go five years without something surfacing, which could be um, leveraged by the robust resources that the government offers to deal with things like substance abuse, uh, to deal with um, financial situations, and also to deal with mental health-related conditions that allows people to seek um, the assistance that they would need in this area. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is simply messaging, um, what we're doing right now. I think um, I have seen, as I've stated before, a, a more robust effort in messaging in this area. Um, you know, the nationwide, the month of May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and I see the government and industry leveraging that month. Um, in our organization, we created a module, uh, it's called a wellness module, and we, and we roll that out every month of May to reinforce with the workforce, and it's available for the workforce during the calendar year. Um, but it, during the month of May, we shine the spotlight on that. And it's a module which interviews people who actually um, occupy positions in the intelligence community talking about their mental well-being and some of the, the struggles they've done and some of the uh, 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 conditions that they have in the workplace. And I think it's very effective to see um, actual coworkers and people you work with, you, you can identify with saying, hey, it's okay um, to seek treatment and counseling in this area if needed. So those are the three things that I would cite. Can I ask you, you had said this new questionnaire, the new questionnaire is gonna be coming out, when is that? So right now it's going through the OIRA process with OMB um, and it will be coming out hopefully uh, in the next few months. Uh, but keep in mind, there will be an implementation phase to that, to get all the systems to absorb that, uh, equip moving to EAP, and it will absorb the new questionnaire. So I think we're still about a year away, but, um, but the framework has been developed. All right, I, I, have, a, I have a feeling people are gonna have a lot of questions around that. <laughs> um, so, the recent research that Lidos has spearheaded on the nexus of mental health and security clearances 
found that 80% of security clearance applicants surveyed agreed seeking mental health should be considered positively mm -hmm. in their investigation process. But nearly half of the pr prospective applicants think that having current mental health um, issues will hurt their security mm -hmm. clearance chances. Mm -hmm. So um, Cynthia, let's start with you. How can government and industry help address and reinforce the importance of mental well-being? So it's wonderful when you see recommendations and practice coming together. And Mark has already referenced a number of things that came out of the LIDO study that are, that are in development. And the first and most important is very clear communication about which mental health circumstances might affect the clearance process and how. And written in simple English, not in policy language, but in simple English that anyone can pick up and have a good understanding and a reasonable local interpretation of what that means. The next piece that really matters is how the process is actually executed. And what it comes down to at the end of the day is not words on a paper, but the people who are involved in the entire clearance process from the security officers, who are usually the first to talk to an applicant or a candidate who's up for reinvestigation, through the people who make the adjudication process. I think they should be selected for their understanding of the policy and their ability to recognize, as what was said earlier, is life happens to all of us. So how does this individual who is being considered for either a new clearance or a con clearance continuation, how do their circumstances align with the criteria? I think education after selection is very, very important, but what is equally important is the selection process itself. Empathy is critical here. Now, academia tells us that um, empathy can be trained. I'm, I'm a little skeptical. I think it would take a considerable amount of effort over time. So in the selection process, looking for people who have empathy and the ability to understand and relate to candidates who might be disinclined to disclose early on. Continuous evaluation is critically important. Um, our colleagues at NSA implemented this very early on to deal with issues that they were observing in their environment, and it proved to be very, very effective. So it will help identify issues sooner and encourage people and give people the means to seek treatment sooner. But perhaps the most important is leadership. So I'm at Lidos now, but I came to Lidos through what is nearly a lifetime at CIA. I like to say I was there for 56 years, but only paid for 35 of them. <laughs> Both my parents work there. It is really the only world I knew growing up. And I knew the values very deeply and very clearly. And toughness was prized. And, and Carmen's nodding. Toughness is very much prized. So the last thing you want to do at work is let them see you sweat. And so therefore, at work, people are unlikely to disclose to colleagues that they're dealing with, with mental health c concerns. And I have dealt with depression most of my adult life. I've been in various forms of treatment and medication most of my adult life. I did not disclose that at work until the last few years of my career for all the reasons that people normally don't do it. What are my colleagues going to think of me? Am I going to lose opportunities because of this? And when I first started disclosing, it was to officers who reported to me, who came to me with their circumstances and their problems. It was heartbreaking to watch people who were suffering needlessly. So I started talking about my experience and, and what I had done, what I hadn't done. And, and at least in a couple of cases, it led to people seeking treatment. There is nothing more powerful than leading by example, especially on something like this that is so intensely personal. Thank you for sharing that. Mark, did you have a follow-up with that? Yeah, I think uh, you, you know the statistics that you cite and um, that Cynthia reiterated, it, it's indicative of why we need to continue to message this, and it shows the importance of messaging, because um, we do notice um, that this this could impact recruitment and retention, so that's a big issue that we need to address, which maybe we'll get into a little later. Um, but um, you know, this is not unique to the intelligence community. I have a couple stats I just want to throw out to add to your stats, if I could. Um, there's a study by the Mental Health America Association in 2022 that more than half of U.S. adults with some sort of mental condition do not seek or receive treatment or counseling, and this equates to 27 million individuals. 
Um, there was also a 2019 national poll from the American Psychiatric Association that found that more than half of all workers were concerned about discussing mental health issues at their jobs. This is outside of the intelligence community. This is the workforce of the whole country. So it's indicative of what we're seeing across the nation. Um, you know, how many times have you talked to someone and they say, hey, I had an infection. They put me on an antibiotic. I'm, that's fighting it. I mean, that seems to be common. But to turn that around and say, hey, I'm suffering from uh, a condition where I don't feel right, so I'm on an antidepressant. That's not as common as talking about antibiotics. And so our goal is to view your physical well-being in the same light as you view mm -hmm. your mental well-being. And I don't uh, understand that disconnect, but again, it's, I think it, it goes beyond the intelligence community, although it is an issue in the intelligence community, um, but it goes beyond and it's a societal, cultural thing that we need to address. Um, we need a holistic approach, and, and it starts with security professionals. I agree with Cynthia because they're your first line coming in, but we really need a holistic approach to address this issue uh, more comprehensively across a broad spectrum. Well, and Cynthia, I would, I would say that empathy is not a, a, a bad word and not mm -hmm. a soft word, and I think we don't, we don't use that word enough. And so I think that is important. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I'm not, I don't know if you can train people to be empathetic, <laughs> but it is, it is important to identify. Yes. So thank you for sharing that. We're going to switch gears a little bit here, but before I do that, I just want to encourage everyone to, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions, to write the questions down on uh, a note card. And you can just raise your hand like this, and someone will come around and grab them. Um, so I just want to encourage that because we will. We have a couple more questions and then we're going to open, open it up to the, the audience. So um, Nazareth, this, first, this next question is going to go to you first. Um, how does your organization address employee work-life balance and promote well-being in and out of the office? So first of all, thank you, Insa. Thanks, Suzanne, for picking this really important topic. Um, we don't... Uh, while we are making progress in terms of mental health in the intelligence community, I think the more we have these kinds of discussions and the more we can be open about it, the more we can go towards the road of normalizing discussions about mental health where we can say, I'm taking my medication. I do in my office. Um, I worked at FBI for about 16 years in the foreign language program, and I recently joined ODNI and uh, about two, two, two and a half years ago. So. I had the um, advantage of being at FBI. Uh, when I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult uh, in 2016. I'm 54, you can do the math. <laughs> I know I look young. Um, <laughs> but when I was at FBI and I got diagnosed, I was in an organization that, um, in the foreign language program, where it was ops, and it was like being a firefighter. Everything was on fire. You had to be on all the time, and you get calls all, all times of day and night. Um, when I was diagnosed, it was a very eye-opening experience for me because it allowed me the opportunity to learn more about myself, to give grace to myself, and to understand that all the struggles that I've been going through were not because I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough or whatever the enough is. Mm -hmm. It's because there is a way that my brain is wired that is different than other people. And in spite of all of that, I managed to um, make it to FBI um, and be an analyst, be a program manager, manage critical language program. And I did that before the diagnosis, before the medication, before therapy. So it allowed me to understand myself. And once I got over myself and got over the fact that it's something to be ashamed of, because in my culture, in the East African culture, we do not talk about mental health. I, with the help of my therapist, who I always say, if I hit the jackpot, he's getting a lot of money from me. <laughs> <laughs> he helped me unpack how I can get over myself, how I can manage different strategies. And from that, I learned to accept the diagnosis and be a, a bit more open about it. And I, had not, I haven't stopped since. But being open about the diagnosis and being honest about it led me to seek help at FBI and at ODNI. 
Um, at different agencies, you have the employee assistance program um, who have walked me off of many ledges. Um, anxiety, they say ADHD comes with two friends, anxiety and depression. Um, and I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression comes knocks, knocking on my door every now and then. So I often sought help from the EAP program. I am indebted to them because they were almost like my therapist because they would you know, get on the phone, make an appointment, you talk to them and they're able to help you kind of ease your anxiety and help you cope until you get to whatever it is that you need to get to your therapist, your medication. Another thing that was really helpful with the diagnosis was the um, reasonable accommodation. At FBI, at ODNI also, I was fortunate to get the reasonable accommodation from our reasonable accommodation offices where I present them with the diagnosis and I work with them and my therapist to figure out what is it that I need to help me function in a way that will be productive without masking because masking happens a lot, um, and that meant just simple things like a headset. So I had the headset, and when people are around me being loud, sometimes I'm part of the loud situation, I can block the noise and focus on what it is that I need to do. Um, so those are two things, but also, not but, and also we have employee resource groups, and we have intelligence community affinity network groups, um, these are like ERGs, but across the intelligence community. I support different groups because of how they align with my background and my passion. I'm from East Africa, so I joined the uh, African American. I joined the Women's Intelligence Network and was one of the founding members. And people with disabilities, neurodiversity groups. We have neurodiversity groups that I'm fortunate to join at the agency, at ODNI. So all of these groups allow you the opportunity to have a platform where like-minded people feel safe to talk mm -hmm. and problem solve and even elevate our issues as high as the DNI and Dr. Dixon. Um, those are some of the things that I can think of and also uh, I'm pretty sure at FBI they accepted that at ODNI um, we have the health and wellness where we are encouraged to use three hours of our week to do things like workout, yoga, meditation. And now we do not have to do it in the building, we can do it outside. So all of these things combined definitely help somebody like me mask less and be more open um, to share about my journey. And also, last but not least, I am fortunate that wherever I went in the different offices at FBI and at ODNI, the people around me accept me for who I am. I don't have to mask. I talk about, I forgot to take my medication. Um, I talk about my therapist. I talk about anxiety. I have on my computer a, a screen saver, a screen saver, an image of somebody, um, just this man who's standing behind looking sideways at people. Um, and it was from an article about sensory overload. And I was like, that's me. You all need to be quiet. Mm -hmm. And every time someone comes to my space, they see that and we have a conversation about it. So I'm just, I think I'm really blessed that I am in places where, because I uh, was open and honest about myself, people eventually accept me. I think you can't undercount, you uh, undercut that, that just having people around you that accept you for who you are, your true authentic self is probably one of the most important things. So thank you for sharing your story. And I, I didn't say this early, but earlier, but Cynthia, thank you for sharing your story as well. Um, Victoria? Yeah, so the stories are so important uh, because it does normalize, um, again, you know, that we are real people uh, who are impacted by uh, real life. So we've had uh, an employee assistance program uh, for decades in CIA, and we support ODNI as well. And so I'm happy to hear the good reports uh, of the services there, providing uh, free, short-term, confidential counseling to our officers and family members. And for many conditions, uh, th there can be uh, short-term work can be quite successful. Um, and we uh, also participate in awareness campaigns to reduce the stigma. Uh, Mark, you mentioned May is Mental Health Awareness Month. September is actually Suicide 
uh, Awareness and Prevention Month, and I'm wearing the blue and uh, the teal and purple ribbon, and we have a whole uh, schedule of activities this month to raise awareness about that. But I want to, there's been a real focus. Uh, DCIA Burns, when he came in, really made well being uh, of the workforce a top priority. Uh, because I, uh, this is where I'm going to be able to work in mission critical. Our <laughs> officers, are, we're, we're a human organization. We, uh, our officers are our tools. Uh, and our workforce is our most valuable asset. And so we need to be well to do the hard work the nation asks of us. And so we've hired uh, our very first chief well-being officer, uh, Dr. Jennifer Poza, about a year ago. And she has worked uh, with uh, the uh, officers and the medical providers and mental health providers uh, within my organization, as well as across the organization to develop uh, well-being at CIA. And uh, Mark, I'm going to actually you know, foot stomp what you said, is there is, you can't separate well-being into like, you know, physical health is separate from mental health. So what we're really focused on is a holistic, integrated uh, uh, program and, and putting resources in place that look at, the again, the whole person and support the whole person. Each of you uh, defines well-being in a different way, and the way that you define well-being will change over the course of your life. Uh, someone who has young children may have different well-being needs than someone who has elder care issues or who is nearing retirement. So that really we need to have a kind of a suite of resources and services available to support the well-being of our workforce. So in this first year, we've been very focused, and uh, the Chief Well-Being Officer has been very focused on hearing from the workforce, what are their needs, what are their priorities, and we're really focusing on four key areas of well-being, and that's work-life effectiveness, health and well-being support, workplace flexibility, and organizational support. And so we are looking to build out uh, kind of a uh, knowledge, programs, resources that officers and their families can utilize, uh, again, throughout their life cycle with us and uh, no matter where they're serving. Can I have a go back? I'm sorry, sure. I forgot, um, forgot to mention a couple of things. These were pre-approved, so I better <laughs> share them. <clears throat> Um, I see DEIA, I see diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion and accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, led by Stephanie LaRue, who's mm -hmm. going to be here later, um, is also one of the huge advocates and proponents, supporters of neurodiversity. They recently held at ODNI an event where I was a panelist centered on neurodiversity. Um, and it was an event that was open to everybody in the intelligence community. Um, also, our leadership. Um, O at ODNI, uh, DNI and PDDNI and the coup issued a message in March in support of neurodiversity and speaking about leadership. Earlier somebody said that leadership support is important, that um, is something that we definitely have and we are very, very fortunate to have the coup, Dr. Dixon and the DNI um, issuing a message centered on neurodiversity. And uh, we also are celebrating this coming month in October, the National Disability Employment Month in DEEM. Um, at ODNI, we have um, a whole bunch of events lined up. Um, conversations with the DNI, a panel about hidden disability with ODNI seniors, um, navigating back to school with neurodivergent ch children, sponsorship versus mentorship, um, leadership development uh, on PTSD partnering with one of the other ERGs. So there is, this is such a delightful time for me to be at ODNI. I don't know how it was before I joined, but it's obvious that ODNI prioritizes mental health and also recognizes the strength that neurodivergent officers bring to the table and allowing them to feel space, uh, creating a, a safe space for them to just be themselves and also that of course, at the, uh, we were talking about mission critical. That is definitely mission critical. Well, thank you for bringing the list. I think hopefully people are taking notes. <laughs> um, so I kind of wanted to, uh, there was another question on top of the question I just asked previously, which is um, what opportunities should exist for recovery within the work schedule and workplace? And, and the ones that are, are they adequate? And I'm going to open that up to the, the whole panel. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to jump in? 
Yeah, so I would say, I mean, I'll jump in. Um, recovery is uh, critical uh, to prevent burnout, right? And again, I mean, I think um, we ask a lot of our workforce. We, uh, we again, are kind of uh, are asked to, to face some pretty tough challenges uh, kind of across the IC. So it is critical that we uh, help our officers protect against burnout uh, and by giving, um, by encouraging recovery. So we, uh, we absolutely uh, encourage activities um, and social connection, right, which is a really important part of your well-being. Uh, mm -hmm. And research has shown uh, folks feel in most engaged at work when they feel socially connected, right? There's that age-old mm -hmm. uh, uh, question that probably many of you who have uh, <laughs> served in the IC, I have a, on the Employee Climate Survey, I have a best friend at work, right? Yeah. So there is, that, though it's a funny question, there is uh, real uh, research and science, mm -hmm. which I'm sure, Cynthia, you know about in your work uh, at that. So recently, I mean, two kind of recent examples, uh, both uh, past and upcoming. So we had a pedometer challenge in the agency, and it even made the Wall Street Journal uh, this uh, year, uh, where we were encouraging folks not only to be active, uh, but to join together with a team and connect uh, and to, uh, but, you know, and we kind of, I think, um, leaned on the competitiveness of our workforce uh, to get folks to compete to see, uh, you know, which team could get the most steps. We even had some of our retirees uh, and formers participate in this year's pedometer challenge. Uh, and I think it was, uh, the total was uh, over a billion steps by all of our teams. We had over 400 teams uh, uh, participating. And next week, uh, if we're open, we will uh, have our, uh, our, our annual 5K. Uh, and it's the 32nd year that we have run that uh, in the organization. I think what we're also looking, that's physical activity. But uh, as we noted, I mean, it's, it's not just about physical activity. It's about time for focus, for a time mm -hmm. to kind of reflect. Uh, meditate, even just kind of take a walk in nature. You should get away from your desk for about 10 minutes. So as part of well-being at CIA, we're looking to identify uh, areas both in our buildings and on our campus where folks can take a few minutes, uh, get away from the desk, and take time to reflect, to recover, and to recharge. Thank you. If I could pile on to the back end of that a little bit. I was, I was laughing about the best friend at work yeah. question. I came out of a part of the agency that stereotypically was not known for close personal relationships, the Directorate of Science and Technology. So in advance of the survey, every year we would go around and we would issue best friends so we could get good, good results from there. I think there's one thing that, that also should be pointed out is everything we're talking about doing in the, that in this case the agency is doing is right and appropriate not just because it is mission critical, because it is the right thing to do as human beings. What we don't often focus on is the benefit that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. So I had a point in time where I was facing a very severe family crisis, which as you know, will kick in any underlying issues like crazy. And I went to my supervisor and I said, look, this is, this is what's happening. I want you to know this is how I'm gonna manage it. He bent over backwards to create space for me to, to deal with what was happening at home, to make sure I was whole to deal with it, as well as continue to work. In the end, those were some of my highest performing times of my career, and the agency earned my undying loyalty. I would have given anything after that. One thing I would add is uh, from the ICDEIA event that was hosted at ODNI, about neurodiversity, one of the, uh, the first part was practice, practice based practitioners from outside, and the second part was a panel that I moderated. Um, on the first part, they talked about compassionate curiosity. I think that's really important for us to think about, because we talked about how things are getting better in different places in the IC. Um, one area that we need to really highlight and keep talking about is being curious, but being compassionate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm often uh, being open about my diagnosis, talking to anybody who would listen to me um, about, you know, I was diagnosed with ADHD, I do suffer from depression, I definitely have anxiety. Uh, sometimes comes with a cost, 
Some people will come to you and say things that are really ridiculous, like, you don't look like you have ADHD. Or, okay. <laughs> or, um, you're not masking, you're coping. So, that's the cost, and I, I would still do it. I would still continue to do what I'm doing because I, that's who I am, that's how I'm wired. But being compassionate, like, it's okay to ask questions. I don't mind if you ask me a question, but don't come with the judgment. Mm -hmm. Be compassionate and ask the question in the framework that allows the person you're asking to know that you are, you have empathy. That you're not asking with a judgmental lens, you're just asking because you wanna learn, you're asking because you wanna help, and don't offer help if nobody wants your help. Like, mm -hmm. One of my colleagues, after I um, opened up about my diagnosis, um, thought that it was a good idea to just constantly offer help uh, and change the way that work is done and say it in a meeting, in a setting. And that's, that was just so, to me, I received it really strongly in, in the message I received is that you're not good enough. You are different in a bad way so I need to work things in a different way for you, and I will help you. Well, I didn't need your help. I was doing fine before, and I'll do fine after. So I think compassionate curiosity is just something that we really need to uh, speak about. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to try to get in some of these, uh, these questions from the audience. Um, but one that we had that I think I can double with a, an audience question is, given the increase in telework, are your org organizations noticing change in the overall mental health and well-being of your employees? And one of the questions that the audience had was, look, we all want our IC personnel to be um, to be happy, right? And happiness contributes to the mission and success. Um, but could we start talking about happiness? And is are we somehow tracking that, the, the overall well-being and happiness of the workforce? So kind of a two-part question. Um, Mark, I'm going to start with yeah, you. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> jump in on the, uh, the telework piece, because I think it's important. One, one if I could say a good thing came out of the pandemic, it was the awareness that we need to do better from a workforce perspective and offer things that um, are, are normally offered outside of the intelligence community. You know, um, the, all the themes that Ms. Medina, you, you've said in your keynote opening speech, one of the underlying things was recruitment and retention. Um, and you look at the um, intelligence community, 6% of the intelligence community is under the age of 30, and 25% uh, are under the age of 40. So you fast forward 20 years, and, and we've got to do better to ensure that we can recruit, and this is one area that uh, I think we're getting better at and increasing the happiness of the workforce. Yeah, and I think for measurement, that is a really valid point, right? And that can be, uh, and, and uh, the research uh, on well-being in the workplace has really advanced in the past, uh, you know, kind of you know, decade or so, um, really even moving from just a focus on wellness, right, the absence of disease, to, again, this more holistic kind of integrated approach of well-being. So we absolutely, as part of well-being at CIA and the Office of the Chief Well-being Officer, are taking a look at how to measure that in our workforce and you know, where are we starting, what's our baseline, and then as we add resources, as we increase knowledge and awareness of the resources that we have uh, uh, available to the organization, do we see a shift in that? And so we will be, uh, be looking, we have done some initial focus groups uh, and are looking at some survey tools to allow us to uh, kind of measure the well-being or happiness, if you will, uh, of the workforce. I, I'd rather go to the last question for the sake of time. About okay. okay. Can I do one more question or? Okay. Um, okay, this is the last question. Sorry, I know we had two more um, from the audience, but this I feel is a little bit different, so I'd like to ask it. Um, can you discuss the divergence between policy and implementation in the intelligence operations and special operations community? While policy says you may not lose your clearance discussing mental health issues in this community, that, um, that has, 
fought 20 plus years at war um, can still impact your overall career, or at least the stigma uh, says it can. So comments or responses to that? It's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think, um, Victoria, you hit on the fact that there are stressors um, within the IC, especially those working those type of positions, war zone and, and, and reporting to war zones and things like that, where um, the stressors are just exasperated due to the, due to the uh, position and what they're performing. Um, but we have to keep that in perspective and again, um, ensure that we are not singling those people out, um, that recognizing that uh, there, those stressors could lead to uh, mental health conditions that need to be addressed. So I would say the policy is in line with that um, and, and we're working to close any gaps that may exist. Can yeah, I just I give, it, oh, I'm sorry. Go nope, ahead. you go ahead. Go ahead. Mine was just shifting just before we close, not to forget our partners, uh, my husband, shout out to him. They are uh, behind the scenes and they really suffer the consequences of being with somebody who is um, on the spectrum, has ADHD, anxiety, depression. They pay a very heavy price and we don't give them the grace and the thank you and the gratitude that they deserve. So from me to my husband, thank you for everybody who has a partner who um, has any of these uh, neurodivergent diagnoses. Um, I see you, I appreciate you, I heart you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Victoria and Denny, last. And Cynthia, sure, I mean, I just, uh, I mean, on the, I mean, I think uh, after 20 plus years uh, uh, kind of fighting wars, uh, and being involved in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, again, there very much is appreciation, as Mark said, that um, some you know, the things that we ask people to do uh, for mm -hmm. the mission uh, can have impacts, uh, negative and positive. Uh, and that we, again, uh, are, the well-being of our workforce is our top priority. And so for uh, uh, those parts of our organization that are most likely to be serving uh, in those locations or having those experiences, we are absolutely focused, excuse me, <clears throat> on their well-being and, and directing some specific resources, whether it's helping people uh, who are exposed to graphic and disturbing images and being able to provide support there, uh, as well as addressing post-traumatic stress disorder in our workforce. I think if we pay equal attention to recognizing the ideal performance among our managers and leaders, those who are exhibiting the care and attention that we're speaking to, who are behaving in manners that are consistent with policy, highlighting and recognizing that behavior, I think will go a long way as well. Well, I first just want to thank you all for the work that you do, but secondly, I want to thank you for um, telling your stories and, and giving your true authentic selves to our audience tonight, so, or today, so thank you very much. <laughs>So thank you, Megan, for stepping up when I reached out to you a couple months ago about moderating this important conversation, and to Mark and Victoria and Cynthia and Nazareth um, for bringing your authentic selves to the stage today. Probably two and a half years ago, INSA hosted our first conversation, it was virtual, on mental health and security clearances. And like I do before any discussion, I Googled it, right, to see what else, what else was out there, what, what other organizations had put out thought pieces or hosted panels or keynotes on this subject. And there was virtually nothing out there when I Googled I see mental health well-being, and now I encourage you all to go on and Google and see what comes up now. The, the paper that Lidos um, published and hopefully some other discussions are starting to populate so we can continue. We have a long way to go, but I think this is a good start. We have a quick refreshment break sponsored by Northeastern University. I'd ask that everybody reconvene here at 11. We do have a really packed, packed agenda today, and again, I'm gonna try to keep us on time, so thanks again. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone back uh, from break. Good morning. Hey, three people over here are listening to me. That's, that's a good start. Um, thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we have had an excellent start to our program this morning. 
and things are just going to get better. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Doyen. I'm the Executive Vice President of INSA, and I'm really happy to welcome everyone this morning. Before we uh, get to our Ignite rounds, I'd just like to say um, the programs like this truly illustrate the value that INSA brings to the national security mission. You know, when we bring together the community to address important issues like mental health and well workforce well-being, and when we share successes and lessons learned, we are collectively building a stronger intelligence community, and in my opinion, there's no more rewarding work than that. So thank you all for being here, being part of that work, and now let's start our Ignite rounds. We are going to hear uh, uh, for the next hour from five public and private sector professionals. Each will come up to podium. They'll have about six to eight minutes to share their perspective on something along the lines of our theme, which is letting go of the fear of failure. And so for kicking things off, I'd like to welcome Colleen Ecker, who's Vice President of National Security Operations at LMI, whose talk is titled, A Ship in Harbor is Safe. Colleen, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, good. This is awesome. I love that. Um, I'm just going to wave to my other igniters back there. High five, guys. We're all going to be great. Um, so I was trying to think about this morning, and I realized, if I'm being really honest, I'm actually putting into practice right now letting go of the fear of failure because... You know, speaking to this incredible group of professionals ignites, yes, pun intended, um, fear. So um, I thought about it. I was going to sing a couple of verses from Frozen, you know, let it go. And then I thought, uh, better let that go. Um, but seriously, though, as I was thinking about what I was going to say this morning, I was remembering and thinking about how we were all really fearless as children, right? Do you guys remember that feeling? Having no fear? Jumping off the swings? Climbing a tree? Hanging by one arm on the monkey bars? Running up to somebody on the playground and making a new friend? Or wearing a princess costume complete with the tiara to kindergarten because why not? But somewhere along the line, somewhere along the way, something or someone planted a seed of doubt. And that spirit of fear took root. I'm not sure the exact moment, but I do know that in high school, I let the fear of the unknown stop me from pursuing a great opportunity to take a semester abroad. It's a decision that I regret to this day. I mean, not only would I have had this amazing life experience, but I'd also be fluent in Spanish. Right? Duh. So what changed for me? When did I learn to let it go? Well, it was actually when I was applying to college. I read something, it was a quote by John Shedd, and it didn't eliminate the fear, but it put the failure in perspective. A ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. And Admiral Sharp reminded me that when storms roll in, ships roll out, right? So the translation, you can stay in your comfort zone but to truly be successful, you must take risks, right? You have to step outside of the familiar and the comfortable. Or another way of putting it, you must let go of the fear of failure. Now, this does not mean that I have always let go of the fear of failure. No, on the contrary, I have succumbed to fear and regretted it. I've also put failure, the fear of failure into perspective, let it go, and succeeded. 
So I'm gonna share a few stories and a few lessons learned. So hopefully, here are some tips. Have you ever walked into a room, looked around and realized you're the youngest in the room? <laughs> I'm 55, I get it now. Um, have you ever walked into a room and realized you're the only woman in the room? Okay. Have you ever walked into a room and been the only minority in the room? Have you ever been all three? Well, there I was, a GS-13 representing NSA at an NSC meeting. I walked into the room, and yes, I was all three, and yes, all eyes were on me. I had the information, and yes, Carmen, the insights, um, and recommendations based on my knowledge of the subject matter. But I was afraid that no one was gonna listen to me. Or worse, that I was gonna sound and look foolish. So what did I do? Instead of sitting at the table, I backbenched it. Lesson learned, don't minimize your contributions. You have a perspective that needs to be shared, so let go of imposter syndrome, let go of the fear of failure, and take your seat at the table. Remember, a ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. Have you ever looked at a position and thought, oh my God, this is my dream job. I want to do this work. I want to be in this office. I want to work with these people. This is exactly what I want to do. You're so excited. And then you read the position description and you only have eight out of the nine KSAs. So you don't apply. Been there, done that. I was an ECP and yes, I only had eight out of the nine KSAs. So therefore I believed that I didn't have enough experience and I was therefore unqualified. So guess what? I didn't apply. I let the fear of failure stop me from pursuing what could have been a game-changing onward assignment for me. Lesson learned, don't self-reject. Don't limit yourself. You may not get the job, but don't let the fear of failure stop you from pursuing that opportunity. Apply for the job, write the article, go back to school, take that trip. Remember, a ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Okay, have you ever met someone that you admired? I mean, truly admired, you wanted to emulate somebody that you wanted to work for or perhaps have as your mentor, but you were afraid to approach them out of the fear of rejection? I've been there too. While serving as an intelligence analyst, at NSA, I heard an SIS brief in a meeting. He was smart, he was a clear expert, and he calmly answered rapid fire questions from Charlie Allen, which this whole room knows is stress inducing. I thought, this is a guy I need to know. This is someone who I can learn from, somebody who I wanna work for. So what did I do? Well, this time, I let go of fear, and I seized an opportunity to talk to him in a non-intimidating environment, the NSA cafeteria. Yes, I approached him and asked if I could buy him a cup of coffee. And while we were having coffee, I told him that I wanted to work for him and asked if he would be my mentor. And not only did I go work for him, but he's still a mentor for me to this day. So the lesson learned here, be bold. Seize the opportunities to be your own champion. Advocate for yourself and seek out those who will eventually advocate for you. Remember, a ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. Have you ever stepped out on faith to try a new adventure where it meant you had to start 
all over again. You had no safety nets, without knowing a soul, all in the pursuit of a dream. Anybody? Well, for me, it was graduate school. I had given up my job at the Carter Center, no more safety nets. I had left Atlanta and all my friends to head to Tallahassee where I knew nobody. So what did I have? I had a scholarship, a crappy apartment, and a clear objective to obtain my master's degree with at least a 3.9 grade point average. Well, guess what? I set the goal and I kicked butt. Not only in my coursework, but I crushed my comprehensive exams, yes. Um, the lesson learned here, yay! The lesson learned here is be willing to bet on yourself. You must be willing to do the work, be willing to put the failure into perspective and put aside your fear. If you can do this, if you can remember when you have those moments of fear and doubt to remind yourself of that time when you accomplish the impossible, right? When your briefing that you did, you nailed it. Or perhaps when your project won an award. In other words, that moment when you let go of fear, put failure into perspective, stepped out on faith, took your seat at the table, and were in short, unstoppable. If you can do this, you will have learned the secret of letting go of the fear of failure. A ship in a harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. Thanks, guys. What a great start. Thank you so much, uh, Colleen. Um, next up is Lakia Hawkins. Lakia is president and CEO of Steel Point Solutions, and she's a member of INSA's advisory committee. Uh, she'll uh, give us a talk that's titled, Taking the Leap. It's never a good time. Lakia? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So glad to be here. Uh, Kelly did such a great job, tough act to follow. So uh, that was very inspiring. So for me, uh, as a small business owner, uh, I know all about uh, confronting fear and taking the leap. Um, we try to do our best to really prepare. But sometimes life situations, you know, you're, you don't have what, at least you don't think you have what you need to be able to launch out and go forward. Um, about eight years ago, my husband asked me, well, what did I want for my 40th birthday? Uh, I told him I wanted to go tandem skydiving. Yes, tandem skydiving. Yes, I was ready to do it. Uh, he was completely surprised because it was out of character for me. Uh, oftentimes, fear accompanies any new thing that we try. Um, there's no preparation for going skydiving, let me just say that, okay? There's no, I don't care how many videos you watch, uh, especially if that wasn't something you were trained to do, there, there's no preparation. Um, so we got there, uh, I had five willing friends and family who would accompany me on taking that leap, so kudos to them for uh, letting go of fear. Uh, but when the doors opened, it became really real, okay? It became really real. It was time to take that jump in, when you're tandem skydiving, they don't say ready, set, go. They just go, right? And so I was like, all right, here we go. It's, it's going to be real, real. I closed my eyes. I said a prayer, and I leaped. And despite my worst fears, it was nothing like I and probably many of you have imagined. Um, instead of going straight down, I actually went up. I actually went up. Instead of a free fall, it was controlled. Instead of being afraid, I actually saw the beauty of the landscape. I felt a complete sense of joy and satisfaction. Surprisingly, when I land, it was on my feet. It was on my feet. 
Afterwards, I realized life had already prepared me. I had everything I needed to leap. And in the words of the great Catherine Hepburn, I lifed life. I had leaped and I had no regrets. I faced my entrepreneurial journey in a similar way. I was at a point in my career where I needed to decide if I wanted to pursue a path that would see the progression of my career as an executive at a large global management consulting firm or one of entrepreneurship. 11 years ago, I decided to start Still Point. Still Point client focus was the intelligence community. Talk about taking a leap, <laughs> okay? Um, the timing could not have been worse. I had two little boys. I was recently married, and I had decided that this company that I was working with, the people that I love, it was time to move on. Um, and so what I decided to do was go to a small business first. Um, and after I went there, just two weeks after being hired, I decided to go to my first and second line manager and ask them if they would uh, be open to me changing my employment type. So yeah, you can imagine how they were looking at me <laughs> like I was crazy. Uh, I said, hey, look guys, uh, I don't think this is the right fit. I, I think I probably would be a better consultant than an employee. Um, and so if I were in their shoes, I would have completely understood if they told me that, you know, hey, this is not gonna work. You either stay an employee or unfortunately you have to move on. Um, but that's not what they did. That's not what they did. They agreed to speak with the owner of the company, um, but told me I needed to demonstrate why they hired me uh, to their customer for at least nine months. And I was willing to do that, and I did do that. Uh, for those nine months, I did not go to them and say, hey, look what I did. No, for those nine months, my focus was on the customer experience. My focus was be positioning myself to be an advisor. My focus was on serving both the customer as well as my employer. After nine months, I had positioned myself as that trusted advisor with them and with the customer. They agreed to speak with the owner, but not before letting me know that another employee did the same thing, but the outcome was different. Uh, the owner decided that they wanted to pursue a legal path. So once I heard that, I said, oh, I have to go talk to my husband. Uh, we were a two-income household, and so therefore I needed to make sure that he and I were in agreement. Also, it was the holidays. Who wants to uh, be uh, enrolling in unemployment during the holidays? I don't think anyone in this room wants to be in that position. But when I talked to my husband, uh, he was so supportive of my decision. And he said to me, if anyone can do it, you can. And so I needed that. That's, I needed that. And so on Monday, I gave my second line manager a call and I said, no risk, no reward. Let's do it. Let's see what he's going to say. And to my surprise, the owner agreed to not only allow me to change my employment type, not to a consultant, but this is what he did. He agreed to sponsor Steel Point for a facilities clearance. He agreed to allow me to go back in that same position, but not as an employee, not as a consultant, but as a uh, a person who owns their own business. So on January 27, 2014, Steel Point became a reality. Purpose, faith, and experience compelled me to push past my fears. We are all born with a purpose. Purpose is often revealed before we are ready. It seems impossible to grasp. And usually, if we're honest, the realization of it should result in a life of service. At 12, I was walking home from school, 
And I saw myself as a businesswoman. Nothing in my life should have left me to believe that I was going to be a businesswoman. My mother was a single mother with three children. She had a high school diploma, very smart, but my life situation did not dictate that I was going to be a businesswoman. I'm a product of public schools, and in my wor world, getting a good job, a good job, was the goal. I accomplished getting a good job. But fast forward to 2012, my pyphonic moment collided with reality. It was time to move. My faith pushed me past my negative self-talk. It pushed me past the fear of being unemployed. It pushed me past the concern of being a bad mother and not there for my two little children, of simply failing as an entrepreneur. My faith gave me the courage and the confidence to take the leap, to be resilient, and to live in the moment. My experience allowed me to make more accurate decisions in an uncertain situation. When looking back at my time as a, civ as a civilian, working for the U.S. Air Force as, as a GS-5 back in 2000, uh, actually back in 1993, so it's been that long, uh, to my many work experiences uh, working for FSIs, Federal System Integrators, to my time at that large global management consulting firm, to today supporting clients not only in the intelligence community, but within the Department of Defense and the Fed SIP sectors, I knew each prepared me for the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Steel Point has been the vehicle to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, to live life, experience it to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer and richer experience, and most importantly, to fulfill my life's purpose, which is to serve serve my family, serve my employees, and serve my customers. I'm so thankful on January 27, 2024, Steel Point will celebrate its 10-year anniversary, which means, thank you, which means that we have successfully navigated sequestration, we have successfully navigated COVID, and we successfully navigated the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. But we have been able to do that because I decided that I was going to take the lead and there was never going to be a good time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lakia. Um, that was great. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome to the podium Marcel Letra, who's Vice President for the National Security Space at Lockheed Martin, who will share a talk on the road less traveled. Marcel. So uh, last week, I got a text from my daughter McKinley who is a senior at Davidson College in North Carolina. McKinley is majoring in political science, and this fall, she's taking her first class in American foreign policy. In McKinley's text was a screenshot of a graphic in one of her class readings. It was a picture of a wiring diagram of the US intelligence community, and the text said, quote, some familiar names on this chart for my foreign policy class, exclamation point, smiley face emoji. <laughs> so I poked at my phone to zoom in on the photo, started taking a closer look. Barack Obama, POTUS, yep, that's familiar. Ash Carter, Secretary of Defense, check, good. Jim Clapper, Director of National Intelligence, yes. Robert Cardillo, Director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, check, and then Marcel Letra, Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Big check. 
I was so excited. How cool was that? My daughter basically had found my name in her college textbook. I was bursting with pride, so excited that she had been reminded that her dad had been privileged to hold the office of Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, which for me was a big opportunity to serve our country. It was so fun that she shared this moment with me. And then, employing the ruthless humor of her near teenage mind, she proceeded to knock me off my pedestal. <laughs> Dad, you used to be a big cheese. <laughs> but now, you're just a little cheese. Or really, no cheese at all. <laughs> Gotta love how daughters can keep dad's egos in check. All that said, I remain very proud of my government service, and I do consider myself one of the luckiest people to have had that opportunity to lead at senior levels of the intelligence community. And as I think about the theme of this panel today, letting go of the fear of failure, there probably are many examples I could draw from in my career of service in national security that would help illustrate how overcoming the fear of failure is both hard and necessary to achieving success in work and in life. But going in perhaps a slightly unexpected direction, the one story I want to share this morning is about the Appalachian Trail. Somewhere in my childhood, I got hooked on the idea of through hiking the Appalachian Trail from end to end, a foot journey of 2,160 miles from Maine to Georgia that takes about six months to do carrying your own food and water, sleeping under the stars, and experiencing the passing of spring into summer into fall. After years and years of talking about it, when I was in my mid-20s, kind of at the start of my professional career, my dad, my brother, and I found ourselves one Christmas morning seriously talking about doing this long-distance hike together. My dad had just retired from the Army, and if my brother and I put our just launched careers on ice for a bit, we could take this life-changing adventure on. I'll admit, for me, I was quite apprehensive, if not outright scared. Up until then, I had been pretty intent on and ambitious about serving in Washington, DC. I pretty much did everything by the book. I studied hard in school, focused on making great grades, followed the rules, lined up internships, built out my resume, got into a great graduate school, I was kind of worried about blowing all that up, all that investment of time and energy, and ruining my opportunities for public service by disappearing into the Appalachian woods for this detour. I definitely had major fear of failure, but increasingly convinced that this was the right thing to do, to take this pause, to take this gift of time with family, I decided to put my career ambitions on hold and launch this Appalachian trail hike. My dad, my brother, and I started on May 27th, 1997, on Mount Katahdin in Maine. And then on November 23rd, nearly six months and 2,160 miles later, we finished. And in taking this adventure on, so many surprising and good things happened. We all became much closer. We each thought a lot about life, a lot of time thinking about life, about priorities, about our purpose in this world. For me, I'm convinced that this pivot down the road less traveled, or really the trail less traveled, made me smarter, wiser, more grounded, and better equipped for the follow-on life of public service that I then had. I think one of the biggest things I learned out of that experience is not to take myself too seriously, take the mission seriously, but not oneself too seriously. Um, I think I also learned that you can always walk away from something. Indeed. I lived off the land for six months. Turns out it's not that hard to do if you plan right. Among other things, a series of follow-on twists of fate resulted in me being in Lower Manhattan on September 11th, 2001, feeling and seeing the tragedy of that day firsthand, which profoundly shaped me and my subsequent career choices to continue serving the nation where I could. That path would not have happened had I let go, not let go of the fear of failure and uh, taken that jump to do something that I really wanted to do that seemed off the beaten path. I think all of us have moments where we want to prioritize our loved ones, our family, our health, our wellness, and our personal growth. But often a fear of failure 
professionally or otherwise, holds us back from making any of those the priority that we want them to, from pursuing that balance that can enrich our lives. So in closing, let me encourage all of us to ponder how we let go of a fear of failure and leave you with a question. What is your Appalachian Trail? Have you walked it yet? If not, when will you? Thank you so much. Thank you, Marcel. That was great. Um, our, next <clears throat> our next speaker is Shrothi Pakar. She's the deputy CDA, CDAO uh, for acquisitions in the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Office in the Pentagon. By the way, you didn't think we'd have an intelligence program where we didn't sneak in AI someplace, right? Um, her talk is going to be on when being afraid is not an option. Shrothi. Good morning, everybody. It's such an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, when I was 15 years old, I got on a plane on a one-way ticket from Dhaka, Bangladesh, to come to New York City. The summer before starting junior year in college, I realized that the time had come for me to move out and live on my own. I had two part-time jobs that paid less than $10 an hour, and I was about to start a fully loaded semester in pursuit of me finishing up my computer engineering degree. I had two weeks to both find a place to live while house sitting for a dear friend and a new job that would let me afford the rent for this new place that I was about to find. When finishing up my senior year, I realized that the well laid out plan I had after graduation to simply transition into the full-time position from the part-time job at my then employer wasn't really that good. I was not enjoying what I was doing and I needed a job that would give me the opportunity to learn things, new things and grow. So I decided to take a pay cut and started a new job as a Department of Defense civilian at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Now at the time, I was living in downtown Brooklyn and fully convinced that it would be a two-year gig. I didn't have a driver's license, for those of you who have ever lived in New York. Hopefully that resonates. So for the first month, I took the subway to the other end of the Brooklyn so I could catch a ride with a fellow coworker who generously let me carpool with them. The next month, I decided I didn't really want to depend on somebody else for carpooling. So I used a combination of the subway, the New Jersey Transit, and then a cab ride to get to my work. Fast forward a couple of decades, and I'm fast forwarding because otherwise we'll be here for a while. <laughs> fast forward a couple of decades, I decided it would be a good idea to accept a job to work inside a skiff and spend anywhere between two and a half to three hours on the road commuting while also raising two kids under five. I really believe that behind every success is a number of untold failures. And sometimes the only way we overcome our fear is to confront them head on. And I believe many of us in this room, at one point or another in our lives, found ourselves in similar positions. And we knew that the only way to make it is to go right through. My 15-year-old self figured out a way to adjust into a completely new country, a completely new city, New York City, a new school system, and somehow also apply and get myself into a decent engineering school. In those two weeks before starting junior year, I found a new place for myself. I also found a better paying job and quit my other two jobs so I could support myself. By the third month after starting the job at Fort Monmouth, I had my driver's license, I bought my first car over the course of a weekend, and the following Monday, I started driving 110 miles an hour round trip per day from Brooklyn <laughs> for three years. And finally, I came to realize that commuting three hours a day to work in a skiff and not seeing your family while living through a pandemic is ultimately not sustainable, no matter how much you lo I love the mission. So I know I just shared maybe not some so great decisions I've made throughout my life, 
But if you'd allow me, I'd like to share a few things that have helped me keep going over the years. It's going to sound like a cliche, but really, be true to yourself and hold on to the values that matter the most to you. For me, it's been my integrity. Find yours and don't compromise. Work hard to find mentors. Some will be better than others, but you will learn something valuable from each one. And please pay it forward by mentoring others. Find a partner who will support you and treat your professional goals with the same respect as their own. And if you decide to have children, have them with a partner who's capable and willing to do their fair share. Take the win. There will be long days, there will be some really hard days, but there will be days when you will really want to also give up. But find the wins that will be there. Some days it's all you need to keep on going. And finally, embrace it all, because there will be always that next adventure, the opportunity to let go of your fear. Thank you. Thank you, Sharothi. And now to uh, wrap up uh, things, we have uh, Admiral Bob Sharp, former director of NGA and CEO of B Sharp Global Solutions, who will discuss, if not me, then who? Thank you. All right. It's always tough going last, right, especially um, when you get such insights as we did from the four previous speakers. So please, another round of applause for my colleagues. I have two batteries up here in case anybody needs these. I don't know why these are on the, the podium, <laughs> but I'll leave them alone. Hey, before I get started, uh, I also want to thank INSA for, for doing this and uh, creating this event and making it a priority to continue doing this. I want to thank the sponsors for making this possible. And then if you're feeling left out, don't, because I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. And uh, those of you who have, who have heard me speak before, I'm not a broken record, just consistent in my messaging. Um, but I, I, I tell people, and I really mean this, what you spend your time doing matters, or it should, right? I mean, Time is precious, and what you spend your time doing matters. So the fact that you're spending time today to be here, to invest in yourself, and to invest in this community is important. And if you're here because somebody that you work for or work with allowed you this time, go back and thank them, right? And, and share with them how you did indeed grow professionally by being here. And then I'm going to uh, echo and dogpile on what Suzanne was saying. Uh, I challenge you all to meet somebody you don't know, right? And exchange contact information. And then make sure you actually use that contact information, right? After about a week or so, send a note to somebody, right? And just stay connected because that is the strength of our community, right? It's, it's our people and our partnerships and those connections. And that will open up for you that mentorship, right? Um, any problem you experience in your career, I guarantee you somebody else has had something similar, right? Overcoming fear of failure. Who has dealt with the fear of failure before? Raise your hand, right? Okay, whoever doesn't have their hand raised is, is lying, <laughs> right? A great topic uh, for us here today. Uh, we were asked for short titles uh, for our presentations, and I deliberately chose. I jumped on it right away. If not me, then who? And uh, if that's sounding familiar, it's printed on a, a bunch of different logos associated with the Travis Mannion Foundation. Travis Mannion was a Naval Academy graduate, a Marine. He had served uh, bravely and successfully a uh, tour in Iraq and uh, came back and did a turnaround cycle. He was about to go to another assignment, but he extended so he could accompany his troops back out to Iraq, right? And some of those who loved him and were close to him said, why are you doing this? You don't have to do this. And that was his response. If not me, then who, right? And his perspective was, 
I've done all the training to do this. If I don't do it, somebody else is going to have to do it, and they might not be as prepared as me, right? And that's, that phrase has always resonated with me. If not me, then who? And when mentoring individuals, I turn it around, I say, if not you, then who, right? And if not now, then when? All right, so I will address uh, the topic of overcoming fear, uh, as always, in uh, three topics. Uh, I always speak in threes because all great things come in threes, right? You're going to hear it again. Holy Trinity, earth, wind, and fire, <laughs> the three musketeers, both the delicious candy bar and the swashbucklers. But as I get older, what I realize is I can remember three, right? <laughs> four gets a, a little hard for me. So I'll give you some personal perspective on overcoming failure, and then I'll share, uh, uh, share a couple of stories, one on uh, somebody overcoming their own self-limitations, and then one mentoring and encouraging other people. And you'll, re you'll recognize these individuals whose stories I'm sharing, and they both know I'm sharing their stories, right? So you may not know this about me, but I am like the poster child for failure. Right? And everybody's like, you're an admiral. I'm like, I didn't come in as an admiral. Right? They don't do that in the Navy. You have to, I have to spend a few years doing things beforehand. But I started my career in failure. I was a law school dropout. Right? I grew up thinking I wanted to be a lawyer until I got to law school. And I'm like, I do not want to do this for the rest of my life. And uh, my brother was enlisted in the Navy. And he said, hey, you ought to try the Navy. So I signed up for two years. Right? It was my intent to come in, check it out, see if I liked it. Um, I stayed a little longer than two years, failed to get out. Every time I took another set of orders, every time I took another, another set of orders, my wife would hold up two fingers and she'd say, hey, it's been a little longer than two years, mister. Right? But if you look at my career and I share my experiences, I have three distinct times in my career where people said, don't go do that. You'll never promote. Right? And I was uh, dumb enough to just say, I don't care, that's what I want to do, and it worked out for me. Right? And my career is, is full of examples of failing. Right? I'm, I learn something new every day, still, today, sometimes from the most junior person in the room. Right? Uh, I'm wrong every single day. I just try not to be wrong about the same thing over and over again. Right? But sometimes when people are giving you advice and they're saying, don't go do that, it's because they're looking at the past. Right? Their perspective is, that's not been the path that has led to success you know, previously for individuals. So you shouldn't do that. You should follow this model. But we need individuals who are going to think about the future. Right? We need individuals who, when somebody says, well, that's never been done before, their response is, right? Like somebody has to be the first, right? We, we need people who will help carve out new future for us, new pathways to success. So I encourage you to be that individual. All right, uh, the second story I'm going to share with you is from Tanya Wilkerson. Who knows Tanya? Probably a lot of ants, right? Phenomenal officer, right? She was uh, my deputy director at NGA. She's still the deputy director of NGA. And I didn't know her when Stacy Dixon left and I had to seek another uh, deputy. Um, but somebody had said, hey, you ought to meet Tanya, right? And I met her and I knew immediately she was what we needed as a leader to come in for where NGA was and where, more importantly, where it needed to go. But uh, after she had been there for a couple of weeks, she and I were over at uh, one of the, the sites, and she was, she was speaking. She was doing a fireside chat and uh, did exceptional at it. I was sitting in the front row just to give her support. But at, when it got to Q&A, somebody said, hey, Ms. Wilkerson, you've been very successful in your career. Can you share with us? Uh, sometimes you've struggled right, in your career. And, and without hesitation, she said, Every single time I've struggled in my career was when I self-limited, right? Uh, every time I've struggled in my career was when I self-limited. And then she said, and the Admiral hasn't heard this before, but he's about to, right? Which always makes me nervous, right? <laughs> and she said, um, I mean, honestly, she said, I had had one of those moments over at the agency 
And I had, I had not uh, volunteered or, or applied for an opportunity because I didn't think I was ready. And then I did some self-reflection and I was, I was angry with myself and I said, I will not let that happen again. And she said, when that phone rings, I'm saying yes. And I called. She goes, I called and she, and she said, yes, I would like to apply to be the next director of NGA or de deputy director of NGA. She really was a director. Um, <laughs> And then she said, but to tell you the truth, I was surprised when I was selected, right? And that, that should probably surprise some of you because you all know how fantastic she is. And she, she shared, not because I didn't think I could do the job, I just knew the, the quality of individuals that were applying for the job, right? And then she said, but what I've come to discover over the last two months is everything I did in my career prepared me to be the deputy director of NGA at this time in history. And my response was, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. Just think about that, though. If she had not said yes or self-limited, I would not have had her talents as the deputy director of NGA. right? And she really was and is absolutely the right person to help lead that agency into the future. Uh, my last story I'll share with you is a Stacy Dixon story. And uh, later on today, I'll be on stage elsewhere with Dr. Stacy Dixon talking about quantum computing, which is something I don't know a lot about, but she does. Um, but at one point during the pandemic, we were doing something we called crew calls, right? And it was part of our efforts to stay connected to our uh, geographically dispersed, protected force and uh, stay attuned with what was, what was going well, what wasn't going well. And we were talking with our interns, right? And we, we managed to still have an internship program throughout the pandemic. And uh, one of the interns asked us for, for, for us to share a time, you know, in our careers where we, we were very successful. You know, what's a highlight of your careers? And uh, Stacy, as always, had a brilliant response. And she said, I don't have a specific incident or like one thing I want to share with you. But she said, every single one of my highlights of my career involved me mentoring somebody and convincing them that they should do something that they thought they weren't prepared to do and then watching them succeed, right? Think about that. Um, don't self-limit yourself. Make sure in this group you help push people along, right? Because it's what our nation needs. It's what our community needs. If not you, then who, right? If you don't, if you don't throw your hat in the ring, you know what the answer is. You're not going to get the opportunity, right? If you apply, maybe you don't get it, but you can grow from that opportunity. So th this is audience participation now. I want to hear you self-affirmation loudly so I don't have to repeat it again. If not me, then who? If not me, then who? If not now, then when? If not now, then when? All right, go to great things. Thanks. Well, what an expiring session. Thank you, Bob and Colleen, Lakia, Marcel, and Sharothi for sharing your stories today. And as they share their stories, especially with Colleen starting off, um, I really wanted her to sing Let It Go. Um, and then I started thinking about a playlist, uh, you know, developing a playlist uh, for each of the speakers. So I have Let It Go for, for Colleen. I got Free Falling for Lakia. Uh, I got Long and Winding Road for Marcel. Drive My Car, another Beatles tune for Sharothi. And September by Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> For Bob, if you've got better, <laughs> if you've got better, better songs, let me know at the break. Um, also, um, I do. This was a great topic: letting go fear of failure. Thank you to Peggy O'Connor for coming up with that theme for this part of our program. Uh, and now we're going to take a break for lunch. And here's how it's going to work: um, you're going to get to. Stand up, hooray. Go get a drinks uh, outside, and while you get drinks, magically food is going to come in, and a, we're gonna have a plated 
uh, lunch. So that means we need space for the plates. If you could take your papers or uh, if you have any dirty cups or stuff out, that will really help us get the food. And um, see you. We'll be back here for Women as Leaders program. We'll start at 12.15. So get a drink. Back in your seats at 12.15 for the next program. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Please continue to eat your lunch as we move into our Women as Leaders program. We've had a really incredible start to the day, but it's gonna keep going. It is evident that the new IC continues to be an important forum for ongoing much needed discussion about the important issues related to this workforce. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the podium USGIF CEO, Rhonda Shrink, and GDIT's Deb Davis. Rhonda and Deb were extremely support, come on up here, come on up here, extremely supportive in taking this program that they originally had planned um, for this day out in the Dulles area and combining it with our, ours. So I appreciate both their sponsorship as well as their partnership. So I am gonna turn it over to you two. All right, thank you, Suzanne. Thanks. All right, how's lunch so far? Thumbs up, thumbs down? All right, INSA does an amazing job and we are so excited to be here today. One of the themes that I have heard over and over throughout the morning has been collaboration and diversity. And when I think about collaboration and diversity, not only do I think of INSA, but I think of those com components underneath it, like geography, background, experience, and increasingly, in addition to humans, also machines. And all of those things come together to support national security. So does anyone know what happens on 31 October this year? It is a trick question. It's my seven year anniversary of a meeting, Suzanne and the INSA team, when I got to come and spend two years as a senior fellow. And from that, we have built an amazing collaboration between our nonprofits. I watched Suzanne design this program more than five years ago, participated with her when she stood it up. And for those of you that have been along the journey for the last five years, she has continued with her team to evolve this program because, believe it or not, yes, the community is making strides forward. So give yourselves all a hand and recognize Suzanne as well. All right. And of course, we did find out a couple of months ago, Suzanne called Bob Sharp and said, hey, can you participate in this event? And he said, oh, I'd love to, but I'm already gonna do an event with Rhonda that day. So we realized that we had competing events with complementary topics on the same day. And what we decided to do was collaborate. And in that collaboration, I have a very um, special friend, colleague, board member, advisor, Deb Davis from GDIT that I'd like to invite to the podium to say a few words. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, it's an honor, it's always an honor to partner with Rhonda and USGIF. And uh, even greater honor to collaborate with INSA and Suzanne today. So we're really excited about this. This is a three-part series on women as leaders. I'm very grateful to GDIT for the commitment to women leaders, diverse leaders, and all of those who support them, or us. I guess I am one of them. <laughs> um, and these, these sessions started in July. We had our first one. It's a great session. Who was, he, who was with us at USGIF headquarters in July? See a lot of hands going up, that's awesome. Thank you for coming to this one and uh, hope to see you again at the third event in November. And um, 
Hope you are uh, inspired and empowered by our lunch presentation today. Thanks, Rhonda. All right, speaking of empowered, we have two amazing DEI advisors from Empowered to be our lunchtime facilitators. Please welcome to the stage Susan Apgood and Anjali Varma. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me? OK, great. Um, thank you so much for having us. We are excited to present on the topic of women's leadership. I'm Anjali Varma. This is Susan Apgood. And we have a DEI consulting firm called Empow Heard, uh, where we offer corporate training programs and DEI consulting. Uh, Susan and I are both adjunct professors at American University in the business school. That's where we met. And we created a women in leadership class um, for the undergraduate business students, which we realized there was so much content that was really powerful for young women that were rising um, through the ranks, but also for more seasoned women, um, and also for companies to understand how to really empower women. Um, so today, we are going to go through, fairly quickly, um, a few different objectives. The first one will be to look at the impact of diverse teams. Um, and the impact that generations have in the workforce. Um, so somebody alluded earlier to age and how that impacts, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll look at the status of women um, in the workforce and also look at current challenges that women are facing. Um, and then we will move into what we can do to support and elevate women. So looking at men as allies and also how organizations through their DEI efforts and management can support and really empower and raise uh, women as well. So we are hoping that this will be an interactive discussion. Uh, you know, we will throw out a couple of questions. We're used to undergraduate students that maybe, you know, the crickets will start, but I'm hoping, you know, somebody will answer. Um, and we will have mics going around. But if you have a thought, a comment, a question, as we are kind of talking, please feel free. We want it to be interactive as opposed to us just talking to you. So. Before kind of diving into women's leadership, you know, looking at the impact of diverse teams, I think we all know that inclusive cultures, we've heard this a lot, right, DEI, inclusive cultures, often, you know, people think of it as a box that they are checking, right? Um, but there are so many benefits, and, and the professors in us like to give facts or stats that really show what those benefits of inclusive and diverse teams are. So in inclusive business cultures and policies are more likely to report about a 60% increase in creativity and innovation. Probably not surprising, right? If you think about it, having different perspectives come to the table, whether it's gender, whether it's race, whether it's age, um, those diverse perspectives help to fuel creativity and innovation, right? 35% um, of an employee's emotional investment to work and 25% of their desire to stay is linked to their feelings of inclusion. And we find this even more with the younger generation. Um, you know, we have kind of heard anecdotally that um, you know, companies are finding that employees are willing to take less salary um, in order to be part of a culture that they feel like is inclusive and also is kind of socially responsible or in line with what they, what they, the values that they stand for. And finally, over three years, companies with higher diversity in management earned 38% more in revenue, right? So it's not just a nice to have, it's not just fueling innovation, but it's really also impacting positively for the bottom line for companies. Okay, so we, we heard a stat this morning about 25% um, of the workforce in intelligence is under the age of 40, and what that's gonna look like in 20 years, right? So I want to touch on a little bit about generations in the workforce. Right now we have four generations in the workforce um, and all have different styles and different ways of working and collaborating. So I'm just going to briefly go through them uh, and then we're going to overlay that with some women in leadership statistics. So we have baby boomers that are in the workforce born between the years 1946 and 1964. Uh, many of them are retiring each day, but we still have quite a few in the workforce. And they are accustomed to sort of the traditional office environment. Face-to-face -face meetings, working nine to five, sort of set in that way, is that's the way that they grew up in the workforce. 
Then we have Generation X, born between 1964 and 1980. So those are, hail, hail <laughs> to the Gen Xers. Um, those of us that are in Generation X, we tend to embrace technology and value face-to-face -face communications, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be in an office space where we are working nine to five, uh, but we understand that value and what it brings to us personally and professionally. Then we have millennials in the workforce, and that's the largest segment in the workforce right now, born between 1981 and 1996. Um, they're very confident. Millennials are very confident working remotely, uh, which showed up, of course, during the pandemic. And we'll talk a little bit about the post-pandemic world as well and in women in leadership. Uh, and they're highly adaptable uh, to flexible work situations. So we might see people that are traveling but working during the hours that they need to get things done, um, having meetings online, but not tied to a traditional office space. Then we have Gen Z. So those are born between, those, uh, that generation is born between 1997 and 2012, right? And so those, um, that, those in the, that generation are very used to technology. Obviously, they're digital natives. They have not known life without technology. Um, so they're very um, focused on flexible work and uh, know that they can do work anywhere uh, at any time. So they don't want to be tied to as many deadlines. They want to be, be um, responsible for outcomes, but not so much on a timeline that somebody else gives them, right? So very different overgeneralizations for each workforce. Uh, but with this, these generations, we also have to cross-reference with women in the workforce, right? So right now in this room, there's probably about 75% women. Um, and that's the focus of our DEI work. Uh, so we're going to think about those generations as we lead into talking about women in the workforce. So just a brief history of women in the workforce. Women started working in the workforce in about the 1920s, so just about 100 years ago. right? And from um, fast forward to the start of the pandemic from 2002 to early this year, women were leaving the workforce at rates higher than we've ever seen in the last 30 years. Now, why was that? Mostly because of the pandemic and that um, life that was conflicting between work and child care, elder care, et cetera. So a lot of women felt that they couldn't do everything, and so work was what suffered, and uh, they let their jobs go, typically because their male counterparts we're earning more money, right? So, um, but then this year we got some really good financial indicators. In June of this year, women that are between the ages of 25 and 55 are employed at a higher rate than ever before in US history since we've been taking, uh, reading these statistics or, or learning from these statistics. So we made a quick swing um, back to women being fully employed. Now, what does this mean? This means that it's a huge opportunity, right? It's a huge opportunity for companies to re-engage women that maybe left the workforce for a couple years, for 18 years to raise children, and then came back after, um, after their children went to college. You know, it really depends, but it's such a great opportunity to have women uh, re-engage, okay? So just a few facts about women in the workforce. For every 100 women promote, oh, sorry, for every 100 men promoted from entry level positions to management roles, so we know that this group here is a very seasoned group, so management and above, only 87% of women are promoted. Okay, that's from a McKinsey study from last year. There are a total of 52 CEOs in the Fortune 500, uh, which is up from 8 to 10%, uh, and only three women. Uh, CEOs in Fortune 500 companies are women of color. Okay? So women represent a little over 50% of the US population. And in Congress, we're represented by about 26.2% women. Right? So highly underrepresented in that government space. We talk a lot about the pay gap. 
uh, and women and pay uh, and how that can be very differentiated. Uh, women get paid more than men on only 34 of 550 listed job position, positions in the US Census. So that's a very low number, 34 out of 550. Okay. Uh, and then women hold 38% of all managerial positions, while men hold the remaining 62%. So that's a big switch, considering we are a little over 50% of the workforce. Uh, so what Anjali and I work every day to do is build awareness about what's going on. We talk about potential solutions. We tell stories. And we want to hear feedback on um, what interests you and what you've seen within your career. So we're going to talk for a moment now about barriers that women have for advancement. Right? Can anybody think of a barrier for women in advancement? Just sort of off the top of your head. Yes. Unconscious, unconscious bias. bias. Great. Wow, way to steal our thunder. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> okay. That's so awesome. unconscious bias, which we will touch upon in a moment. What else? Okay, a gravitas deficit. Okay, 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 right? So we heard um, Keeleen and some other people speak this morning about fear and about there's a job that you were applying for. You didn't have nine of the nine things that were asked for. You only had eight and you didn't apply, right? In that same statistic, how many uh, of those tasks do you think men have to complete of those nine before they'll apply for a job. For women, it's eight. Somebody said two? Three? Yeah, three is the correct answer, right? So what we do as women is we don't apply for things unless we have the nine of nine, or we might have eight of nine and learn the other one before we get the interview. Yes? The right sponsor. Not a mentor. Okay. The right sponsor. Okay. Absolutely. That person is showcased so that that person can share with others across the leadership spectrum. Yep. Their critical skill sets, yep. their knowledge, right. the way they deal with problems. Yep, absolutely. So having a sponsor is key, and we'll definitely talk about that in a moment as well. Primary caretakers at home. Yes, right? Child care, elder care, elder care are typically the two biggest reasons, right? So there are, there are sort of three buckets that we put these barriers in. One is organizational. And that can be an industry base, a company base. It can be our corporate culture here in the United States, where we just don't have cultures that tend to be supportive towards women. And we'll talk about unconscious bias and bias in just a moment. Also relationships. So that sponsorship that we were talking about, you know, having mentors, seeing a path to the future uh, is one that we tend to lack as females. And I think part of it is our perfectionism, right? We want to be perfect at everything. I know this was an issue for me when I started out in my career. I didn't want to reach out to people because I didn't want people to think I didn't know things. So I instead spent many years trying to figure stuff out on my own instead of embracing a mentor or, or somebody that could help sponsor me. And then there's, of course, um, the personal thing. So the family caregiving, um, having, uh, having children, having children that get sick and you have to leave and you're seen as maybe unreliable. And we're always sort of um, backing up against those obstacles and it's hard to come back from those because sometimes you do something once or twice and then at work it might become an always, he's always out with a sick child or she's always driving them to soccer, whatever that might be. So reasons that this happen is for the biases that we have. So we have a bias, and then we also have an unconscious bias. So a bias, by definition, is prejudice in favor of or against a person or a group compared with another, usually in a, uh, considered in a, very, in a way to be very unfair. Okay? So that's the definition of bias. And so we, we see that I've been biased in my own career. Uh, 
you know, hiring women. My thought is, oh gosh, okay, what if I hire them, I train them, and then they go off and get married and have kids. Then I've done all of that training for nothing, right? That's my own bias, and I'm a proud mother of three children. I went through it myself. Uh, but we all have those biases. Um, and then there's the unconscious bias, which is the stereotypes that we provide in our own mind, the stories that we tell ourselves to make it OK to not accept an application or not have someone in for an interview or not promote somebody on your team for an advancement. Right? So that is something that is harder to deal with, because it's not something you can really overtly point your finger at. But one stat that we found about bias that, that really stuck out with us is 41% of male managers agree that their organization leadership believes that women with children are just as dedicated to the job as women who don't have children, right? So only 41%. So even though we don't think that there is that bias, it's reported in study after study. So it's really important to recognize uh, those biases and get past them. And these unconscious biases, biases that we're referring to, they're not the overt, right? They're not overt um, prejudice that maybe is taking place or overt stereotypes. They are much more ingrained. We don't realize they're even happening. Um, and so bias towards female leaders is driven both by these conscious and these unconscious associations. So women in general are they elicit communal associations. So nurturing, caring, friendly, kind, sensitive. Those are kind of the, the associations or traits that we typically unconsciously place with women. Whereas with men, they elicit more agentic associations like aggressive, firm, ambitious, dominance, self-confidence, right? Um, and what we find is that the associations that we have for leaders in an organization typically skew toward those male characteristics more than they do those female characteristics, right? So when a woman embodies some of those male or agentic characteristics like firm, confident, dominant, they can be seen as bossy or other B words, right? And this is a concept that we call the double bind. It's the seesaw that women are t continually trying to navigate in showing up, being a leader, being strong, but then kind of holding those communal characteristics that people associate with women and expect from women. So it's a kind of a constant seesaw, right? Um, anyone who was not at our first talk um, you know, have thoughts on somebody who maybe embodies this that we see in the media that really kind of is the epitome of the double bind struggling? You could just yell it out. Yeah, Hillary Clinton, right? She's probably the one that the media has, is, is the b biggest epitome of that, right? She struggled with being firm and dominant and aggressive, but then she was seen as bossy or other B words. Um, and then if she tried to show the softer side, she was kind of um, you know, under fire for that as well. So that is the concept that we call the double bind, and that you, know, you will see kind of play out in corporate culture often. Now, we know that not all women are created equal, right? So we want to look a little bit at this idea of women of color, because it's not just women. All women are not the same, right? And so some women, um, particularly women of color, will have other biases that are coming into, into play, right, that can also impact their trajectory, that can also impact kind of their journey and the way that they interact in a corporate culture. So despite modest gains in representation since 2015, women of color are still dramatically underrepresented in corporate America. So what we find now is that um, women make up about 48% of entry level positions in corporate America, and women of color make up about 40% of that, which is, I guess, not so bad, right? But as we go up the scale to women in the C-suite, First of all, we see that there are way fewer women right, in the C-suite. There are one in four women in the C-suite. And the number for women of color is one in 20. So a dramatic difference, again, in male-female, but then also female women of color versus not. So what are some of the challenges that we kind of see that are specific to women of color? When we talk about this topic, intersectionality becomes a, a big theme. And intersectionality is this idea that 
um, a woman has some of these unconscious biases that are placed on her, right? And race also has other unconscious biases that are associated or, or illicit stereotypes. And oftentimes, those unconscious biases, they conflict, right? So it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? So particularly for women of color, this quote always, I think, resonates or kind of shows this idea of intersectionality and this, the struggle that many come with. Um, the same systems that reward confidence in male leaders punish white women for lacking confidence, punish women of color for showing too much confidence, and punish all women for demonstrating it in a way that's deemed unacceptable. So again, not all women created equal, right? Some of these biases that come into play will impact how others are viewing a woman and will then impact kind of her journey, her ability to rise through the ranks as a result. And what we find with this topic is that there are a lot of microaggressions that really come into play. So again, it isn't necessarily on purpose. It is not top of mind. These are much more systemic issues that are kind of ingrained in our culture. They're ingrained in our corporate culture. Um, and you know, microaggressions are defined as everyday subtle, intentional, and unintentional interactions that communicate bias. So we find that often um, when we're looking at women of color. And what we also find is that organizations may rise women of color through the ranks. However, it's many times they are put on what they call glass cliffs. So they are put in precarious leadership positions where it's almost destined to fail, right? It's like a hard, it's the hard job that no one else is going to do. And they are put in that position. People can say, we've put this woman, we've checked our DEI box. However, the glass cliff is really there. And they don't have the support that they need in order to really be successful in those roles. So even though they are there, um, they don't stay there, right? We also find that there is a lack of proactive systematic change. So many organizations will hire a DEI officer that is kind of like a figurehead, but they're not really going in and looking at these entrenched biases and looking at corporate culture and looking at who is in what positions in order to really make change. So those are some of the challenges that we see uh, for women leaders. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about what you all and everyone can do to support women to really help to rise them through the ranks. Um, and first, we're going to talk about male as allies. Um, so it may be surprising, or maybe not, that there is a perception gap that women and men have. Um, so women often will say that men are um, allies like 40% of the time. Whereas men will say, oh, I'm an ally like 80% of the time, right? Um, and so we see that there's often a perception gap where males think that they are being allies, but maybe they are not showing up in the way that women find could be the most effective for them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some ways that males can kind of serve as allies and to this idea of sponsorship versus mentorship, right? Sponsorship is this idea of somebody helping to lift and amplify somebody, to bring them into the conversation, to go to them in a meeting and say, what do you think, Susan, right? Versus mentorship is helping you in your career. So there is a difference. Um, and allyship, when we talk about male as allies, it's really important to think about what is the definition of allyship. Similarly, it's using one's power or position to support or advocate for coworkers with less power or status. So oftentimes, right, we find that men are in more of the positions of power. So what can you do to help to sponsor the women in the room and kind of help to lift them throughout the ranks? One of the issues that we find that men have is 87% of men want to help with gender equality, they want to serve as allies, but they really don't know how to help. So today, one of our goals is to start this conversation, to start this dialogue, and to maybe give you some ideas. Um, and you know, it's helpful for women to understand this too, right? Because part of the onus is on women to, to have these dialogues with men in their organization as well, right? Um, so men sometimes will worry about coming across as inappropriate or not knowing the right way to have that discussion. Um, so it's really up to both of us to have the discussion together and how we would like to be supported. Um, one, one thing that often happens is this idea of male heroism or rescuing, right? So kind of the male swooping in and helping, right? And that is not what allyship is, right? It is coming together 
together as opposed to individually. Um, and so kind of that is one issue we sometimes see. Um, and allyship, one of the ways that we can kind of see it really play out is in meetings. And that's kind of one of the easiest tips that we have, a tangible tip that we can walk away with today in order to think about the way that meetings are conducted. Oftentimes we'll find that women are talked over in meetings or Susan will make a point and then Jim will make that point and people will say, Jim, that's a great point, right? And, and Susan kind of gets overlooked in having made that original point. So that is an opportunity for a male ally in the room to toss it back to Susan and say, Susan, you know, when you mentioned it, you said X, Y, and Z, right? Um, so giving her the opportunity, whether she made the point or not, to um, have that voice in that meeting, tossing it to her, bringing it back to her, a very easy way or a, a tangible way that you know, tomorrow you can go out. And I think what, a lot of what we talk about we find that people, it kind of settles in, and then you're going to be in the work, in the work world, and you're going to see it happen. Um, and then that could be the opportunity to, to step up as an ally. Um, a couple other specific tips. Um, allyship is a verb, not a noun, right? So it really is action-oriented. What are the actions that you can do to amplify and to raise and to elevate your women colleagues? It is with, not for. So it's this idea, again, of not swooping in and doing for, but really figuring out how you can work together in order to elevate and to amplify women. It perpetuates autonomy, not dependence. Similar concept, right? Um, and allyship is critical of the status quo. So it's not just doing things as they've always been done, but really looking at what the system is and how do we fix it? How do we break it? and make it better for women across all generations. And um, one book that I find is really great, these guys are great if people are interested in this topic more, is Good Guys, How Men Can Be Better Allies for Women in the Workplace. David Smith and Brad Johnson talk a lot about this concept and um, we like to provide some resources in case people you know, want to do a little bit more um, research or homework after. Okay, so now looking at how organizations can support uh, women, um, some of the tangible ideas or, or implementations that you can do, again, starting tomorrow in your, in your own organizations to, to better support or elevate women. First is leading by example, right? So there is concrete evidence that women and women of color really do want to see others ahead of them that does impact their ability to rise, right? So you have to start at the top, having people that look like them in order to really start to have it filter throughout the entire organization. Establishing, we talked, uh, we heard a lot today about different ERG groups, right? Establishing ERG groups and inclusion councils that are specific to women and specific to women of different races, right? Again, this idea of people coming together um, in order to talk about the challenges and the issues that they have and also to support one another and provide ideas and recommendations on how to overcome some of these challenges. Um, improving communication channels and um, looking at your current HR processes. So someone kind of alluded to this earlier, but where are you recruiting? Are you recruiting at places where women are prevalent and or particular races are prevalent? Are you including, are you looking at your job descriptions to make sure that they are speaking to a variety or a diverse audience? Um, providing diversity and inclusion training, right? Seems obvious, but again, having these conversations and facilitating these conversations with employees in a safe space where they feel like they can talk about what their issues and or challenges are and share strategies to overcome them can be very, very powerful. And fostering mentoring and sponsorship programs, again, with males and also with female executives. So earlier this year, uh, Psychology Today, so the American Psychological Association, came out with a survey of 1,200 working women. And they talked a lot about how women feel they're being held back in the workplace. Uh, one stat that came out of it was 74% of women say they would leave an organization if their employer did not invest in their career development. Right. So if you just feel like you're working all the time, not coming to wonderful events like this, um, networking, you feel very isolated, very alone, 
And that's a huge thing for, for women to feel needed and part of a team. Um, and so one thing we can do as leaders is invest in careers um, and sh give women a path. So we started off by talking a little bit about diverse teams and how they drive revenue, but they also can help um, find a path for women. You can, you can see somebody and say, I want to be like that person in five years, and then I want to do that in 10 years. But if there's nobody like you that's in that space, it's very hard to imagine, right? So finding that path, finding those sponsors that can help pull you along um, is really important. Women are really good at seeing talent in other people and not so much in themselves, right? So if you have a coworker or a manager or somebody that is, is working um, under you that you're managing and you see a certain skill that they have, let them know about it, right? A lot of times, women in general, we tend to have this scarcity model in our head that there's only so much room at the top, right? We're OK until we get to about the director level. And then we start to think, oh, I've really got to like, hold everything close because they're only going to allow one woman, one woman in the C-suite or one woman on the board of advisors or whatever that might be. But creating that path so that we know all can rise is really important. Another thing is build confidence and focus on recognition. Right? We tend to be hard on ourselves, and we tend to think, I shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have expressed that. Right? We tend to let things overrule what we're actually meaning to do, and we lose credibility in that way. So it's really important to um, make sure that you see confidence and competence in other women and call it out. Right? So the example that Anjali gave about saying something, but saying it with like, not as much confidence, and I think it'd be great if we did this, and kind of sort of making everything a, a, a qualification, instead of saying, I think we should do this. right? But then our male counterpart might say it with a stronger, more convicted voice, and then all of a sudden it becomes his idea. So one thing we recommend is if you see somebody with an idea, ask everybody to stop and sort of pull on that thread. right? It's often the people that don't speak the most in meetings that have the most to say. And of course, our worlds are, are very different now, uh, post-COVID, because we were sort of you know, all working online, and now people are uh, half in, half out of the office. So we have to sort of scope out our positions, whether it's virtually or whether it's in person. Right? If we're in person, uh, it's really important to scope out a room that you're in. Um, check out where you want to sit. Sit at the table instead of around the table. Uh, things that just put you in a better position and a better mindset as being a participant in that meeting. Uh, so it's really important to focus on that and to, to say to people, hey, I, I heard what you said in that meeting. I heard that, and I would love to see more of that. Or you really have something here. Uh, that can go a long way. And we've been teaching, well, I've been teaching for about eight years at American University. I get notes from students who are now in their late 20s saying, gosh, you said that one thing to me back in our intro to business class, and I can't tell you how much it helped me. Right? We don't know the power of our words until they reflect back on us. Uh, so it's really important to, to sort of help pull people along. Another thing is um, help prevent burnout. How many people have felt, felt burned out since COVID started, right? It's, it's hard. So actively, 78% uh, of women have felt burnout in the last 18 months. So that is all of 2022 and the last half of 2021, okay? It's a big number. And 55% say that they currently feel at risk for burnout, right? So what makes us burned out? It's the things that we feel we're always um, into one obligation to another. We're, we're jumping from taking care of kids to work to getting reports done, and it, it, the, the treadmill kind of never stops. And you get that feeling of hopelessness, of, oh my gosh, I just can't do this for another day. Right? And so the onus of a lot of household responsibilities, with or without children, 
tend to fall more on females by about three to one. Okay? Um, and then once you put children into the mix, that number goes up. So really important to uh, watch for that and see the signs of it and take care of yourself. Right? We had a whole talk earlier today about uh, mental health and taking care of your mental health. Because we're no good for other people, whether that's our spouse, our children, our managers, our company, our corporate culture, if we're not good for ourselves. So really important to watch for that burnout. Uh, and then the other thing that we, we talk a lot about is addressing biases, right? And, and surveying employee experiences. Uh, let people know, let management know that there is an underlying feeling of biases, right? It's great to have a culture where you can call things out and say, wait, I heard that, let's address it, and let's move on. But a lot of times there are long-built relationships and it's, oh, that's just that person, right? But things will never change unless we speak out about them. So it's really important to make sure that we know what our limitations are, that we know um, what a microaggression is, that we know what a bias looks like. Uh, you know, I had a boss tell me one time when I was 26, I was just finishing business school, I went in and I said, I want to be director of marketing. I've done this, 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 and this, right? And I was just about to get my MBA in finance. And he said, you're too young. That was his answer. Not you're not qualified, not you're not, and I, I think back to that conversation and think, if I was a 26-year-old male, how would that look different, right? So have those uncomfortable conversations. Feel that fear and do it anyway, right? There's a, a statistic about women and negotiation. And women tend to be really good at negotiating for other women. You should hire Anjali for this job. She's so great. She's conscientious. Do you know she did this? We're very poor at bragging about ourselves, right? So we, we just don't have that gravitas where we walk in with confidence, but we happily do it for other people. In negotiating for our first jobs, men, on average, start about $2,000 more per year than women. Okay? It doesn't sound like a lot, right? But over the course of the year, so if you're starting at 40,000 versus 42,000 or 65,000 instead of 67,000, you think every time you make a leap and you get a 10% salary increase or an 8%, 6%, whatever it is, over the course of a career, that's a half a million dollars in salary. <coughs> that's a lot of money to leave on the table. So we encourage people to be bold in negotiations. I'm going through a, a negotiation right now at my job. I'm asking for about 20% more than I will settle for because I have to be bold. Because if I'm not bold and I ask for just what I want, then the negotiation's on and I'm gonna get under that number. So knowing what we are made of, what we can lend to an organization, uh, what we keep track of what we've done, the reports that we've done, the, the uh, revenue that we've generated, whatever that is, whatever our key indicators are, it's so important to be able to um, go to your leadership or that next rung and say, this is what I want to do and here's why I need to be there, okay? So um, a couple things that we recommend that women can do uh, to help their position and their presence. And men too, of course, this is for, for everybody. But creating awareness of your space is really important. Preparing for meetings is important, right? I have always been one that I show up for a meeting, I'm never late, but I'm never early. Right? So I know there's a lot of uh, military people here, and, and you know, if, you're, if you're on time, you're late. Right? That tends to be, I have a lot of friends in the military, and that tends to be, right? So you want to be in position and ready to go. You don't want to run into a meeting late and uh, feel all disheveled, like, and then people have already started the conversation. So really important to prepare. Vocalize confidently. Really important to do that. As women, we tend to upspeak a lot. We do a lot of work with the um, Office of Communications at American University. 
and they talk a lot about tone, right? And so when we upspeak, we tend to lose our credibility, right? So speaking with confidence, letting pauses sit is really important. Uh, one thing a mentor at AU told me was, when you ask a question to the audience, it's OK to let your students sit there for a minute, because finally somebody will feel uncomfortable and raise their hand. I used to just jump in all the time and provide the answers, and then they would think, oh, if, I don't, if we don't answer, she'll answer for us. Right? So those uncomfortable silences are absolutely OK. okay? Um, apologizing and minimizing are things that we tend to do as women. We tend to walk in, say, sorry, I'm late, sorry, sorry, right? Or you bump into somebody, or they bump into you, and we say we're sorry. You know, it, so it's not that you don't want to ever apologize, but many times it's the word, first word that comes out of our mouth, right? Same with the word just, right? I overuse the word just a ton. Hi, it's just me calling, just checking in. That automatically uh, minimizes your role in that conversation. It puts you at a disadvantage, right? So making sure that you're very careful with your words and speak them and end your sentences as strongly as you started them, super important, okay? Uh, know the power of body language, right? Sitting there with your shoulders hunched over, looking at your phone or your watch, indicates a much different position than shoulders back and being engaged, right? We think it doesn't matter. It was something I observed quite a bit during COVID when everybody was on Zoom. You could tell the engaged versus the disengaged before they even opened their mouth, right? So making sure that you have that confident body language, super important. And then lastly, avoiding overthinking. Right? A lot of times we will say something or do something and dwell on it and dwell on it, and that becomes our crutch. I can't believe I said that in that meeting 10 years ago. Right? So and so <laughs> hates me. Right? So it, sometimes you just have to apologize and move on. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. It was inappropriate. Can we move forward? Right? And sometimes it's hard to do. You know, having, having colleagues that don't apologize and hold on to things makes it really hard. But if you're able to let stuff go and just kind of look forward, you know, sort of let, let that fear go and move forward, it can be <coughs> super helpful. Okay. Yes? Oh, do you want a microphone? There we go. What do you think of that um, chestnut, maybe? Uh, that I've heard that uh, when men have an argument, they just have an argument mm -hmm. and they resolve it and mm -hmm. they move on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. But women avoid conflict at all costs, mm -hmm. but then when there is a conflict, it's to the death. Correct. So, <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I've heard this. So I'm just curious what you think about that. Yes. We, we often talk about how women are our own worst enemies, right? Like it is it's oftentimes the scarcity model that Susan alluded to earlier where it's, you know, we, there's only so many spots at the top. And so we're, it's, you know, we're going to fight tooth and nail for that. I think that is one issue that comes into play there. But I also think our, the emotions get the best of, of women more than men. And so dwelling, ruminating, not being able to move on. Um, you know, we say don't say sorry, but then there are times when you should, obviously, right? So I think, but I think some of those more emotional and communal characteristics that we talked about earlier come into play with conflict and also avoiding conflict. I'm the worst at that. I yeah. will avoid it. <laughs> and, and I think what happens many times with women is it's not about the argument anymore, it just becomes personal. And that's when you need to step away. We have, between the two of us, we have five teenage boys, <laughs> and they fight, right, with each other, and then they let it go, and they walk away, and they're best friends 10 minutes later, right? So I think it's, it's when the professional conversation is no longer productive, and it becomes very personal. And that's what we hold on to, as opposed to the point of the original argument it's more about the attacking, which is unfortunate. Yes? <laughs> uh, 
I was writing down some notes about <clears throat> women of color. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking in terms of when we're not at the table, mm -hmm. you're senior, but you're not at the table, mm -hmm. and something is said and is misunderstood, rumors start. Mm -hmm. And if somebody at that table isn't strong mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. or bold enough, or courageous enough mm -hmm. to defend that person when they know it's wrong, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what women of color fear on occasion mm -hmm. because the rumor mill can totally get out of control. Mm -hmm. And then there is a the thing of unwritten rules that you haven't talked about yet. There are unwritten rules that sometimes when you come into a new organization, you just don't know them because mm -hmm. they're not in the handbook. Mm -hmm. And yeah. somebody needs to pull you aside and say, this is what works here. Mm -hmm. We just want you to be aware of it so you'll know how to deal with it when you're faced with it. Yes. Then the second point I wanted to make is, a third point, is I teach leadership for, to MBA students and graduate students at Howard University. Awesome. So I'm teaching my people, my students of color, which is most of them are, mm -hmm. how to deal with microaggressions mm -hmm. in the workplace mm -hmm. and how to deal with negative feedback because they're going to get it all the time, and they're not going to know how to deal with it. That's that leadership component that we don't talk about it, and it's not in a textbook. Right. Yeah. And I think your first point is this idea that allyship is a verb, not a noun, right? So when the person is not in the room, who is the one that is standing up for that person or amplifying their voice or you know, throwing it back to them even if they aren't in the room? That is what a true ally is, right? When you're in the room and also when you're not in the room. Yeah. Can yeah. I just make a quick point? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm loud enough that I can say, like, so you were talking about presence. Yes. Um, and for black and brown people, one of the biggest challenges, I don't know if you've heard about the Brown Act, is a lot of black and brown people, including women, across the U.S. are being discriminated against because of the hair that grows out of mm -hmm. your head. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to, for the purpose of people who are here, especially leaders, to understand that there are young people and people who are my age, uh, mature, who don't bring their full self to work mm -hmm. because they are told that the presence and the professional uh, attire and being uh, coming up to an interview, I was actually asked by some students as I went or work around the U.S. of universities, black and brown students, I heard that it's not right for me to wear my hair curly. Mm -hmm. I heard I, that. I have also been asked that same question by someone who was actually told that next time you do an interview like this, don't wear your hair curly. Or in braids. Yeah. Um, so you, wearing your hair natural, wearing your hair curly, wearing your hair in braids for colored women, for uh, women of color, black and brown people around the U.S., it's something that is real. The Crown Act is real. And there are people who are really afraid, um, literally, to show up to a, an interview and then to their job because they're afraid that if I wear my hair in braids and curly, they're going to think I'm not professional, which is very sad. But I just encourage and urge people here who are in leadership positions to, if you don't know, Google the Crown Act. And if you are in a leadership position, if you are on an interview panel, if you have authority to hire interview people, please, please, please make sure that you're conscious of that and that you encourage people to present themselves as they are and wear the hair that grows out of their head. And I think that that is something that a lot of people don't even realize, right? So I think that m many people who are not women of color don't even realize that that is an issue, right? So they, they, it's not even, again, it's, it's an unconscious bias versus a conscious one. But one of our goals in doing workshops like this is to start the dialogue so that people can start to talk and you can share with this audience, right, that this is an issue yeah. so that people are more cognizant of it and people can start talking about it. I would say, and I w I'm curious what you think, that it has become a dialogue that is more now in the workplace slowly and that people are at least starting to talk about it. But I don't know if, if you all ag agree with that. I, we I actually, I make, I'm very intentional. We are okay, but we're not, we're nowhere close to where we need to be. And that's why I say the Crown Act is real. Yeah. I'm intentional when I show up to different speaking engagements to show up as myself in my African attire, in my hair curly or in braids, because I want to send a message, directly or indirectly, to people who are looking at me that I work in the IC, yep. I'm a professional, 
I wear my hair as I, as I want, and that is professional. But to your question, to answer your question, I don't know that we're doing it. Yeah. It's better than that. I mean, I think, you know, that now the media and, um, you know, people are kind of out in the forefront are being more vocal about it and starting to kind of repre represent themselves, you know, in their more true fashion. So hopefully it will continue to, but I do think that's kind of why having ERGs, having DEI training and workshops that are really, you know, the goal is to have these conversations that can sometimes feel awkward or people don't even understand um, are really critical in order to move the needle and make change. Yes. I have one question over here. Uh, yes, my name's Lorenzo. I, I work at NASA headquarters. Um, I was speaking regarding um, uh, my mentor, Dr. Gant, over there. Um, as we speak to um, mentorship, advocate, and sponsor. Uh, currently, I have uh, four individuals who've been recommended to me as mentees. Um, actually five, I have a student at Emory Riddle University, Cal Poly Pomona out in California, UC Berkeley. I have a civil servant um, who I'm mentoring and also a, a person who's in the military uh, transition program. I speak to that as we speaking of, of uh, men being advocates, um, all these individuals are males and all recommended to me by females. Hmm. So and it, and when we speak of men being sponsors, advocates, mentors, here's five individuals, all male, all recommended to me by three different women. Huh. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, my name is Jamali Smith. I'm a sophomore political science major and international affairs minor at Harvard University. And my question is, how do you guys go about the new Jim Crow? And when I speak about the new Jim Crow, I'm talking about um, when it comes to names and ethnic names and getting jobs. So my father, he's an immigrant, but he changed his last name in order to get jobs. So his last name was Kayenko, which is from Sierra Leone, and he changed it to Smith, which changed my last name. And he did that in order to get good jobs, and he had a good job. But how do you guys go about that and teach younger kids mm -hmm. and kids of ethnicities to go about using their last name and being strong and proud about where they're from right. and how they can get better jobs? Yeah, no, that's a, a great point. Um, I'm mentoring some students at uh, American University that are in the MBA program. And most of them are international and have asked that, that same question. And I'm sure your father did it to make the path easier for you. I mean, studies show the shorter your name, the more likely you are to get a job interview, right? So that's just the way that it works. And so we, we talk a lot about like what we're talking about with the Crown Act here and, and sort of embracing that as opposed to shying away from it and talking about the pride of your name and what that means and um, how it will help, how you're a diverse, you know, part of a, gonna be part of a team and lend that diversity to it, have a different point of view, different creativity, different thoughts, can really help um, an organization that would be lucky to have you. And I've started to even see uh, job descriptions that will say like women aren't as confident in applying for a job as men go off and do it anyway, right? And or people of color are not as confident to apply for this job, do it anyway. Like their people are much more explicit almost in the job yeah. description um, in encouraging people to apply. Okay. I Last think we, quick question. I, can we have oh, one more one? and then? Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. Oh, oh sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I've been trying to circle back for a minute. Um, yeah. Cheryl Sandberg has a great quote about bringing your whole self to work. You don't have a different self Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And so I think it is really important that you show up who, as who you are and kind of incorporate your whole self. So I think that's really critical. But I wanted to come back to the point about emotions. Um, I once had a mentor and boss where I apologized about being emotional. And he said, absolutely don't ever apologize about being emotional because it shows that you're passionate. And um, the statement was made that women uh, that emotions get the best of women. I think emotions are the best of women, mm -hmm. and I think that it's really important that we 
share those emotions in the right way, and, and that's what's driving us forward. Um, and so it's more about, you know, it's hard for us to come forward as individuals sometimes in these environments, but knowing that we have the support of one another, and if we can't advocate for ourselves, but we can advocate for each other, if you're gonna lift someone else up, then someone else is gonna lift you up. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, excellent. Well, thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you all. very much. I want to thank Deb, and I want to thank Rhonda so much for this opportunity. And we hope to see many of you on November 8th at the USGIF event. Uh, and we're going to stick around for a little while, so if you have any questions, please uh, feel free. and also thank each of you for participating. GDIT for your sponsorship, USGIF for your partnership. We're going to take a quick 10 minute break, regroup in here around 1.20 um, to talk a little bit about skiff life. And the most important announcement I can make right now is there are duplicate restrooms on the floor down. So get your steps in if there's a line at the restrooms, thanks. Everybody please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Welcome back. Everybody, please take your seats. The program is about to begin. Welcome back. So I'll mention this again, but at the end of the day, um, we will send out a survey via email, where we're going to look for your very candid feedback. And if I see nothing else, I would like high marks for my trying to keep the day on track. So sorry to interrupt the networking. But if I did one thing right, I'm trying to keep us on time. So I'm delighted to introduce our next session, which builds off of last year's new IC symp symposium, Get a Life, Work Life Blend in a Skiff. This was one of our more popular programs last year, and we formed a working group. It was so popular. Earlier this week, we released a position paper that is on your tables, I believe, and this offers six recommendations from improving the physical and cultural work environment for the cleared workforce. I really think this is so important for both recruitment and retention, something that we've talked a little bit about already today. Here to introduce our panel moderator is Shaw Alexander, IT and Digital Enablement Senior Manager at Lockheed Martin. Shaw, the stage is yours. Okay, how's everybody doing? Good, awesome. It's been amazing so far. Um, and kudos to all of the amazing speakers. I'm so inspired. Um, and I just really appreciate and thank you for that introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I have the distinct opportunity to spotlight this afternoon a panel of thought leaders who have the challenge of unpacking the salient issue facing government and industry alike. How do we reimagine skiff life? to retain uh, workforce levels while still attracting new talent. So I'm certain most of the folks in this room have uh, at some point of time gone into a skiff. So when you've done that, did you feel inspired? Did, did you feel <laughs> creative? So. Uh, did you feel like you were in the workforce, the workplace um, of the future, for the workforce of the future? And if not, how can we change this? Because we really do need to change this to attract the next generation of clear talent as we address the, the rapid acceleration of our technolo technological advances. So this is a complex problem. It can't be overstated. In fact, if you look at the, the paper from the Intelligence Champion Council that's on your table, the newly published white paper that we got emailed, and then you also have copies on your table, about reimagining skiff life, it says both government and industry employers 
we'll need to continuously address the quality of life challenges inherent to working in a SCIF. Attracting and retaining top talent in the cleared workforce will depend on innovative solutions consistent with our mission requirements to improve work life in a SCIF. So please take time to read through this white paper. It has some really good points on tactical things that we can do to attract and retain our next generation of talent. Now at Lock Lockheed Martin Space, we have a unique characteristic of having the highest percentage of cleared employees out of any other business area at Lockheed Martin. So needless to say, we're working to make SCIF life, well, irresistible. So, and uh, that is mission critical. So, absolutely. So with that in mind, I'm excited to introduce this afternoon's moderator, who's a perfect person to help navigate skip the skip life topic at hand. And her name is Lindy Kaiser. Lindy is the director of content and PR at clearancejobs.com. It's the largest career site for individuals with active federal security clearances. In this capacity, she helps government contractors connect to a robust talent pool of cleared candidates while publishing professional content to help advance cleared professionals. I particularly enjoyed her recent article that she wrote called 44 Fellowships that could help kickstart and advance a national security career. If you haven't had an opportunity to read it, it's an incredible resource. Just Google it and, and make sure that you pass it around because those fellowships are amazing. Prior to her current role, Lindy worked in the US Army Office of Chief of Public Affairs where she helped launch the US Army's first social media program. So not only is she a professional advisor, but she's also a compelling storyteller who understands the unique communication challenges that lie ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lindy Kaiser. That, that was amazing. I'm done. I'm done here. Thank you. I have to say that 44 Fellowships article I plagiarized and stole from a man, which is the perfect way to do <laughs> this <panel>. <laughs> <laughs> him. I put his name in there, but it actually was some content I stole, which shows Nora Ephron was right. Everything truly is copy, so you can take what you find and repurpose it and make it new. I love this topic, um, reinventing skiff life, because that's really what we're all about at Clearance Jobs, is making national security careers exciting and innovative and attractive, because um, the work that you do is incredibly important, but you don't have to be. You know, you don't have to... Um, take everything that you do quite as seriously as sometimes we do. So that's what we're all about over at Clearance Jobs. So thank you. I'm really excited to have these panelists here today. Ellen Ardry, who is Chief of Staff at DCSA. DCSA knows I'm a big fan of the work that they do. Mm -hmm. I'm conducting more than 95% of all background investigations. They have a critical mission to support national security for most of the folks that are in this room or a lot of folks across our national security workforce. They can't get to work without the work that's being done at DCSA. Mm -hmm. um, Christine Walter, who is Director of NSA Future Ready Workforce. NSA is really innovating mm -hmm. around this topic of reinventing skiff life mm -hmm. and involving their workforce. I think it's because so much of what you do is so cyber required. Mm -hmm. um, it is real skiff life, so I'm glad you're here to represent the windowless skiff facility. Thank you. Um, and talk you're about welcome. what that's like and how you're really attracting people. And then Mel Kepler, who is with Deloitte, she is really an innovative coach, trainer, and helping to make our national security more innovative and, again, exciting and reinvent the, the work that we're doing. Um, so I want to talk about kind of that topic of remote and hybrid work and tee it to you, Ellen. It's something we've talked about at Clearance Jobs. We are seeing an uptick. 4% of all the positions listed at Clearance Jobs right now are remote roles, mm -hmm. which I think is sometimes shocking. And 4% is not a lot, but when you consider it was 0.5% um, in 2021, and we're seeing an uptick. And you have really worked well in having this kind of blended workforce. I think DCSA, you have a disparate workforce regionally. You have folks in different places. And you've always had some background investigators who were true remote, remote? workers. Mm -hmm. So kind of talk about this misconception around what remote work looks like and how that can work in a cleared workforce like yours. Yeah, OK. Well, thank you, Lindy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Ellen Ardry, and I 
am actually um, an NGA employee, so I have almost 34 years of SCIF life under my belt before I went to DCSA and experienced what um, a more hybrid, a blended workforce could be all about. And uh, as uh, Lindy said, we have 168 locations around the United States. Um, we have almost 3,000 uh, employees who do not work in our major headquarters areas. Um, our background investigators, their homes are their place of, of work, right? Their billet is assigned to their home address because they're working from their living room or their you know, study when they're not out doing interviews. And so um, we already had a really great foundation for what uh, a, a culture would look like if you were not coming into a building with your supervisor and your coworkers every day. And so then, of course, COVID hit, and um, the world stopped turning, right? And we were all forced to kind of change the way that we um, we worked. We moved to technologies. We moved to processes. It, frankly, it was a fantastic accelerator, right, to where this panel uh, wants us to go. So um, when it was time to then start coming back into the office for portions of our, our workforce. We have a, a portion that is in the SCIF. It's a counterintelligence component. Um, and we have other elements that have aspects of their job that require them to be in a classified environment. Um, I undertook uh, an, a study on hybrid workforce and a methodology that a manager could use to kind of assess not the person, but rather the position and whether it might be a good candidate for hybrid work, right? So we had a similar one for remote work, and I'll make the distinction in case you don't know. So remote is there is no reason for you to come into the office on a daily basis or on a regular basis. You might get called in you know, once a year for you know, uh, some kind of a, a team meeting or something like that, but basically you're working from your home. Hybrid, you come in a little, you, you're working from home a little. And our um, telework policy says that two days of a work period, you're in the office, but the other eight, you can be teleworking. That has actually worked out very, very well. But we're, um, we see people um, having, adapt, I guess, adapted to their own life is I think um, the culture that a work day is non-severable, right? Mm. So if you're gonna come into a skiff, you come in for your eight and a half hours, and then you go home, and if you're gonna telework, you telework for your eight and a half hours, and then you log off. What we're seeing and experiencing at DCSA is that individuals log on at six, they check some emails, they log off, Maybe they make breakfast, get the kids to school, take dad to the senior center, whatever it would be. They get in the car, they drive to DCSA, they log on, they do the part of their job that they need to be in a team environment or there's a classified environment. They log off, they go home, they do what they have to do in the afternoon, and then they complete their day at home. And so I guess the thing that we've found that um, I think is really innovative is that the maxi flex flexibilities that already exist, if you actually embrace those, they do not, oh, I got a, sorry, I can, <laughs> got a little excitement over here. But, um, you know, I think it's a culture and yeah. um, getting managers comfortable. You're still getting your work done, but you're breaking your day up because of the flexibilities that people you know, got to experience um, during COVID. And that toothpaste, guys, a lot of it's not going back in the tube, right? Um, so how do you embrace that? And what we found is that flexibility, both uh, more jobs remote, for instance, our contracting officers that aren't doing classified work, there's no reason for them to be in the office. They're as productive or more at their homes. So when we did that, what we experienced is um, a low density, high demand 
skill set that we never got above about 62% manning, we put out remote work and we went to 100% with one job announcement. And we have contracting officers that live in Fairbank, Fairbanks, Alaska. We have them in um, Arizona. We have them in Texas. We have them, I mean, you get my point, right? And we're killing it. They're doing a fantastic job because managers have um, embraced how to manage a remote workforce. And um, we similarly have managers who have embraced the maxi flex where, you know, it's not, you have to be in the office for eight straight or eight and a half straight hours, but rather you can break your day up, you know what you need to get done. We're checking to make sure, of course, that you're giving us the eight and a half hours that you know uh, we're supposed to, or there are occasions when you have a 10 hour day and then the next day it's not as many hours. But that really is about training supervisors and managers and a workforce culture to embrace that. So thank, thank you. you. And reminder, send your comment cards. If you have a question, write it on the comment card. We'll be taking those. So we'd love to take as many questions that you have. So write those comment cards, wave them in the air, and we will take them. So Christine, I <laughs> want to talk to you about this critical topic of on and off ramping within the IC. I've been around for maybe 15 years. We've been talking about it the entire time. Yes. <laughs> um, I feel like maybe we figured it out. I know you have some studies around this. So talk about how NSA is addressing this fact sure. that the IC typically will say that they don't have a problem with attracting candidates. We can debate that, but they absolutely will admit that they have a problem with retaining them. Yeah. And some of those on and off ramps, I know your alumni programs, like yep. what are you doing to retain that workforce? Yep, sure. So that's a great question. I think, you know, sometimes we joke that we have survivor bias. Like we only get the people who made it through that really painful clearance process. So, mm -hmm. so should we reconsider, you know, addressing why some people didn't make it through? Is it because there's no hybrid options? Is it because they don't think they have the flexibility. And so we're looking at how to make that easier. At NSA, we're hiring thousands of people over the next couple years. We have 3,000 person hiring programs per year. So huge growth because that big red blob that we didn't think we had to think about for a really long time, it's here and it's leaving. And so we have over 50% of our workforce is retirement eligible. Mm -hmm. So in the next five years, we will have 20% of our workforce who will be under five years. So very junior workforce. So what does it look like to be losing that institutional knowledge? And how do we onboard people so that they understand what they are becoming a part of? And I think a lot of people can relate. When you're in a classified environment, you don't get a whole lot of information in your job interview. It's very <laughs> leap of faith. Um, it's classified, it's cool, come and work with us is kind of what you get. And people are willing to then wait, you know, 180, 210, sometimes more days to come in. And so how do we make that easier? So we've revamped onboarding entirely at the National Security Agency to say, hey, this is what you became a part of. We paid a lot of money to get you cleared. Instead of telling you for five days what you can't do, what will get you in trouble, and what is compliance and required now, <laughs> let's also tell you about the cool mission. You're part of national security. We are a big producer of intelligence for the presidential daily brief. Here's what we do. Here's how we supported Ukraine when Russia invaded. We're trying to talk to people about that, but also one of the big initiatives is people are not going to stay in their careers for 30 to 40 years anymore. We recognize that. If you are out of NSA for two years and you want to come back, you start completely over. You started as if you never worked there. So that's why we established the alumni program. We had our inaugural event uh, on Saturday at the new Morrison Center on our East Campus. And I'll tell you, this was an adjustment. We had a lot of retirees show up who we love. But we also wanted people who are still in the workforce. But typically, our culture was, if you left, we kind of wrote you off and didn't really stay in touch. And so this is a way to stay connected. It's a way to fast track you back in. It's a way to use our alumni as adjunct faculty, knowledge sharing, mm -hmm. host our interns out. If you're at Microsoft or Google or wherever you are, host NSAers out there. And can we bring our alumni back for details? Mm -hmm. So we're working through all of those processes to make it a more fluid environment, because we recognize that's a demand moving forward. And so now to you, Mel, I want to mention this lovely white paper, which is all of your table. So it's reimagining skiff life. So you can read more about what we're talking about. So Mel, you are a part of the Intelligence Champions Council here at INSA. Um, talk a little bit about some of the content from this white paper. Like what, were, what are you thinking about when it comes to how to reinvent skiff life? What are some of the ideas on the table for making this work more exciting? 
Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, this paper came out of this panel, uh, Reimagining Skiff Life, last year. Um, the discussion from the group here was so good that uh, INSA, uh, uh, as they said, said, well, let's, let's keep exploring this. And one of the things that really rapidly came out of that discussion was a pivot from uh, the phrasing of the original topic made people think it's going to be like, okay, tips and tricks to survive in the skiff. <laughs> like, figure out where the, the fridge is because you're going to want to bring a lunch because you may not be able to get out. Uh, <laughs> so it'll be cafeteria or whatever you bring because you won't be able to leave for lunch. Or like, uh, bring cash to the CIA because you can't use your credit card. Or like, And we really rapidly, that's actual true, by the way, if you've been <laughs> yeah. to CIA, yeah. they do not accept credit cards, bring mm. cash. Um, but it really rapidly shifted away from the skiff is this big, unchangeable thing that exists and you need to adjust to it to, no, 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 wait. Um, and I love that our introducer said the word tactical. Tactical tips, things you can actually do. And not, uh, I, uh, one of the things I loved about as we started writing this was the shift from, you're in the skiff, adjust, figure it out, here are some tips, to what if we changed the whole parameter of the situation? What could actually happen to make this less of a burden on the individual and more of a burden on the large, giant agency that runs it? Um, and that's one of the things I loved about what you said, Ellen, too, is you talked about telework, you talked about Maxiflex, and you said if we actually implement, really implement Maxiflex that we already have, a lot of things are possible. A lot of this... These are tactical, practical tips because a lot of them don't require new things to exist. We have Maxiflex policies. Can you use them? Are, are the supervisors comfortable with it? Mm -hmm. And also, what if they weren't? What if they had to do it even though they weren't comfortable with it and everyone still lived and it was fine? What if we just, what if that, what if that happened? So this idea of we've been admiring this problem for so long, um, I can only hear that in Beth Flanagan's voice. We've been admiring <laughs> the problem for so yeah. long. What if we stopped and actually did just anything? Just yeah. tried some things and see, saw if they worked. So I, I want to give a huge shout out to all the co-authors on here. Uh, as you look at the INSA members who wrote this, there's one person whose name doesn't have an agency behind it. That was our govy. <laughs> so big props to Vanessa Alexander, who's not here today for speaking for the entire federal workforce as we tried to put this paper together. <laughs> Many of us are former govies or, you know, we work with co contracting agencies in government facilities, but, you know, she's the blue badge. Um, the goal was to try to pull things that we felt like were implementable and address the blocks to implementing the stuff we already know about, which is why culture was one of our major topics. It isn't about making a new process. It's about, remember when we did that study and we found that when people did that, they were just as productive as when they did it in the SCIF? What if we did something with that? What if that was our policy now when we changed that and we actually, like, I understand, Jim, that you're not comfortable with that, but what if that doesn't matter and we're doing it anyway? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I'd love to address some myths and misconceptions, because I do think this mm. notion of SCIF life, Yeah. Uh, I mean, are, do any, like, NSA. I mean, NSA <laughs> I'm in there all day. They got a lot of wor skiff work, but the average national security worker is able to do a lot of work mm -hmm. outside the skiff, and that's what we've seen post-pandemic. So it's like sure. one of the biggest misconceptions I hear young people say is like, I could not sit in a windowless room for eight hours without any connection to my cell phone. Well, a decent workplace has either a, you know you can you can actually go to lunch there. Like there's there's abilities to get out, and also the percentage of the workforce that is in the windowless office is a smaller percentage. But mm -hmm. are there other misconceptions? Like <laughs> I, no one will be able to contact me. I will you know never see light again. There are no windows. <laughs> what are some of the big misconceptions you come across when it comes to thinking about skiff? I think DCSA has a lot of those. Like a lot of things in their workforce that are unexpected people might not realize. Um, well, I think, um, you know, the, uh, I'll be completely disconnected, right? Nobody will be able to find me. Um, what do I do when the daycare, you know, has to get hold of me or my husband or wife has to tell me, you know, soccer practice has changed. But, you know, that's not true. Um, there are technologies that would allow you um, on the young class, right, to, um, I think many of the policies at, um, agencies allow you to check for small periods of time your personal emails mm -hmm. um, 
it or your you know Facebook page or whatever uh, reasonably so you are connected electronically you have a phone phones work in the skiff uh, it's kind of old fashion but uh, folks are absolutely able to be um, connected you know there were some technologies that would even um, we still working through the cyber component of that cyber security that would cast your cell phone onto your desktop and allow you essentially to be connected. Um, there are some challenges with that, um, and we can talk about that offline, but that time is coming. And if not, you know, many, many locations have um, courtyards or areas where you can go get your cell phone and, and be connected during the day. So I think this idea that I'm completely cut off is, I mean, it may not be instantaneous, but it is entirely manageable. Can, can I add, we have a really robust high school work study program at NSA, and so we just got a bunch, a big batch of high school work studies, high school students who come in and work, and we had to teach one how to use a landline because he had oh, never seen Oh my before. gosh, I had to teach but, an intern how to send a fax. But you can connect with it. But I will say, you know, because our, you know, I think the windowless skiff is kind of a myth. You know, our entire buildings are skiffs, and so they function just like regular buildings, but you don't have your phone. But I will Who else here was at 213? 213 alums, sorry, we actually, we had windows on the sixth floor. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. we have some. But I, I came from the Cybersecurity Collaboration Center, so when we talk about changes to NSA, that's where I was speaking to a lot of you last time. So we opened a facility outside the fence line. It's 75% unclassified. We recognized that if we wanted to talk to industry, we had to be where industry was. And so this was one of those areas where COVID really did accelerate for us. Mm -hmm. We hadn't envisioned operating on the low side and talking to partners. We built out a whole low side environment in about six months so that we could be engaging with industry. So I could bop in and out of the skiff to a team's call with Lockheed Martin back into the skiff all day and night. And then I moved over back to the big campus. And we had exactly one conference room where I could do a video call that was unclassified. And so in the last six months, we have massively transformed that. So we've been mm -hmm. opening community flex spaces all over campus uh, where we have unclassified space where you can go in and do your unclassified calls. You can do a quick doctor's appointment. You can connect with your child's school. We have phone booths that are available. I saw that in the paper where you mm -hmm. can just do a personal call where you don't want to call from your office. Yes. So we're expanding all of those both from a unclassified perspective but also looking at how we can hotel. How can we leverage the entire community to give our folks some flexibility? So. We have many folks that live in D.C. We can do a lot of analysis on where people live. There's many skiffs in D.C., I'm sure you all know. Yeah. How do we enter into agreements with folks so that our folks don't have to drive up every day right. of the week and they can spend one week at the D.C. office and then come yeah. up full time? So it is getting a lot more flexible and we're expanding some of those options. Could I riff on that for just a second? Do it. So I love that NSA would do that, but why, why would an individual agency have to do that? Why could the IC not build collaboration centers mm -hmm. an in intelligence large... community campus ah oh, say it's crazy right wild but in metropolitan areas mm -hmm. where the shared cost common infrastructure that if they were all on the same um, IT anyone could log on and and even if you had to go into a skiff it's a skiff five minutes from your house mm -hmm. not 50 miles from mm -hmm. your house Absolutely. Did you know in that in the 1980s, the average person in the D.C. area spent about 20 hours a year stuck in traffic, and now you, they spend about 80 hours a year stuck in traffic? Mm -hmm. That's just here at the Beltway area, right? 80 hours, that's two freaking weeks, two weeks of work in traffic. What if the skiff was closer? What if it was a different skiff? Yeah. I love that. That requires a lot of security officers to say yes, and that's not usually <laughs> yeah. the default yes. posture so of here's security my, officer. So I think it's like changing the culture around, yep. is this possible, not could I potentially find a policy that says I can't do this, mm -hmm. trying to find a policy so, that says yes, that I can't. Because I, I toured like the Nook's office yesterday, which was super interesting. I was like, yeah. hey, I'm on a panel about skiff life. Let's, like, and the WeWork skiff solution is like super interesting to me, but I think it comes down to like, would your agency or organization allow you to work in a shared skiff facility? Mm -hmm. it's gonna it, there's there's a cultural barrier there and here's my I know you're asking for misconceptions from people but I'm gonna reverse it the misconception that seems to be pervasive is that the way things are is some sort of fact of nature like gravity um, that we, we can't do anything about it right like these things have been around so long that we can't change them and that is crap that is utterly crap look at look at Ellen look at DCSA 
If it, was, if it was a fact that was the way it had to be, she would not be up here. She would not be able to do the things she's doing. Look at what we did during COVID. Mm -hmm. Six months, in six months, they built a completely new capability. Don't tell me you can't do it. That's crap. Yeah. That's absolute crap. So the question becomes, why aren't you? I missed this morning's kickoffs, but um, my table mates were telling me about Carmen Medina, so I, I don't even know where I'm looking yeah. here, um, but uh, who said, um, we need to, we know we can do it. It needs to be a, cri we need to hit a crisis point. And honestly, I don't know how we haven't yet. Here's the secret we have. We've absolutely, we're past the point where this is mission critical. So what would happen if people started saying yes to things? If people started saying, let's try it. If it doesn't work, we can always go back. Let's try it and see where we end up. So I have a question that's near and dear to my heart for you, because Christina, mm -hmm. Christine, talking about the NSA pilot program to have people do unclassified work. Mm -hmm. as they, I would love to see this across yes. government. Can you talk about your program? Yes, so one of the big complaints we get is how long it takes to be cleared. And so we launched this pilot program so that you could actually work while you're being cleared. I'll tell you, here's the cultural barrier for NSA, is that we don't have a significant amount of critical mass of people doing unclassified work on the low side. So when we had applicants doing it, we had to hire somebody to do the care and feeding of those applicants. So we're taking that from a two-sided approach is first, we, with COVID, moved a lot of functions that had to be done low side, low side. And now, with things going back, slowly moving them back. And so we decided to look at what are those functions that are primarily unclassified that we can do more effectively if we do them on the low side? Contracting, training, software development, where you do 75% of Absolutely. it. Recruitment, applicants are generally not in skips. Cybersecurity analysis, research. And we're pushing our own workforce down to the low side so that then those applicants can come in and work there. So we've had applicants come in and they're working on unclassified problems, they're getting paid while they go through the clearance process to try to expedite that. So we're looking forward to expanding that pilot as we get more critical mass down on the low side of people who work at the agency full time. That's and lovely. So um, the way that we attacked that at DCSA when we were doing the hybrid and we were looking at candidates, we were um, talking to the people doing the job and it was amazing how many people did something on the low side, had to port it up to the <laughs> high side because that's where the business systems were, do whatever they did up there, only to have to port it down again and pass it off. I mean, how silly is that? Mm -hmm. And so those became fabulous candidates. And I know um, other places that I've worked, a lot of the business functions for convenience yep. are on the high side. Not because they needed to be, but rather for convenience. And you were and operating a single. Whose convenience? For whose convenience? A piece, Sorry. right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I mean, and there's an expense to maintain yeah. oh, too. Oh, for sure. But you know what we found is, you know, COVID proved that we could move. Mm -hmm. And once we moved it, why would we move it back? Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was a real a cost benefit. to moving it back too. Mm -hmm. True. But that's what we did. We said, what are those functions where you're passing things from low side to high side? And li are all of our applicants, they send in their resumes, they go up to the classified system, then we yes. reflect them back down on the unclassified system and so that our applicants are sending them in. They're, them. they're explicitly <laughs> unclassified. They well, cannot be classified yes. because they are being sent in from the outside. Right. And so, how do we, we save the system burden too? So, there is a cost to the technology, mm -hmm. but there's also a cost that you're saving when you're not moving files back and forth and back and exactly. forth because you can do it more effectively and those are where we're trying to focus. I mean, there's a cost to turnover and there's a cost to investigating someone for a clearance and then not giving them the clearance because they got a different job while they were waiting for you to get their clearance mm -hmm. through. So we only look at the costs we spend, not the costs that we lose. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and then there, a question came in that it's de definitely ties to that. Talk about like during COVID, we saw a ton of the high side functions did move to the low side. But now there is, right now it seems to be we're in this kind of shifting moment where a lot of folks are trying to go back th to the default. Mm -hmm. So is there any, it sounds like your NSA program is, is a direct example of a muscle movement to combat that. that. Are there other muscle movements or cultural shifts that need to happen to say, hey, there are probably other areas yeah. where we responded to COVID that we could maintain this and not revert back to the old way of doing things? I think the cultural shift is a huge part. So, and especially you see now companies are bringing people back. We get, I get leadership tell me that a lot. Why are you pushing telework, Christine? Everybody else is coming back. I'm like, they're going from like 100% to 75. We're at 4%. <laughs> so I think we've got some room to grow in our telework functions. And so, you know, as a manager coming from the collaboration center, it is harder to manage a hybrid workforce. I think we do need to acknowledge, I do have to communicate 
on different channels. I do have to explain that, but it's worth it if you can do something more effectively. So that mission outcome is something that NSA has near and dear to their heart. So when we can pitch it as you can do this better, faster, more resiliently, low side, those are the functions we focus on. I want to highlight that too. You're, it's, it's harder to manage a hybrid workforce. And I liked the distinction you made earlier, Ellen, between hybrid and virtual, but for this sense, I want you to think of the manager. You're managing a hybrid workforce if any of your employees are in office or hybrid and any of your employees are remote. Once you have employees in different places on different days, you are managing a hybrid workforce. And facilitators, as facilitators, we say hybrid is hardest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's easier to have everyone in the room or everyone virtual. Once you get that mix, it's very, very hard to balance things. It's hard. It's mm -hmm. hard for managers. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Correct. So respect to the difficulty, and managers should be asking for more training and more support and more tech to help them do this thing that they need to do, not, not doing it with scraps and whatever's left over. Um, because essentially, it is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that ties in the question here. So somebody asked about how do we make this easier to manage this hybrid workforce? We know that this is a challenge. Um, there are benefits to being in person and in the same space. Mm -hmm. Are there tactical examples of ways, technologies, Slack, no, Zoom? No, we no, like, what are, we what are have these answers. There have always been NSAers in Denver. Mm -hmm. There have always been NSAers in Denver and in Fort Meade. If you are, has, it, has there ever been a manager who managed people at Denver and Fort Meade? How did they handle it? At NGA, there have always been people in St. Louis. How do you manage it when part of your workforce is in St. Louis or when you manage an NST and part of your workforce is at another location and you have people in Springfield? We've been doing this. We, it, it's, it's just that sometimes the person who isn't in your office is now in their house. That's not mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so there is a question here that I, it, it's kind of near and dear to my heart because I did read the white paper and it talked about the bonus or more money for folks working in a SCIF. As someone who has studied like, kind of the gender pay gap issues, I read that and I instantly see we already have a problem across the national security workforce mm -hmm. with women and minorities typically getting paid less. You start incentivizing SCIF work, which tends to lean more. It's a male-dominated field it, it across a lot of the folks that are working and have to be in a SCIF. So we can incentivize that with money, but then we actually make another problem that we, we've identified worse. Do you have any? Thoughts on that? Well, I think I'd add on that. I think the flexibility needs are stronger of the female demographic, just trying to balance some of the responsibilities that typically fall to a female. And so we've had that problem where culturally, okay, I'm taking advantage of flexibilities. To your point, there are flexibilities. If I take advantage of them, I'm kind of being disincentivized. I'm not there in the office when a project comes up and my boss walks out and says, you, you're going to do it. And so that is the intentional aspect of it, is we have to be very intentional about the functions that our people are doing at home. And so that's where we are really trying to move full functions, because yes. it'll give people greater flexibility. We found the organizations that are most responsive during COVID had defined work as classified on-site, classified off-site, unclassified on-site, or unclassified off-site. When you characterize work like that and you give those opportunities to everybody, I can decide at what point in my career I might want to take that assignment, and then all of my peers are there with me. And so it creates a little bit of the less of the haves and have-nots when you bring the whole function in. So all of our recruiters are low side. All of our cybersecurity analysts are on the low side and outside the system, so that you have that equal and fairness of it, and people can choose for themselves when, when it makes sense to take one of those opportunities. Would we specifically, thoughtfully divide work that must be done in a SCIF from work that has been done in a SCIF because no one ever got around to separating it out? Then we can offer a pay bump for people who have to be in a SCIF because their work requires it. Because they won't be getting a pay bump for this me being able to do the exact same thing at home. The gender pay gap, which by the way is also incredibly racially nuanced as well. We should not be talking about the gender pay gap without talking about the racial components of that. Just wanted to throw that out there. Um, the problem with the gender pay gap is that people are getting paid different amounts for the same work and we can't find any explanation that isn't based on gender. If People are getting paid more for doing skiff work that was required to be in a skiff, and all skiff work was only skiff work, and the work that didn't require skiff was allowed to be done outside the skiff, then the pay bump is not unfair. It is an extra pay for an extra burden that you are taking on of having to work in a specific place at specific times. Yeah, we've had a few culture change questions. So what can we do about the my manager problem? Mm -hmm. Like they're like so leaders seem like they're all on board for this, but my immediate manager is not. I'm with clearance jobs, so I'm like, go find a new job on clearance jobs. I got you. <laughs> but I'm curious yeah. from the panel if there are other ideas other than the many comments about this sounds great, but my manager 
is not on board with these flexibilities? I think for me, leadership is one of our main lines of effort in our future ready workforce because we recognize in order to do any of these things, in order to onboard employees, in order to manage a hybrid workforce, in order to have flexibilities, you need leaders who are bought in and understand that. And so I think equipping your manager, if you are in a situation where you want to effectively hybrid work and they're struggling with that, Equipping them with the data on how they can measure performance. As an employee, it can be your responsibility to say, here's how I'm going to track what I'm doing. Here's mm -hmm. how I'm going to keep you informed. Here's how I'm going to come into meetings. You have your staff meeting on Monday. I'll come in, in the office on Monday. So I think it's up to you to really negotiate that with your manager to explain how you're going to be a more effective employee. Because that's what they're worried about. Am I going to look bad to my boss because I can't account for my team? Accountability is very important. So you coming together with them to help devise ways to be accountable, giving them resources to understand, and modeling it for them, it's helping us through it together. I had never managed a hybrid workforce during COVID, and my team was like, hey, this works really well for me. Can you do staff meetings on a different day? Can you do this? And you could be adaptable if you help work through it together and not just take no for an answer when they first are maybe hesitant towards it. Yeah, I would agree. And many of our managers are those same people in a hybrid situation, right? Um, it's about them taking advantage of it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I'd say two parts to that. One is peer pressure. <laughs> there is a manager at your manager's level who is doing telework, who is working extra, pushing harder, trying these things, putting themselves in an uncomfortable position where they have to learn some things so that their employees can take advantage of these flexibilities. Find that manager and see if they can help pressure your manager. They can talk. We can talk about that person as a success story, as a hero, et cetera. And that puts the pressure on your manager to get with the program. The other thing is that I love this too. The leaders are all for it, but my manager has a problem. I remember saying um, to senior leadership at NGA when I was a Govy, uh, ma'am, uh, Sue, I feel like you and I are on the same page about what you want to do, and in between you and me are 14 people, at least eight of whom are terrified to try something. So what pressure can the leadership put down? I do, again, DCSA has these policies in place in part because people weren't comfortable with it. Yeah. Did you let them go, oh, well, you're not comfortable. Okay, so you keep doing things the old way. No. Ellen said you have to do it. Yeah. Ellen's your boss and you're scared of her yeah. and she's saying this is the policy and we're going to roll out and we're going to do it and you're going to get comfortable. So you know. what pressure can the seniors, what pressure can our leadership put on those people who are like, well, you know, I read the paper, but I'm just not sure that I agree. You know, I, I um, was telling Mel before we, we <laughs> came up on the stage that there's a, a psychological component yes. of this, which is very often when you're trying to sell a new idea, you, you tried the decision maker, you, um, you overwhelm them with all of the goodness that will accrue. See, if we do this, this will be so much better, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is, unless they think something's really broken, there's not a whole mm -hmm. lot of incentive to improve yeah. what you already think is pretty good. However, if you turn it and you say, listen, guys, we have to do this. Because if we don't, here are the negative consequences that will accrue. And in this case, retention, hiring, mm -hmm. stagnation, loss of you know, a diversity component or you know, that mid-career. If you can couch it in that regard, it's psychologically, it is much more compelling. Steve Jobs said, people don't innovate because the new thing is better. They innovate because the old thing is becoming obsolete. That's so, so much more eloquent than what Well, he's Steve Jobs, right? He had a lot of money to think of these things. I know we're heading so towards the end, but I want to kind of close by talking about the benefits of Skiff Life and why we choose this. We've, we're all on this stage. We have different opportunities or different options. I think if you're in this room, you love supporting national security, and you should feel empowered and passionate about doing that. Um, I, I became fully remote and left left the cleared world behind 12 years ago to write, write news in my bedroom because I did not want to go to the Pentagon anymore um, every day. But now I wish I could go to the Pentagon uh, at least a couple days so that no one screamed at me through my door that I need to wipe their bottom or something. So I feel like there's benefits. <laughs> Things like come and, come and go and ebb and flow. And I love like how do we make these careers attractive at different seasons? Like not everybody is going to want to work in a skiff and work the long hours for 10 years at a time. 
but there are benefits to this work, and there's mm. and it's it's worth sticking in it and stick with it, sticking with it for a long time. So you, you know that like the old stereotype of uh, the 1950s, he goes guy who goes off to work and he puts on his fancy hat and he takes the train to work and he works his eight hours and then he puts his hat on and he takes his train home and no one calls him or makes him do anything at home and he's <laughs> done with work. That still exists that and it's the I ski. That's, the, that's a skiff. If you work in a skiff, it is literally illegal for them to make you take work home. It's the only place where that, that lifestyle still exists. Mm -hmm. So if that's something that appeals to you, the skiff life is great. You're, you're safe in that mountain. I actually agree. I, I used to say, you know, telework's not all it's cracked up to be. I would work all day, eight hours in a skiff in the collaboration center, and during bath time with my kids, I would be answering all of my industry partner emails. Telework requires a lot from our boundaries. And so I think there's that, but also the things that you can do in a skiff, especially at NSA, are things that you can never do anywhere else. I mean, you can do things that you never thought possible. You can work offensive cyber, you can work defensive cyber. You can just accomplish things that are important and are meaningful. And we talk about the next generation and what they're looking for. They wanna be part of something bigger than themselves. We all wanna be part of something bigger than, than ourselves. And so when we come in and we tell them that you can work on some of the hardest problems that our nation has and protect the citizens of the United States and your peers and your family, that's something that maybe requires the clearance and the skiff but it's worth it when you're able to have outcomes that you can talk about and see in your day to day. Yeah, and we did get another question. Are there, are there groups that are thinking about these questions and how to address topics like classification and overclassification and policy? INSA has those groups. So your Security Policy Reform Council, the Intelligence Champions Council, there are groups that are dedicated to talking about these issues and how to make it better. So I, I, I love all of your cards. I will treat them all, all, all well and appreciate every <laughs> conversations and dialogues around this topic because it is so important. So thank you to all of our panelists for their time um, and thank you for your engagement. I think this is, again, this is important work that you do um, and we appreciate you and so we appreciate INSA as always for being a part of this and for leading these conversations because we can do better and we are doing better and things are way better than they used to be. Mm -hmm. well, that makes me feel optimistic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lindy, Ellen, Christina, and Mel. Um, clearly, there's some real passion around this topic. Um, it's very evident from um, our speakers we have here at the state. So um, next up, um, to introduce um, our next session is um, Melissa Stavaletti from Guidehouse. Um, she is the Director of Defense and Security. And we're gonna do something a little bit different with this next session. It is going to be hybrid. We've talked a lot about hybrid, but not the hybrid you're thinking. There are gonna be a couple of a night rounds as well as a round table. So bear with us for just a moment while we change up the deck chairs, but we're not freaking yet. We're gonna go straight in to the next session. We're getting some folks mic'd up. Thank you. Hi everyone, if you could start finding your way back to your seats, we're gonna be getting started in just a second. All good, everybody mic'd up? Okay, awesome. Okay, got it. So I think we're going to be standing. At, yeah. So when, when people are getting there during the lightning class, we can be stepping out there. Yeah. I think they have eight seats. Are there eight seats? Yeah. Oh. So I think you're good. Yeah. I think okay. you're good. I didn't know they Yeah, they added. They added. They, okay. So we can both. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's eight I sometimes can count not all the time. I usually can. So. Yeah. Okay. Are we good? Okay, everyone. We are going to move right along into our next session. So if I could get everybody to come back to their seats. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So my name is Melissa Stivaletti, and I am a new director for open source intelligence at Guidehouse. And I'm here with some amazing women from my new Guidehouse family. And I have to say that all of us are just so excited about this next um, panel, roundtable, lightning round. There's a lot going on in this next session. 
And, and um, we are really excited, especially about just the public dialogue of the ideas that are going to be um, talked about today. Is that's that's what's bringing us all forward, right? Is having this dialogue. And so um, I'm pleased to announce the and introduce you to the moderators today. We have um, Dr. Shadi right here, Abu. And he is a professor, assistant professor at Georgetown and has a book forthcoming. So everybody write it down because it's going to be awesome. It's, it's a reclaiming our humanity in the workplace. So look out for that. And um, then I'd also like to introduce um, Jarena. And... Thomas, and she is the director for mentor and professional advancement for girl security. And if you're not familiar with girl security, go look it up because it is just such an incredible organization. She comes there with a long career at FBI as an intelligence analyst and is also a faculty member um, at Georgetown. And so I'm just delighted to have both of you here today and come on up to the stage. Well, uh, join me in welcoming them. Good afternoon, everyone. Good Happy to be here. Uh, as Melissa mentioned, my name is Jarena Thomas. And we have a wonderful panel here to talk a little bit about some different ideas about the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And before I open it up, I just have a couple of comments. Shadi has a couple of comments, and then we're going to open it up for our first Ignite speaker, who is Erica Chandler Dyer. So I just want to give a couple of definitions. We've talked a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We, we throw the terms around, but I think that it's important for us to define what we're talking about. So I was just jotting down uh, my ideas about what they were. So let me just share those with you really quickly. So diverse, diverse is, in my mind, a state of being composed of a range of people with distinct differences that have a meaningful influence on an organization's operations and culture. And I think it's important to note that individual people are not diverse. I am not diverse. Organizations, groups, um, teams are diverse. They're characterized by differences. But an individual cannot be diverse. An individual is not exotic, because when you do that, you other them. Do you all understand what I mean? So I just want us to keep that piece in mind as we, as we listen to our, our speakers today. Inclusive. Inclusive is a state of being structured to allow for all stakeholders to participate fully. Inclusive is not tolerant. Inclusive is not just letting people slide in and giving them a seat at the back wall. Inclusive is allowing people to participate and to participate fully and meaningfully in whatever is, is going on. And then accessible. Accessible is a state of being structured without unnecessary and unreasonable obstacles and being able to incorporate modifications as needed. So I thought it would be good to baseline what we're talking about because I think that in the conversations that I've had about this, that people see, hear the words, but they have very different understandings of what they mean. So I wanted to baseline what we're going to be talking about today. And since the last thing I'll say before I pass it over to Shadi is that uh, the impetus for this session is that, yes, the idea of diversity in the intelligence community is very important. Um, but does it mean that we are performing? Does it mean that we're working toward um, shallow standards and quotas? Is it diversity theater? We've all heard of security theater. We've heard of political theater. Or have we been doing diversity theater? And we want to posit that we want to get past that performative diversity and, and think about it in a real and meaningful way. So those are just a few comments that I wanted to share with you uh, before we open it up. So Shadi, I'll pass it to you for any opening comments, and then the stage will be yours, Erica. Thank you. I mean, coming here, it was uh, interesting for me to understand a little bit about DEI because I've been hearing DEI a lot about with organizations that I work with and I consult with. And I can tell you that the word on the street, there is fatigue from the word itself. 
My wife works in the pharma industry, and for her, DI is every month she needs to go through certain questions, answer them properly, and then tick in the box, and then follow that her employees are doing exactly the same. But again, this is what's happening, unfortunately, with a lot of approaches we have in management and performance in itself. What we do is we create certain performance indicators just for us to say tick in the box. So if a lawyer comes in or a manager comes in, we show them, yes, we did the task. But there is no work or no measurement onto the outcome of it, the so what from it. And this is the beauty of what we need to do, what we need to discuss now, is that we want diversity not because we want to achieve certain indicators, but because we want to achieve a different behavior. So this is why we're hoping today we're going to discuss a little bit about how we can bring diversity to life in our processes, in our decision-making processes, and also in our culture. So hopefully we'll discuss what good looks like today, and I'm looking forward to having the discussions with the different esteemed members. Thank you again for your time. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me well? Good? All right. So um, again, good afternoon. And I hope you all have had the chance to take away some valuable insights from the conversations that we've had here today. I know that I have. And as I've been listening, I've been incorporating everything that people have been saying. And I've been making notes and sort of tweaked what I had planned to say today. So I must admit, when the invitation was extended to me to come here and talk today, I immediately accepted. I said, oh, I, I'd love to do it. I'm so grateful that I had been considered. But as the days went by and I began to flesh out what I wanted to talk about, I grew hesitant. I didn't know if what I wanted to say would be the correct thing to say or would it be received well by the audience. However, with my hesitancy, I think that is all the more reason for us to have these sort of conversations. So. Growing up, my background, I, I come from a military household. And I'm not going to say that my growing up was strict, but I will say that my parents did a very good job at drilling and instilling in me that if you want something in life, you've got to work hard for it. No one's going to give you a handout. So that's always been my mindset when it comes to diversity. And if you had the chance to listen to what our keynote speaker said this morning about not necessarily wanting to be the person who has to talk about it. Yes, I recognize that I am black and that I am a woman, but it is not the job of a person of color to talk about diversity. Mm. So I decided to you know, get a little uncomfortable, decide to say yes and do it anyways. And my, I guess you could call it uncontroversial. It really shouldn't be a controversy. But my mindset has always been, do not hire me because I'm black and I'm a woman. Hire me because I'm qualified to do the job. Hire me based on my merits. <laughs> Hire me because you know that I will bring value to your organization. And that's something that I wanted to talk about. Because in recent years, with this hyper-polarized political environment that we've been in, you can use whatever social justice initiative that you'd like. It could be Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. We talked a little bit about it this morning. We've seen this boost of and, and call to action for the word diversity. But again, what is diversity? Diversity could be race, diversity of gender, diversity of thought, diversity of practice, so on and so forth. And as for me and my experiences, it's usually somebody referring to my race and my gender. Unfortunately, I have had negative experiences in academia where I have had people assume that I am only where I am today because of diversity <coughs> initiatives, that I was somebody brought on by affirmative action, something along those lines when that necessarily isn't my case. I am here because I have earned the opportunity and I work just as hard as everybody else. And if you take away anything from what I've said, and I've intended to be brief, is that I want you to challenge your assumptions. In a room full of intelligence professionals and aspiring intelligence professionals, if you're aware of ICD-203, you will know that one of our objectives is to challenge all assumptions. Think about everything really, really good before you reach judgment. And that's what I would like you all to do whenever considering the topic of diversity. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joe Garbato. I'm with the FBI. That hopefully doesn't get anybody too upset. <laughs> I'm used to that, though. But in actuality, I work at the Marine Corps University. I'm the FBI chair at the Marine Corps University, which means I spend all day, every day, educating self and others. I'm here to share with you, and I just have a few minutes to do this. This is nearly impossible, a, mil a professional military um, education perspective on this topic. 
right? So how do we do that, right? Well, let me take out my notes because I forgot to pull them out. So. That's a good start. So in order to do that, I'm going to need your help, right? Uh, I'm going to need your help because I'm going to need you to open your minds because I intend to challenge you. All right, I'm going to tend to challenge the way you think. I'm also going to need your help because I'm also going to leverage technology. I'm going to leverage the FBI time machine. Yes, we have one, and you're in it right now. So for the sake of safety, please buckle up, because we're about to fly back in time to 5th century BC. And we're going to meet with a colleague of mine. Many of you may know him. His name is Thucydides. Am I familiar with Thucydides? A couple of heads nodding. Yes, the great, the renowned Athenian warrior, statesman, and philosopher. And he shared with us three things that lead to war, which I redefine as conflict. Those being fear, honor, and interest. They're human motivations, are they not? I would submit to you they're omnipresent, although often latent. And I believe they brought us here today. Fear, honor, interest. How do we, how do we address those? Right, how do we address those? I would submit to you that to know them is to control them. But we're in ancient Greece, don't take my word for it. Let us consult Socrates, who said, know thyself. Let us also consult Aesop, who was the first to claim, the first to claim, united we stand, divided we fall. Ladies and gentlemen, please buckle up once again. We're about to shoot back to the 19th century, not back, but to the 19th century, and meet with another colleague of mine. Some of you may know him. His name is Carl, Carl von Clausewitz, the renowned Prussian general, the father of modern military strategy. And he offered three reasons or causes for war, which I redefine as conflict. Those being passion, policy, and probability. Passion of the people. We desire change, do we not? Policy, meaning the government, and its, its requirements by law, and its responsibilities to those that it serves. And lastly, probability. Chance, if you will. Or to use Clausewitz's words, friction. Because Clausewitz believed when it came to war, Everything was simple, but the simplest things were very difficult. Mm. So where do we go from here? I submit to you, united we stand, divided we fall. Our interests, our interests are similar, but they're not necessarily the same, nor are our timelines. And I got news for you, there are a lot of people out there that don't agree with us. The fact that we're even here talking about this. There are those out there. More so, even troubling than that, is there's those amongst us that don't agree. Again, where do we go from here? I submit to you, relationships matter. See, we fear the unknown, but if we can learn how to develop meaningful, substantive, sustainable relationships, I believe we can overcome this fear. These are not my words, and they're not my ideas. I learned them from a close friend and mentor of mine. His name is Michael Quentin Williams. He goes by Q. And Q has dedicated his life towards educating others through his nonprofit organization called Dedication to Community. And he literally goes around the country teaching people how to develop these types of relationships. So organizations can build better teams or so he can bring together communities, for example, law enforcement and the communities they serve. I believe, well, step back. There's really 
a simple solution to this in terms of, 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 of how we're going about this. It's a simple recipe, if you will. And it only requires two ingredients, albeit it takes time to cultivate them. It's love and it's trust. I believe through love and trust, we can quell fear. I believe through love and trust, we can learn to redirect honor outward towards others where it belongs, rather inward towards our selfishness. And I believe through love and trust, we can temper self-interest. Pardon me, I got my cards out of order. Okay. I was also asked to bring a big idea forward. I don't know if I've done that. I'll leave that up to you to determine. But I did bring a thesis. And my thesis is, my thesis is that things like fear, honor, and interest, they're impediments to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts. So here comes the challenge, ladies and gentlemen. Knowing all that, if you believe any of what I've said, what are you prepared to do as we move forward? As leaders within your communities and as champions for this, this very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel, and I'm a freshman at Georgetown University. And my name is Grace. I'm a sophomore at the George Washington University. And we're both alumni of Girl Security. We're here today to talk to you all about a few stories from our own lives and the lives of those we've interacted with, and how they relate to the ideas of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what we can do to promote those efforts going forward in an actionable and non-performative way. So with that said, I'll move into my first story, which happened about two years ago. As a part of Girl Security, I had the absolute privilege of having lunch with a Peace with Women Fellows, 12 female NATO military commanders. And while many stories were exchanged during that lunch, one of the ones that stuck with me most came from someone who'd been part of her country's second class of female naval commanders. She said that for as horribly as some of the men in the academy treated her, the women in the class above her treated her far, far worse. They were upset that, unlike her, or unlike them, they, she had not had to go through quite as much. And in a way, they're not wrong. I mean, the first to do anything has it worse. They pave the way for those behind them. But the question then becomes, for those who are paving the way, and for those who are already established in their fields, how do you treat those behind you? Just last week, my friend and I had the opportunity to meet with a man who spent his entire career working in politics and the civil rights movement. I had hoped to gain insight as to what my own career path might look like. However, instead, he spoke at us for nearly two hours, only ever addressing my male colleague and speaking poorly about nearly every woman he had worked with in the past. Although I had never been given the opportunity to speak, he ended our conversation by telling me that I might as well have been the dumbest person at my university and that I would never amount to what my male colleague would. So with that said, we are here to argue that the simplest and most impactful thing that you as an individual can do to foster diversity in any space, but particularly within the intelligence community, is to support those behind you. Over the next few years, the intelligence community is going to be faced with an influx of our generation. The best way to overcome diversity fatigue and truly foster diversity in this community is going to be by lending a hand to those who come after you. Just as in the case of the naval commander, our struggles will look a lot different from the ones that you may have faced. However, that should not call into question the validity of our problems. And as you begin to interact with your younger colleagues, it is extremely important to understand the signals that you are sending to them. To follow up on Grace's story, about two months ago, I had the opportunity to talk to someone in a field I was interested in. And on that call, he told me that as a woman in that field, I would never be treated poorly. I would be treated like everyone's daughter. But I would never, ever be respected. Casually, I was told that. Comments like these have a very profound and very negative impact. As you're interacting with your younger colleagues, be sure to encourage them about the field they're going into. Be sure that your words are what you truly mean to say. As our generation enters the workspace, we're going to be looking for mentors like all of you to help guide and support us. It's up to you to foster a space where we can find those mentors. 
As a young professional hoping to enter the intelligence community, I know that there will be times where I'll be, I will be confused and I will need to seek guidance. And I need to be able to know that I can find a space like that. This guidance, the support that all of you can offer will be essential to fostering diversity in the intelligence community. The portrait of our Naval Commander, the comments that Grace and I received, they do not encourage participation. As we talk about the idea of moving past performative programming, as we talk about the idea of individual actions, the most important thing you can do is to help those behind you and develop a positive support network for them. So as our generation enters this community, ask yourself what you wish your own experience had been like. The goal of any industry should be to continually support those who come after. Give us the space to fail in front of a mentor who can guide and support us so that we can succeed when it counts. Thank you. to have a moderated discussion right now. Shadi and I have a few questions to open the conversation based on what our presenters have shared. And I loved all the very different ideas that you all shared. Thank you so much. You all have note cards, I understand. So as we talk, if you have questions that you'd like to pose to the panel, please go ahead and start writing those out as, you, as they come to you. And we'll have those sent up and ask the panel. But we'll get started with some questions. I do want to introduce uh, two other esteemed uh, roundtable participants, Ms. Stephanie LaRue, uh, who, <laughs> who needs some introduction, ODNI, um, and also Dr. Wes, Wes Brooks, also working on diversity, equity, inclusion in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. We are honored to have you both join the roundtable as well. All right. OK, I'll open with the first question here. And Joe. Yes. I'm sorry, Julianne. We're, we're, we're friends outside of this, so I'm trying to be very formal here, <laughs> Ms. Thomas. <laughs> yes, Dr. West. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if possible, can Stephanie and I just spend a second just differentiating our roles within ODNI, just absolutely. so that the audience is clear? Thank you. So do you want to go ahead? Oh, and thank you, sure. So, uh, I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for the entire United States Intelligence Community. So I have the lovely distinction of working with the Chief Diversity Officers within each of the elements in the United States IC uh, to make sure that we have a strategic and integrated DEIA plan moving forward. And so my role at ODNI is external, right, so bringing in all the IC elements. But inside ODNI, this man is the boss. So I am not the external entire IC. Like Stephanie <laughs> mentioned, we work closely together. Uh, talk quite a bit because I take care of the DNI staff, so we are internal facing mm -hmm. and handle the issues that happen inside and make sure that DEIA is taken care of inside the DNI staff. So that's how you differentiate our roles. Both chief diversity officers have very distinct roles. Thank you. Thank you so much for making that distinction. Also, I just want to note that Stephanie and I did not coordinate on our colors today. We are just cool <laughs> like that. <laughs> Indeed. OK, let me open with the first question. And I will start with, with you, uh, Dr. Westbrooks, and uh, Ms. LaRue. So Erica talked about assumptions that are made about diversity efforts and those that show up in the workplace and those who are impacted. What other assumptions do you think are being made about the idea of diversity equity, inclusion. I see you chuckling over there. <laughs> um, and how do they lead to performative programming or other maybe misconceptions that you all see in the work? So um, I believe the biggest misconception or assumption is that DEIA is a nice to have, not a need to have, um, and that it is a supporter or a mission enabler, and that it is not mission itself. Uh, and, and I think the way that we talk about DEIA is, is part of the problem. For a long time, this work has been performative. Let's have a happy hour. Let's taste everyone's food. That doesn't do anything to get people promoted. And so I think that we need to change the conversation around DEIA so that people understand how this drives the intelligence mission, right? So I said this last week. I had the wonderful opportunity of sitting down doing a live podcast for uh, Iron Butterfly Media. They're doing some great stuff. Look them up. Uh, and one of the things we talked about there was how DEIA is so much more, right? DEIA is an operator who is able to go into an adversarial country, 
who is able to build trust with an asset because they have similar cultural backgrounds, who's able to retrieve intelligence and then give us that intelligence so that we can support foreign policy. It is a linguist on the telephone who understands that perhaps the word wedding is not referring to a party, right? It's an analyst who's a member of an underrepresented group and who understands perhaps that in other parts of the world, if things are going on, if people are being mistreated, what that might feel like and how these folks might respond. And so DEIA, like I tell folks all the time, this is not a nice to have. This is a need to have in the United States intelligence community. If we do not get this right, we are not doing the job that we have been brought here to do. Yeah, and I'll piggyback on, on what Stephanie just mentioned. Um, if you go back and you look at the statistics, people are getting more STEM degrees. We're pushing STEM, STEM, STEM. The arts and sciences are beginning to drop just a little bit. But if you, if you leverage employees, like we have to, we don't, we don't, we have to do this. We have to bring in our employee resource groups who have an understanding of different landscapes, of different cultural backgrounds to assist with the mission in ways that they can. It can be a matter of still having ties to a certain area. You can be from that area. You can offer cultural things like Stephanie talked about that you know the average analyst may miss. So we are leveraging every single employee that we have in different ways. We're not just relying on those who are sitting at the analyst's desk. We're asking people who are in different groups who have that cultural background to come in, who have that, the, the gender identity. We did a nice uh, thing with the State Department came over. DOD came over and talked about um, women's issues and Women's History Month, how DOD is leveraging the need to understand when they go into a country how this is impacting women, talking to women who people don't ask, but they see everything. You know, It just depends on the culture you're operating in. The State Department, same thing. So we are leveraging people from all the different backgrounds of our employees and asking them to help us out here um, as you know, money gets tight, billets get tight, and those things like that. We have to, we have to ask everybody to participate. So. Thank you. Harry, do you want to ask the next yeah. question? Um, Erica and Joseph, both of you mentioned a couple of things that have a lot of overlap. So Joseph called it trust. In your case, Erica, you said, don't look at me as my color, look at me as my achievements. So how do you look at organizations? What can they do beyond the performance metric of, yes, we achieve X percentage of the diversity within our group? How can you see it in culture? How can you see it in decision making for you to say, you know what? We are a culturally diverse environment that appreciates our diversity and takes it into consideration to make things better. Would you like me to jump on that one first? Okay. okay. So I know this won't be the, the, the answer that most people are looking for, but you never really know until you get there. Mm -hmm. Because companies can sell you a dream. They can say we're diverse, but then it gets back to how are we defining diverse? Mm -hmm. Do you mean diversity of thought? Do you mean diversity of race, gender? Am I going to walk in and see myself represented in the room? Or is it going to be all white people sitting there? Is it going to be women? Is it going to be men? You never really know. And to what was said earlier um, about like training, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's become performative to a certain extent. Some organizations, you do it when you're onboarding. You may have a monthly meeting, but then that's really it. How do you know that we are actually becoming diverse? How are we measuring it? Are we setting goals? How do we know that we are truly doing what we say we are instead of being performative? I, again, may not be the best answer, but you really won't know until you get there. You won't know until you start the job and you get to meet your coworkers and you pick up on all those smaller things that aren't set at the interview or during your first week. You won't know until you're there. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it starts with policy, right? But unfortunately, policy isn't going to get us where we need to be. If that was the case, we wouldn't be here today. Right? It's, a, it's a systemic problem, which I think now brings it more towards um, education. Um, I spent all morning in a seminar with uh, know, about 16 servicemen and women. Um, and we were talking about the Women of Peace and Security measure, um, and then broadened that conversation um, to all things diversity. Um, and, and so current class at Marine Corps University has a transgender uh, officer in it. Um, and that came up, and I asked the question, well, let me ask you guys, how many of you approached this Marine and have had a conversation with her? Zero. <coughs> fear is based out of ignorance, I believe. So how do you get past that fear? It's that education aspect. So I challenged them. I've had a wonderful conversation with her. She's a Marine. She's actually a law enforcement officer, so a Marine um, law enforcement. I'm like, get to know her. You got, you're here for the next several months. 
So it has to be action-oriented. There has to be a commitment on, on it at the individual level. But I think as organizations, we can, we can help push that through education, but not the education that I, you know we've all had to deal with, like the virtual academy stuff. No, it has to be sleeves rolled up. Um, and I've had the benefit of, of being a part of that, and I brought it to the Bureau, which is the dedication community uh, uh, program that I spoke of. We're actually teaching some students at the FBI National Academy. I brought it to the Marine Corps University. So how many will I touch? You know, maybe a couple of people. But it's a start. It's a start. And it's not the only program out there. There's plenty of those programs out there. But we seem to be focused on a policy issue about making this something that we have to do, and now you have to do a virtual academy kind of class, and that just isn't going to cut it. We need to push that to the whole other level where we're actually making this part of the conversation in daily conversation. And the only way to do that it, you know, comes down to leadership, ladies and gentlemen. Make it a purpose. Make it a purpose. And people ask me, well, what do you care about? You're a white guy, right? I mean, I've been, I've received that. But you don't know my family, right? You don't know my family. You don't know where I'm from. You don't know my story. And part of it, I think, is developing those relationships through love and trust by sharing your story with people. That requires vulnerability. And that's a challenge within the national security industry, right? No one wants to let their guard down. But this is a national security issue. We are in the middle of great power competition. That means we need all hands on deck, right? We need all the talents that are out there if we're going to survive this. Now, I'm preaching to the choir, but I mean, that's the narrative I think we need to get out there. Thank you, John. Well, there has been growth in that space, I'll tell you. So ICD-125 is the ICD that was recently passed on gender inclusion and gender identity in the intelligence community. And so this director of Real Haynes, I am so inspired by her because when she got in, she listened to the community from the LGBTQI plus uh, group, and they said, we need a policy to make sure that we can PCS, we can TDY, I can take my family, I can do the things that I need to do, and also make sure that I can change my name in the system if I need to. Right, without having to go through all of these hoops. And together, the United States intelligence community said, we're going to get this done. And they all signed on to this intelligence community directive that requires, that requires that we be more inclusive when it comes to gender identity. We've also hired our first transgender inclusion coordinator, who is a member of the community, to also take what she's learned both by both lived experience and her experience in the IC and help other elements set up a similar person and a resource so that they can navigate the IC as well. So we're making great progress, I'd say, in, in, that, in that regard. That's very encouraging. Thank you both. Uh, we have a few questions, so I'll, I'll pose this to the group. Um, Grace and Rachel, you all shared an interesting perspective. Um, and so I, I want to read this question from, mm -hmm. from the audience. And also open it up to everyone else, but I'd like to start with you all. How do you think young women should address comments expressed like, you'll be treated as, a, as someone's daughter, for example? without fear of reprisal. Mm -hmm. Any tips, tricks, as a way to address it in the workplace? I know I'm asking you as people who have received this, but um, can you just share a little bit more before we open it up to the rest of the discussants about um, how that makes you feel, if it, if it motivates you, if it makes you just want to choose another career? How do you respond if you respond at all? Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Honestly, when I received that comment, I didn't respond. I was so shocked that it even had been said that I could not think of a response that was appropriate at that time. Um, I think going forward, especially after the experience, there needs to be a strong response to those comments because by not responding to that person, in a way I sort of like said that it was okay, right? Like I let it happen, I let it continue, and that person doesn't learn in that instance that that is not an okay thing to say to someone. Um, and while I shouldn't have to be the one to tell them that, by not responding, I'm not telling them that it's not okay. Um, so I think going forward, at least for myself, there does need to be a very strong and direct response to comments like that. I also didn't respond when I was told that I might as well have been the dumbest person at my university. But looking back, I really wish that I had. I think that 
I was so concerned that he might feel uncomfortable by me calling him out, but I realize now that he probably should have felt uncomfortable about that. Um, I think there is a, a difference between this man did not work, like he was not my employer, and I'm not entirely sure how I would have handled a situation similar to that if he had been. Um, I wish I had more about that. But. Thank you. I think it's so important to understand your experiences, though. And I think it's OK to be shocked and not be able to say something. I, I've been around for 20 years in the field, and I have people who have said very racist and misogynistic things to me. and I could not think of anything to say in the moment as well. So understand your, I understand your, your um, feelings in the moment. Opening up to the, to the panel, if you, if you hear something like that, what, what is our responsibility? What, what is reasonable to do? If, if I can just take a, a different um, take on it, because there's, there, this talent has mobility. And I applaud everyone in here for being here, and I hope that everyone learns something as, you know, I don't know where you're at in your company, whether you know, it's supervisor, manager, but talent has mobility. And there will come a time if you say something like that to someone uh, and, and they're an all-star, um, they're gonna walk, they're gonna leave. And there's a fierce, fierce competition for talent. And we see it every day and you cannot treat people like that. You need that talent to get the job done. And, you know, as the gentleman said on the end there, this is about national security. So. Take these opportunities, attend these events, listen, learn, um, and, and you know, I, don't beat yourself up. We've all had those moments where we didn't know what to say, and then we get home and we're like, oh, I should have said that, you know. So, um, been there, been there, trust me. But just, just applaud you all for being here, and just, just take it all in and, and learn from it as employers, and, and don't let it happen, because um, you, you know, these, these are good folks, and you're going to want them on your team. But power dynamics are real, and I think that's the point here, right? And so it's not just that you're a young woman, and this is probably an old, you said it was an older man, right? It's also this person is more experienced in whatever field it was, and you're, so power dynamics are real, so do not blame yourself for that for one second. And I think, I know I've had that personal experience. I've had people say all manner of interesting things to me, I, you know, all the time, putting trash cans out while I walk by an office, dressed in a full suit. Um, because they think I'm there to take out the garbage, or saying things like, well, you know, all of these kids are across the border, do they don't even look like your kids? Uh, so I've dealt with all manner of that, and I'll tell you, in the moments, um, I don't always say anything in that moment, right? Because I'm a firm believer that like, there's gonna come a time when this person's gonna need something from me, or they're gonna <laughs> say something. <laughs> but you have to be strategic about it, right? Because when that person is like, I can't work this Excel spreadsheet, I'm like, oh really, Grandpa? I can't help you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Daughter's gotta go get her nails done. So I, I do think, so, but like, I use a lot of humor in the work that I do, folks, so I tell you, because if you don't laugh at this stuff, you will cry. And I'm done crying, I got nothing left to give, right? So you have to laugh at these things, so don't beat your Yourself up if you have that experience because it is real it is gonna happen to you it's gonna happen to you for the rest of your life but be strategic about what you're gonna say and when and know that in those moments that you don't say something it's a choice it's not because you're saying you know I, I could I didn't feel empowered make sure that it's a choice and if whatever comes out of your mouth in that moment there's no such thing as an inappropriate response to an inappropriate comment in my book Right? If he's inappropriate, then that's free game, sweetheart. And if you need help, I think, I think you need to reach out to all of the lovely people in this room and say, you are not alone. You have a network of people that you can go to and say, I just need some help. Can you talk to me about, can you th talk me through this? Uh, and that, I think, is a piece that I wish I had as a GS7 starting at CIA when I had very similar experiences. I had no one, no community. I had no, I mean, nothing. No one in my family ever worked for the IC. And so in that moment when that happened to me, I felt so alone. And there were a lot of tears that I cried. Uh, but I wish now that, and I say these things to you because I don't want you to be the GS7 Stephanie, right? Whenever you start your careers in the IC, like remember this conversation, remember these people, remember me, and I will happily come and have a lovely conversation with your friends. <laughs> We're crazy. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I feel the passion and I, I understand it because it gets fatiguing after a while. <laughs> And I, I thank you, Rachel and, and Grace, for, for being vulnerable and sharing those experiences. All right, I have another question that I'm going to pose to, to the group, and uh, particularly interested in Shadi, Joe, and Wes's um, input on this. Um, so, you know, some people don't like the idea of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, period. Some people don't like the way that the programs to implement them are 
are put forth. Distinction. Some people don't like the topic. They don't think it's mission critical. Some people think that it is mission critical, but we're doing it all wrong. So said that to tee up this question. How do we, con and this is a question from the audience, thank you for whoever sent this question up. How do we continue to advance DEIA without creating backlash and making some in the workforce, like straight white men who have no employee resource group or mentoring programs, feel excluded? I can take a stab at it a little bit, because I, I'll take a stab at it a little bit, just answering this, if, if I may. I know I'm a moderator. But I've been in these situations so many times. I'll tell you, my first job here in the US, they told me, oh, your previous individual who took that job was X. I'm not going to use the label. And it was a shocker for me. I was like you both, though I was in my, I wasn't young as you are. And it was a shock for me. Um, I was like, well, how can I answer that? But to go back to these points is we, we need to start measuring what we need to measure in this case. We need to start understanding who we are. So when I look at you faces, I don't see male, female, transgender, LGBTQ, whatever you want to put. I see what? I see another human. And this is what we need to start looking at. We are all humans here. We cannot live without each other. Can I live on my own on an island? I can. But what's going to happen? It's going to be a miserable life. Maybe happy for the first week, but then it's going to become miserable <laughs> after that. So we need, I mean, we, if you work since Joseph talked about history, history puts us what? Interacting together, communities, tribes, whatever you want to call it. And that's how it is. And I'm so happy to hear Stephanie saying, like, the tribe is here. If you need support, I'm at Georgetown. Great. If you need anything, call me. I'm a male, it doesn't matter, but I believe because I want you to treat my daughter that is now 15 years old when she goes back to, when she goes to college and graduate, I want you to treat her as you would like to be treated. And that's what we need to look at. All of us, we're humans. That's it. I'm originally Lebanese. It doesn't mean anything. So what? And that's how it is. We're all one human. We need to treat each other as, as such. And that's how we start really eliminating those uh, labels, those filters we put on. And that's it. Once we remove this, we're all exactly the same. We all want what? We all want happiness. We all want to interact. We all want to grow. We all want to engage. We all want to build something. We all want to feel purposeful in doing things. These are our needs nowadays, if we're not talking about food and shelter and water. But these are our human needs that we need to focus on from now on. And that's how we start changing the conversation. I look at Erica, if I'm with you in the army, do I care who you are? I just want to trust you, that if anything happens to me, I have, your, you have my back. She's there. Do I care about her color, where she's coming from, what label she comes with? I don't care. I need to trust her. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I'm too you, passionate Stephanie. about this topic. <laughs> no, that, that's great. That's great. Awesome. And, and I, I definitely want to pull on that, and I also want to to just really highlight the fact that when we talk about diversity efforts, and this is what I was going for in my earlier remarks, like we say people are diverse, and people are not diverse. People are just people. There's no diverse because then there's the other. But I feel like what I hear in this question is, we're doing all this stuff for everyone else, but what about the one type of person who isn't included in this? And that's what I hear in the question. So Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. you know. Leaders, as they progress, go through a progression, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we check certain boxes that we climb within in our organizations. This job will give me this experience, or this training will help me do this. And that's all fine and good. But what are we doing to diversify our perspectives? Mm. So I'll get a little vulnerable here building trust. I grew up in Brooklyn. I was told at a very early age, when I was able to actually walk around and get around the neighborhood, where to go and where not to go. And those where to go and where not to go were based on perceived fears, right? Perceived fears. We have to interact with each other, right? We have to get to know people. And so my epiphany uh, was when I went to college and I realized I was attracted to people of color. 
And I didn't have the courage at that time to act upon it because that would not have been tolerated within my family. Till I went to college and on my own, and now I'm married to a Dominican woman. I have one black daughter and one white son. That's just the way it worked out. And those perspectives have changed me fundamentally, fundamentally. I see things differently. I hear things differently. I'm more aware. Leaders need to do the same thing, in a sense. I'm not saying run out and go marry somebody just because of you know, their skin color. But what I'm saying is we have to be proactive to get to know people. We're doing these things to get promoted and to, to get certain positions to climb. We need to be proactive to get to know our people as people. Understand their stories. Know their stories. Know their vulnerabilities so you can help them. What a lost opportunity that, that gentleman had to learn from you or help guide or mentor you. It's, it's terrible. Then it's uncalled for with an impression, right? That should not happen. So it's, I think it's upon us to do that, and then upon us to teach those that we lead to do the same. Thank you, Jill. What about you, Wes? Any thoughts? You are getting yeah. backlash with the work that you do from, from those who feel othered <laughs> by your efforts to include people who have historically not been included. I mean, you know, yes, it, it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. But as Stephanie, when she opened up the comment, when she opened up, you know, with her opening comments, if you know Director Haynes, the attitude that she has for Stephanie and myself is just, they got to deal with it. If you want to work here, deal with it. And it comes down to our chief operating officer, Laura, always says, just, just be a good human. Like, if you can't be a good human and you can't see that the, the beauty and, and how these people, different people can contribute to the mission, then this might not be the place for you because we have to get the job done. And I, and I want to just, you know, hey, Joe, we're being vulnerable here on the stage, right? Safe space. Safe right. space. So I want to just, I just want to offer an opportunity where I had a chance to, to grow personally in this job. Um, when we did, and I got my teams here, they'll, they'll sh remember this story well. So when Pride Month came, our employee resource group said that they wanted to go with the theme uh, queer community. And I'm a little older, so you know, queer used to be a bad word, right? And I was like thinking about the others, like they're not ready for this here. Oh my gosh, what are you trying to do? Get the building burned down? <laughs> and you know, and I was just like, guys, you know, think about it a little bit, you know, maybe we can go with soften it up a little bit, trying to think about the entire workforce. And we had a meeting with our chief operating officer, and she said, you know, this is where we're at. If this is what they want to do. This is the kind of place that I want people to work at that we're going with career community if that's what they want to do. And as she said, now I'm the chief operating officer. I'm not the DNI. We're going to move it up and it'll find it'll be her decision in the end. And her remark was, yeah, it'll be fine. Deal with it. We're going with it. So the pride for the, the theme for Pride Month was queer community. And that's the first time, and it was something to walk down the halls and see queer community in print on our screens. Um, we had, you know, uh, the folks from that particular employee resource group were happy. Also, we had contractors that were happy that said that they worked at a place where they felt they could be safe. And they have a choice. They can go work somewhere else. But they like to work within ODNI. And we have good retention. And, and it's all about, you know, retention. And it's all about a place to work where you can be your best self and you can contribute. So what I've done here, I... <laughs> I have a group of white males, uh, heterosexual, cisgendered white males who've worked in the IC for a long time who are ages, you know, brand new to very experienced and legacy, not old. Um, and I go to them and I tell them, help, they're my little focus group, right? And they know they're, they're my focus group and they know exactly what I'm using them for. And I tell them, you know, we go out to drink and I tell them, this is an idea I have, why, you know, what do you think? This is what's, what we're doing. Is this hitting or missing? Why isn't this resonating? Uh, and for a long time, they were the ones that told me it's because you're, you're shaming, it feels like we're being blamed for something. Mm. And they really did help me understand that you cannot shame or blame someone into changing their behavior, right? They have to, the way that this is being communicated, the language that we use, um, the tone that we use is what is very off-putting to some demographics, particularly that demographic that is my, you know, focus group of six. 
Um, and so that really helped change the way that I talk about this, which is why I focus so much on the mission and helping them understand the value uh, in that way. But I've also had to help them understand that you don't have to be brown to be down, right? We, I think everybody, especially in the Latino community, right, we are so open to people under asking us questions about our experience, asking us questions about the language, because we know that that's something that can be used to drive the IC mission. Uh, and so we tell, I tell them all the time, listen, I'm going to be your introduction to an employee resource group that you have no part of. Right? And so they go in, they make friends, they understand more about the culture, and they open themselves, they humble themselves to the fact that every stage is not for them. They don't need to be the center of every conversation, right? And they learn that in that space, but, by, but because I've been kind of that avenue for them, and then they've been one for me. And so really, um, that, that's how I've done it, right? It's helping people understand, making sure that I'm not talking about this in a way that shames or blames, and helping them understand and helping them break into these communities in a way that makes them feel safe and comfortable. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for, for sharing those different perspectives on that. Can I just add one Please last do. Thing? Please do. So going back to Joe's point, there was a, a, a gentleman I met, and you don't know anybody's story. And I, for the life of me, could not understand why he was so kind and so interested in DEIA. And then he shared a story about his family and things like that. So you really just don't know who you're talking to and what their story is. So just ask everybody to always keep that in mind. That, that's true. That goes back to assumptions, right? Mm. Uh, Erica, I'm going to pull you back into the conversation here. So this is another question uh, from the audience. And thank you all for these very thoughtful questions that you're sending up. So when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, I, li I like to just say it out, because just saying DEI, sometimes people mm -hmm. just have their own ideas and um, just want to say it and acknowledge those words. We tend to focus on diversity which is super important. Whoever wrote this, you're so wonderful. They have like the exclamation point, the, the everything, it's great. Um, but what are some actions we are, could be taken regarding equity and accessibility? So diversity gets the, the prime billing. What about equity and accessibility um, in terms of, of the things that you shared or any other thing you want to add to what you've shared already about assumptions? I think equity, well, I can't speak too much to the accessibility part. I try to pull from my own experiences, and I don't really have an answer to that one. But in terms of equity, sometimes it's about leveling the playing field, but also understanding that equal may not be equal for everyone. And I know that that may not make sense. But if there's somebody who is further behind and somebody who's already at like the starting point, you may need to shift your focus and focus on that person who's further behind to get everybody to the level field. So that's sort of how I look at equity. And again, I don't really have an answer to the accessibility, but that's a good question because what I spoke about, I really only touched on the diversity because that's usually the hotbed topic right now. Right, it's kind of like an umbrella term, right? right. You're diverse, including everybody that's in the mix. Does anyone else have any thoughts on the equity and accessibility piece? that they'd like to share? I know about a lot about this, but I want to make sure that I give other people a <laughs> No, you go right before. <laughs> so the accessibility piece, I think this is incredibly important, right? So we have a number of officers across the community who identify as having visible disabilities, and invisible disabilities, deaf and hard of hearing communities. And one of the things they say all the time is nothing for us without us. Whether we're drafting policy, whether we are implementing new programs, they want to be a part of the process. So I think that's the first part. The second thing we've been really working toward that the IC has been working on for the last 11 11 years, and I am so proud to say that it is finally, ICD-124 on medical devices in SCIFs is finally out to the IC for coordination after 11 years. And I will tell you, yes, so the, the people who did that, it was a relentless pursuit of justice and equity for these officers that required, Mark Fraunfelter was here earlier, he has been a massive advocate for this line of work, and we've worked very, to get, very well together to get this done, but ICD-124 is huge, and making sure that we're focusing on that so that officers, and this is a much bigger group, this is veterans, right? Uh, a lot of veterans who have, who are deaf and hard of hearing, who are hard of hearing, who might not want to admit that openly, they need these Bluetooth-capable devices so that they can come in and do their job to the best of their ability. So this is a much larger pool than, than we think. But this also means card captioning, right? Making sure that we have live captioning services for officers, because right now, the, what comes up on your TV for free, 99, it's garbage. They call it craptions is what the community is calling it. And I think it's hilarious. It is funny, but at the same time, you have to also think, my goodness, these they can't even see. They, I mean, there's no way. We've done this resource. We've done this, provided this resource, but it's only a half measure because it's not complete. Sign language interpreters. Do you know how hard it is to find a cleared sign language interpreter who knows the intricacies of NGA speak and all of those? I couldn't say them in English. I don't know how you'd sign these words. 
And so it is very difficult to find these people. So it's, you know, the intelligence community right now when it comes to that, type, that part of accessibility, we are, I don't want to say we're admiring the problem because with ICD-124, we are doing something about it. Uh, but with respect to the sign language interpreting services, that's something that we really need to do a better job on. But uh, earlier, the young woman who was here from NSA, NSA has an accessibility engineer who is tinkering with things all day to figure out how to make them more accessible. That's beautiful, right? And then taking that and making it an IC-wide resource. So we are really starting to figure out just all, you know, just the whole world, the realm of things that are beyond 503, 508 compliance, right? That will make sure that we can be proactive about the needs of our officers instead of reactive. Yeah, we're spending, yeah, we're spending a lot of time on accessibility as well for all the reasons that Stephanie just mentioned. And I'll just share a story. Um, and, and, and it's not, across the board that you know you can walk into ODNI but you cannot walk into right. NSA with the same device or over to CIA or FBI which is mind-boggling but hopefully I, the ICD will help work on some of that but we had when you're dealing with intelligence you're looking for a unicorn you're looking for somebody who understands this region can speak this language can do this or can code this way we found this perfect candidate and we brought her in for an interview and it happened that she had a, a device she had to wear for her heart and we had to get it all cleared. She had to walk through the metal detector, and she's fine in the State Department, but she came over for the interview and had to go through all these hoops. We were like, finally, we got the person. We sent the offer, and she came back and said, no, thank you. I don't want to have to deal with that every time I come to work. Mm. And you know, it was just like, oh my gosh. So we, we are really in a, in a space where we have to work on accessibility. And if I could start a company today, it would be sign language interpreter. With the clearance. Mm -hmm. With the clearance, yes. Remember you heard, you it, here first. heard it here yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, because you think about it, you need somebody who can speak NSA, who can speak NGA. They're not the same. You know, I speak NSA fluent because that's my background. But take me to NGA, and I'm like, now that's a satellite. Like, what? what? You know, like I don't, that's not my that's not my bag. You know, but um, but you know, if if there's a company who could do that, oh my gosh, they'd be they'd be set. Set. So we're <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're done here. Thank you. We're done. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, I think we have Joe, time for this one, one last to that? question. Oh yes, please. Just in terms of the accessibility, I want to I want to share a success story. Um, so and I'm going to give props to the Marine Corps University. So last year's class at the Marine Corps War College, uh, they had a student, uh, I believe, was DIA analyst, uh, that was wheelchair about. Mm -hmm. And the way the university is set up, uh, the Command Staff College, which is larger, it's got 200 students, it's got the nice building. Uh, and then across from it is where more of the administrative component is, as well as the War College, which is much smaller, 50 students. They don't have an elevator. They didn't have a ramp. All right, so it's a problem now. We have a student. What are we going to do? So they picked up the War College, so to speak, the class, and they found space for it in the new building which has got all the bells and whistles. Um, and it was such a huge success story. We graduated, off, and it's to the point where it's like, wow, OK, that's, that's cool, right? Like, they, on a dime, mm -hmm. figured it out, such that when we were doing ours on the FBI side, trying to get new students to come in, uh, we are crafting the language, and it became, OK, um, how do we address the certain language in it relative to who we're going to bring on. So for, for agents, um, you know, we have to have physical capabilities and all that, but the civilian staff doesn't. Um, so it became kind of a question for us. Um, so I dug into it a little bit. And I mean, when I say they w went out of their way, I mean, even for like battlefield tours, he was able to get out there and do, do whatever they needed to do. So kudos to the Marine Corps for making that happen. If they can make it happen with a battlefield tour at, at uh, Chancellorsville, we can figure a way out anywhere we are. I believe that. Thank you. All right, so we have five more minutes. I'm going to um, kick this, this our last question out. Uh, whoever wrote this has amazing handwriting, so thank you. <laughs> it's beautiful. So Shadi, I'm going to start with you, and then I'll open it up to everyone else. So here's the question. Recognizing that we all want to acknowledge shared humanity, can you also discuss some of the dangers of a colorblind of colorblind approaches to diversity? Mm -hmm. uh, they say colorblind or other minority agnostic approaches. Well, um, look, we're all humans. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot look at anyone. I travel all around the world, and there is so many things you can learn from wherever you go, from the simple things. 
And it's not like being colorblind. I hope I'm understanding it properly. It's not about like I don't see the colors or I don't see anything. Actually, I love colors. Look, I'm wearing colors. So, uh, and we should embrace them. There is something Stephen Covey used to say a long time ago. Anyone knows the difference between a smoothie and a fruit salad? What's the difference between them? A smoothie, everything is jumbled up. Okay, you, you, you drink it, but then you can't taste it. But if you have a fruit salad, you just pick strawberry and eat it, and you're gonna taste the strawberry. Pineapple, you're gonna taste the pineapple. And that's what makes us who we are on this planet Earth. And that's what we need to cherish. That's what we need to look for. That's what we need to be aspiring towards, is that appreciate all those shades that we have, all those shapes, all those colors, all those uh, backgrounds that we have, all those cultures. This is what it is. We cannot be in a position to say, this is better than that. OK, maybe at one point in time, but let's look at history. What happened throughout the millennials and all of these things? Let's cherish that. That's how my motto is, wherever I go, with whom I speak. This is how it is. Everyone has value to bring, no matter what. She was in one of my classes two weeks ago, and then we talked about diversity of thinking. People don't realize that we tend to think in a different way. There are three perspectives that we come from. But I tend to blame someone else or label him or her or whomever, label them in particular that this is a stick in the mud. No, 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 that person is not stick in the mud. That person has a lens when they omit and they perceive from reality. And when I understand that, this is what empathy is all about, understanding things from someone else's perspective. So me, when I heard that person saying, oh, you don't want to know the person that was before you in that job, I was like, just putting myself into the shoes of that person, how he would have felt by hearing this, that made me upset alone. And this is what we need to look at. It's not about colors, it's not about shapes, it's not about anything, it's about how I, get the value of each one of them and bring them onto the table. Thank you. Anyone else have any closing remarks before we wrap it up? I want to thank you all for your, your attention and setting up these very thoughtful questions. Anyone have any closing thoughts? No? Well, thank you. Oh. Uh, oh. Would you okay. like? Just yeah. super, super, super quick. So I just want to encourage you to just seek out mentors whenever you get out into the IC but I also want to ask this audience, and I see Maggie back there in the back. She's from our new and emerging workforce employee resource group who does reverse mentoring. So I ask that you think about that, where you have your younger new employees mentor the employees who, are, who have been around a little longer so you don't lose touch. So I think that's very important, seeking out mentoring, but also the reverse mentoring. Yeah, keep, that, keep that in mind. You have a question here, too. Yes. I just want to make a comment. Suzanne, this has been wonderful. Oh. Mm -hmm. I had your job one time, um, Stephanie, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. That was one of my portfolios in intelligence community. But you're preaching to the choir here. Everybody gets what yes, you say. You know who needs to be here? The leadership level. The directorate heads. They need to hear this because they have the power to implement. I just wrote some things down for accountability. I haven't heard that word too much today. Yep. But that's who needs to be held accountable. And it's not just the DEA performance appraisal or the performance element that you give them, because I've been there, done that. And we're still talking about the same things for 20 years down the road. Policy, look at your policy. Look to make sure the policy is not biased itself. Collect data. Show the data. People believe in the raw numbers. I used to send the data to the Hill. Percentages. Percentages don't tell you anything. The raw data does. Put a picture up of your leadership portrait. Your top leadership, your next level leaders, and those that are coming behind them, you'll see what your succession plan really looks mm -hmm. like. That's critical. And again, I go back to the accountability. You've got to have the data. 
and you've got to have it not just for the whole IC, but every directorate in the IC to show that directorate ahead what they are doing in that critical mission directorate. I'll stop there. I love Thank you, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> if I could just say one thing about the data piece, I think that is probably when the DNI approached me about this job, this is one of the pieces that I was very passionate about, not just the collection of data, but the collection, analysis, and reporting of role level data so that you can identify what the experience is for women across the IC, because the experience of white women is very different from the experience of black women, of queer women, of women, of Latinas, incredibly different. And the DNI gave me the room, the space, the support, and the authority to go back and collect this data. I was already collecting it from all of the elements for the purposes of the annual demographic report, which is a statutory requirement every year. Congress, it's out, look for it. Um, but we never had it at that role level to do intersectional data analysis. And with her support and the support of all of the directors across the IC, we were, a we were able to get that done for the first time ever. And so now we can see that the demographic that is most likely to leave the IC within one year are women of color and persons with disabilities, specifically black women. That lets us know that we need to tailor a program for those two groups to make sure that we are investing in them and their success and their development to keep them at least till those five years, right? Because that's what we're seeing. But the other part of that is making sure that we can create an IC-wide dashboard. Data visualization is so important. For the first time ever, we have an IC-level dashboard with demographic data for every single element across the IC and rolled up to the entire IC level so you can see information about women, persons with disabilities, any demographic that you want to see based on hiring, attrition, promotion rates, right? And it's, you can do that for the first time. And it is accessible to everyone across the IC. These are huge wins. When you talk about accountability, these directors are incredibly competitive. They don't want to be the person whose folks are in the very, very bottom, right? And so when we take that data, and the DNI allows me to brief that to the XCOM and DEXCOM, where all the directors and deputy directors are, and they can see their numbers in front of everyone else, it makes them feel some kind of way. And so if for no reason other than your numbers are going to be up on that board and you don't want to be at the bottom, they are finally holding themselves accountable for achieving what they've wanted to achieve for the last 70 years. So thank you so much for saying that. And Dr. Gant, thank you for that question um, and comment. Um, as a reminder, this is being recorded. And so you can pass the recording of today's discussions on to folks, both seniors and junior folks in the community. So I want to thank Shadi and Trahina for leading the discussion to all of our panelists. I learned a great deal, a few things I'm gonna be thinking about on my way home, I'm in the car today, but stick around. We have a conversation um, with Director Abizade, Fireside Chat, and then I noticed the sun came out and we will be having a reception um, on the balcony a little later this afternoon, so thanks again. Thank you. Thumbs up, great. Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back from the uh, networking break. I hope you en enjoyed it and got it some more uh, a Coke or some coffee to get you through the rest of the day. And I want to thank as well Mantech for sponsoring our networking break. And I'd also like to thank Raytheon Technologies for sponsoring the last session of, of the day today. And um, uh, it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce our closing speaker. The Honorable Christine Abizade was sworn in as the director of the National Counterterrorism Center on June 29, 2021. Christie is the eighth Senate-confirmed director and the first woman to lead the United States counterterrorism enterprise. Um, prior to that, during the Obama administration, Christie served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. And prior to, to that role, she served on the National Security Council staff as both Director for Counterterrorism and Senior Policy Advisor to the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism. Christie also served for seven years with the DIA Joint Intelligence Task Force Combating Terrorism as the Senior Intelligence Analyst in the Afghanistan-Pakistan Division and the Iraq Middle East Division. During this time, she deployed several times throughout the Middle East, including a tour as the senior DIA counterterrorism representative in Iraq. Uh, she most recently served as an executive at Dell Technologies in its global operations organization, where she led supply chain assurance initiatives. Joining her on stage for the fireside chat is INSA President Suzanne Wilson-Heckenberg. Christy and Suzanne, I'm looking forward to your conversation. 
Thank you. And thank you for bringing the sunshine with you, Christy. I wanted to mention- No problem. We've done question cards today. We've done live questions from the audience. Um, but Christy and her team, we convinced them to take live questions from the audience for uh, this fireside chat. So our amazing INSA interns will be walking around with the microphone um, in a little bit. Um, and so please feel free to rec um, mention your name and your organization um, before you ask your question. Um, and we really do welcome audience engagement as we have throughout the day to day. We've talked a little bit throughout the day about journeys and people's paths to the IC and some of the challenges and opportunities that their careers have presented. But I think it would be really great if Christy could just share a little bit with us about your career journey and what brought you to sit in front of us today. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for asking me to be here. Um, and it really is an honor. I mean, I, I've seen past programs and um, I was looking at the agenda for today, and even just catching the tail end of the last panel, uh, it's clear that you've put together a really interesting program, but one that is inspiring, and it's uh, the kind of thing that, that just makes me really grateful to be here. So thank you for inviting me here. Um, so my career journey. So you just got like a sense of my bio from, from John. I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure how else to frame it, other than to say that, um, the journey that I've been on to become the, the director of the National Counterterrorism Center is one that is completely unpredictable and, and something I never really anticipated doing. Um, and that goes all the way back to you know when I was in college playing soccer for, the, for UC San Diego, not having any idea what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, having been an army brat, having been around people who had served in some capacity or another for the United States government, um, I graduated college with grand ambitions to be a temp worker in the basement of an architecture firm, which is where I found myself on 9-11. And 9-11 really changed my, my trajectory, the way I thought about myself as a professional and as a person uh, about sort of the way I wanted to contribute to national security. And so um, I found every every opportunity to get my application in to serve for the United States government after those attacks and landed at, at the Defense Intelligence Agency um, and landed there at a time when uh, it was a really interesting time. They were kind of building a, a much more robust counterterrorism office. Obviously, everyone was in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. Um, they, they were doing it at a time when DOD was the battle space owner for a war in Afghanistan. It would soon become one for the war in Iraq. And um, for somebody whose background was in psychology and English lit and soccer <laughs> at, in college, it was a really, really fascinating time for me to join an institution like the military, like the Department of Defense, join the intelligence community, and, and learn how to be a counterterrorism analyst from the ground up. Um, and I think that sort of, you know, it set the tone for a lot that happened in my career in that, you know, I landed in a place that I never anticipated, but found so much value and inspiration in, in the work and the opportunity that I was able to be exposed to. Um, being at DIA at the time that I was in the run-up to the Iraq war was pretty formative for me in later years because it made me want to think about not just being um, an expert in my field, not just having all of the right knowledge that a, a good intelligence officer should have about you know, her particular portfolio, but it made me think about wanting to apply that knowledge to good, smart decision making. Um, you know, I was at, I was at DIA uh, in the run-up to the Iraq War at a time when we were getting lots of questions about uh, the Al-Qaeda relationship with the Hussein regime. And the answer was always the same, but the question was asked about 50 million different times in 50 million different ways, trying to get at a different answer. And that sort of policy interaction with the intelligence community just became a really important and formative experience for me. So when I had the very fortunate opportunity to go serve at the National Security Council, uh, I took it. And um, I spent three years in the Obama administration at the NSC, at the White House, first being um, a director for counterterrorism, working Iraq, Syria, 
Egypt, Europe, and apparently anything else that would come up at, the, at any given time. Um, and, and then eventually being the senior policy advisor for the president's Homeland Security Advisor and uh, Deputy National Security Advisor of Counterterrorism, um, Lisa Monaco. And, and that was where, you know, in that environment, I learned so much, not just about the counterterrorism world, not just about the policy world and the policy instrumentation of our government, but also about good leadership, um, also about good staff work, also about um, what is actually achievable in work-life balance uh, at any given time. And so um, from there, I went to the Pentagon. I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia. Um, that was a choice that I made after being at the National Security Council, where I really loved policy instrumentation, policy um, direction that is provided at that level of government. But I also wanted to be responsible for the decisions that were made there. I wanted to be responsible for the implementation of the hard things that are kind of hammered out in the White House Situation Room, but then you actually have to go and implement. Um, and so as DASD in the Pentagon, I was you know, working on issues like the drawdown from Afghanistan at that time. Um, you know, I was working on issues like our relationship with Pakistan, the Central Asian states, and, and how we would advance a, a better and more strategic relationship in that part of the world with limited resources. Um, and, and it was in a Pentagon bureaucracy that is unlike any other bureaucracy you will ever face and, and brought with it so many different challenges, especially being a young woman. Um, I was 34 years old at the time that I was, I was DASD. Um, you know, I had a bit of a pedigree um, with my father having served in the military, having been the CENTCOM commander. A lot of my peers, at least in rank, were people that had served with him. And that created a dynamic that I had to, in some cases, overcome. In some cases, it was quite useful, right? Um, and after that experience, I, 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 I just found I had learned so much about the government that when it was time to, for the Obama administration to end, I was a political appointee, I was ready to learn how to be something other than a government employee, which led me to the private sector, led me to Dell Technologies, to kind of um, really step into a whole different realm of leadership, which was less about what I knew and how I brought that knowledge to bear, and more about how to get the best knowledge out of the people I worked with and bring that knowledge to the fore for good decision making in a company, a multinational company environment. And this sort of big transition for me of, um, of instead of being the leading expert, leading expertise was a really important transition, I think, in, as part of my leadership journey, not, not just my sort of substantive professional experience. And it was with that sort of combination of experiences behind me that when Avril approached me to be the, the to be considered for um, the National Counterterrorism Center position, the, the, this wonderful organization that I now get to lead, uh, I was actually able to do with maybe for the first time a lot of confidence. I, I accepted the um, the approach in a way that in other jobs that I had been. Um, that I had been considered for, I had shied away from. But for this job, it was the first time that I really sort of confidently stepped in to, to lead uh, an organization that I think is just critically important at a time that is actually really transformational for the counterterrorism mission as a whole. So as a teammate, college athlete, have a great deal of respect for individuals who can get up and go to class and play a sport, something well, I never was able to do. That's a mixed bag. Um, and, and now, um, as a leader at NCTC, um, any valuable lessons learned that you want to share um, with our attendees today? Yeah, you know, um, there, were, there were a lot of different moments in my career where I learned something new, right? I, I mean, I think about different pivot points along the way. One of them was, you know, I talked about sort of wanting to lead and may be the decision maker as opposed to just informing decisions. Um, you know, but that last, that last lesson learned that I had as I came into this, this role as the director of NCTC was something that actually I had to learn over and over again, which was how not to be my own hurdle, 
right? Um, a, as a young woman, as a young gay woman in the national security profession, you know, there are a number of things that, um, that came at me that uh, I had to overcome along the way. But uh, it, it didn't occur to me until I was actually looking back at some of the opportunities I didn't take or some of the uh, opportunities I had to be dragged into that I realized that I was actually so often my own worst hurdle. And I don't know if this is particular to me. I, it does feel like something that as I mentor others is very particular to women. Yes. That we have a sense that we're not quite ready for that next big step. Even though we've been identified by people as being the best person to come in and, and take on a really tough new challenge. You know, I, I, remember, I remember talking people out of hiring me on multiple occasions, including Lisa Monaco, uh, and, uh, and then wondering what I, why I just did that as I walked out of the room. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest valuable lessons I learned was not to be my own worst enemy, not to create my own hurdles considering all the other ones we'd have to deal with. We had a women's empowerment session earlier today with a couple of female coaches, and there were some really interesting t statistics about um, job requirements, and um, if a woman, a woman can't um, at least check nine of the 10 boxes, um, she won't apply, and if she does apply, she's gonna learn how to speak to that 10th before, before the interview. So, um, and then a little bit more about imposter syndrome oh, and yeah. we're our own worst enemy. So yeah. a lot of what you're, yeah. you're sharing, um, folks could have echoed from, from earlier today. Um, so we talked about the last time we'd seen each other in person and it was back in December, we had a, a breakfast for um, C CIA Director Burns and you came in, you were very calm, but you said, you know, oh, I had a, a drop-off situation with the kids or whatever. And, and so a, a term that we used to use, and this will show my age, is work-life balance. I, I don't hear us talking about that anymore because as caregivers, um, mothers, fathers, um, I have a puppy I need to get home um, to in a few hours to let her out, um, elder care issues, you know, we, we are supposed to have it all, and we're supposed to have 10 out of 10 on, on all those areas. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you, or if you have achieved, um, I think there's another word, work-life, not balance, but um, work-life, somebody filled, there's another what word. Is it, is it that's, harmony? What is it? What is it? Inter integration, work thank you. Work-life integration. Fascinating. No, I have not. I'm not <laughs> Uh, no, no, I mean, look, I, I, have, uh, I have probably gotten to where I am because I'm really good at compartmentalizing. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but this idea of work-life balance or work-life integration, you know, it, it's funny. When I have dealt with it in the past, what I've had to fight against is the instinct that my work-life balance is your work-life balance. That work-life balance means that it's 50-50 for everyone. In fact, like when I look across my career, my work-life balance choices for every job I was in, every phase I was in, were different based on a variety of factors, right? And how I made those decisions and whether I always made the right decisions and whether I was ever good at everything right. at all times, which I can guarantee you I was not, I mean that that all that that's a that that's something that changes. It's a rheostat that, if you're good, you are consciously adjusting. But I was never all that good at at being intentional about work-life balance. In fact, it wasn't until um, I became a working mom that I actually was really intentional about about thinking through work-life balance issues. Um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm. Constantly struggling, including you know being late to an INSA breakfast event you because of drop-off <laughs> issues. Or uh, I left work early yesterday or Monday because my three and a half year old was going to his first swimming lesson, and I was a nervous wreck. Right, and I, I left thinking you know about how I need to be more present and I need to be there to help him. And then, God, I can't believe I just left the office yeah. at five o'clock in the afternoon, how dare I do that? And what signal am I sending? And so you're just, you're constantly trying to find that, that right choice for the right moment that takes care of as much of what you care about as possible. And you know, I, 
I don't know if I'll ever be satisfied with my ability to integrate work and life in the right way every time. But, um, but I know that I'm being more intentional about it now. And I, I actually think that I have a lot of privilege, actually, um, being the director of an organization, being able to own my own schedule, not be at the whims of everyone else's schedule all the time, um, being surrounded by a great team, being surrounded by a great team that knows I have a three and a half year old and wants to help me find space for that three and a half year old. I mean, that's, that's a, a level of privilege that most moms, most working moms, don't actually get to experience, including my wife, who's doing lots of really important things in really hard ways and getting pulled in lots of different directions. So, um, so I actually consider myself really lucky at this stage for what opportunity I'm afforded to, to try and work through that. And the kind of supportive environment that I find myself in at ODNI with the DNI, with, with our leadership at, at NCTC, with the people that are in my front office, with the, the organization that I'm fortunate enough, enough to lead, like I, I just feel really fortunate. Well, I think you're setting a good example, too. I mean, it's okay if some people know you left at five, right? <laughs> it's all right. Um, so you mentioned you, know, you had the pleasure of working alongside some of your father's peers, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, you supervised maybe some of your father's peers, or mm -hmm. you, know, you were the authoritarian figure in, in the relationship. And so working in a somewhat homogenous yeah. um, workforce that, that we do here, um, what, what are some of the ways you've, you've navigated that? throughout your career, probably a little bit different yeah. when you were a little more junior and now you're with yeah. the director. Well, well, first of all, I have to check myself a little bit because you know, I look at the workforce today that I'm a part of and the leadership team today that I'm a part of, and it's all women. It's, uh, you know, it's Avril, it's Stacy. You know, I get to lead NCTC, I have, uh, I have uh, two female leaders that are my deputy and my executive director, one of whom is a minority. You know, I mean, I, I look around and I say, well, we're not, we're not homogeneous anymore. And then I check myself, I talk to Stephanie, and I look at the data, and we are more homogeneous than we should be. We, we as an IC, certainly don't reflect all the contours and complexity that the country reflects. Um, and, um, and I think as leaders who are privileged enough to be surrounded in our immediate circumstance by amazing women leaders, amazing leaders from, um, from different minority and minorities and classes, um, that's great, but it's still not enough. And so we've got to really be advocates for change. Um, we need to really be intentional about driving that change. And when, and when I think about sort of the homogeneity that I grew up in as an analyst, I actually think of it in a couple of different ways. First, um, above all, for my career, it has always just been about doing good work. Like, and and counterterrorism is sort of an easy mission to just do good work in. Everybody is focused on crisis, you know, you're trying to protect the country from an attack, you're trying to save lives. In an atmosphere where um, the work is really about the urgency with which you can get it done and the results and the outcomes that you can achieve, you know, there's not a lot of time to spend on the drama, uh, especially in crisis. And, and so, first and foremost, I was always just focused on doing good work. Um, but I will say that, you know, I, I also kind of got into the slipstream of homogeneity. I thought of myself as part of that homogeneous culture, and it wasn't until I surprised myself by falling in love with a woman that all of a sudden that homogeneity didn't, wasn't something I identified with anymore. And it was something that I realized that I sort of participated in, in without understanding that I was. I didn't understand this sort of concept of allyship until all of a sudden I needed allies, right? And so um, trying to kind of be reflective about that, think about how if I hadn't been a part of the system as much, or how I could have used my privilege in that system to advocate and drive change, 
how I could have used my relationships or my credibility or my good work to also show that I could be different and effective. Um, even like thinking about my own coming out process and how open I was about my relationship, if I had done that a little bit sooner, would it have made things a little bit better for just one other person? You know, All that kind of stuff wow. sort of just makes me reflect on what I could have done differently. Um, and it makes me feel that much more responsibility now that I'm in a position to do something differently to be very intentional about it. Um, and so that's what we try and do at NCTC. Well, I think being um, very authentic um, is having um, a positive impact. So don't beat yourself up for, for not doing it a little earlier. It's all in time. So we, we've talked a fair amount about diversity today. Mm -hmm. And um, we've talked about um, diversity in culture and gender. Um, we've talked about neurodiversity, mm -hmm. um, all different aspects of, of groups of, of diversity versus just an, an individual. And so what do you think are some of the advantages to having um, a more diverse workforce and the, the good work that you all are doing trying to build that? Yeah, uh, this, this question is exactly the right question. The fact that we have to answer it, I think, is a little bit, I struggle with right. that. Uh, it's not just about um, creating an environment where uh, people feel included, creating kind of uh, uh, diversity, diversity of perspective, diversity of experience, diversity of um, background, you know, for the sake of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's doing it because it makes you a more effective organization. If, you, if we want to be uh, leaders across the world, let's use the strength of the United States, which is co completely underpinned by our, the diversity of what we bring as, as a country to any problem that, that we face. Um, it, I, it feels to me that, you know, this is, and in fact, there's a lot of studies that prove that diverse organizations, inclusive organizations, are the most effective organizations that you can have. And so I think of it not just on a principle of doing the right thing, but doing the right thing for the mission. Being the best at what we do as a country, as an organization, is about creating a space where people can come every day, be their whole selves, not expend energy worrying about whether they fit in, but expending energy on about where they can contribute and make things better. And um, you know, that, it, that, that takes intentionality, it takes work, but it is, it is about mission execution. If, and, and if we don't get it right, we're gonna be behind. So we heard some somewhat daunting statistics earlier today about the number of individuals across the IC that are either almost at retirement age or will be approaching retirement age in, in the next few years. Um, it was a lot. I don't remember the numbers because I'm not great with numbers, but somebody out here I know does. But um, as far as recruitment and retention, mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on um, you know, ways you all are trying yeah. to change that up and enhance um, really the future of the IC workforce? Many of you all in the room who are, are part of that community. Yeah, absolutely. So, so first of all, um, go and apply on USA Jobs to our two OOP vacancies. We've got two vacancies for our ODNI onboarding program. This is for new entrants into the IC to come to NCTC and learn how to be the intelligence officer of the future, right? We've got uh, an announcement out right now hiring GF, GS7s and below, GS9s and below for data scientists and then just, just to be intelligence research analysts, right? Be an intelligence officer. And, um, and that's, the, that's the kind of new talent that we need to bring in, new perspective, but also um, new capability to the center that doesn't just build for the future of the counterterrorism mission, which again, remains a critically important mission. But if you come to a place like the National Counterterrorism Center, you can learn to be the most effective intelligence officer that um, that the IC is really required to build today. We care about big data analytics, AI, ML, the latest techno technological solutions. We absolutely need to have a collaborative environment, and NCTC is the kind of place where people from different agencies come together to tackle a problem in the most sort of interagency way that they can. Counterterrorism is the kind of work where 
it is so outcome driven. It's not just what you know, but it's what you did about it, who you provided that information to, and what they were able to do to disrupt attacks and save lives. And having this sort of tactical to strategic impact on a daily basis, um, having the relationships across a very diverse set of national security players, having the kinds of uh, access to data that is unique and unlike any other place in government, whether it's on the foreign side or the domestic side, as we think about counterterrorism, is all about the kind of well-rounded intelligence officer that we want in every single mission for the future. And so when I think about us recruiting that new talent, um, I think about both ends of the spectrum. One. Who did we talk to before those announcements went out? And how do we make sure that that talent pool that comes into our organization is as diverse as I just said we really want it to be? Right? What were the universities that we did outreach to? Um, how have we made sure that we have even introduced ourselves as the National Counterterrorism Center to a world of national security interested professionals um, who know that they can come to a place that is will inspire them to do their best work, right? So, um, so, so the front end of recruitment, I think, is really critical in getting to as many uh, Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges, um, getting to as many parts of the country as possible, whether it's you know, the East Coast, the West Coast, the heart of Texas, up in, in Chicago, or Mercyhurst, Pennsylvania, or wherever you can go, um, we want all great talent to look at the opportunity to come into the IC through NCTC as the opportunity of a lifetime, and I really think it is. And then retaining that talent. I mean, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that the data tells us about the diversity of the, the intelligence community writ large is that we are, we are actually not too bad about bringing good talent in, how we retain them, how we promote them, how we make sure their share of representation is continued as the pay increases, that we are not doing good on, on those metrics. We have lots of room to improve. And so creating a place that people want to stay, creating an environment where they see themselves in the leadership that, um, that they have, where they see the opportunity that they can achieve, um, where, where the visibility of that kind of opportunity is clear, uh, that's really important as well. And so we, we are spending a lot of time, when I think about the strategic pillars of my organization, how we make NCTC a place where the workforce of the, of the future is going to, is going to thrive is, is absolutely critical. So once you all attract these data scientists and analysts to NCTC, and then they get a conditional job offer, mm -hmm. and they wait um, what can sometimes be quite a bit of time to get their clearance, but well worth the wait, definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, what, what type of advice would you give um, folks junior in the workforce um, specific to NCTC? Um, yeah, there's, there's so many different things that I wish I knew coming in. Um, I guess first, what I would say is um, wherever you start in the intelligence community, um, don't be so focused on where you want to go next that you forget to do the job that you have. right? Um, and, and think about the job that you have not just as the stepladder to the next grade or the stepladder to the next position or your you know, grand scheme to become the National Counterterrorism Center director one day. Think of it as a, a place where you will have unexpected growth and unexpected opportunity come to you, and you will be forced to make a decision on um, on what how that changes your path. Uh, every almost every job I have had has been a surprise to me. I did not plan to be a global supply chain senior executive at a multinational company. I did not plan to be the NCTC director. I did not plan to be a deputy assistant secretary of defense at the Pentagon. And thank God I was each of those things uh, at different times in my career. And so, um, so that would be one, I think, important thing is don't, don't focus so much on what you want to do next that you forget to get what you should out of the job you're doing now and contribute what you should in the job you're doing now. And then the other thing I would say is 
know your value, and have a point of view. Um, I remember when I was at the NSC, uh, I was I was staff staffing Lisa Monaco, the um, you know, President Obama's counterterrorism advisor, and so that meant that I was in the back of the room in a lot of different senior level meetings, including with the president. And we had some internal meeting. It was relatively small. His senior, uh, President Obama was there. His senior advisors were there. Um, they were debating a pretty hot button issue in the national security world. And those were always just fascinating to, to kind of see how the president thought about things, how different people brought different perspectives to him. And I remember, you know, they'd kind of gotten to a point in the conversation, and he looked around the room at the smattering of staff like me who were back there. And he was like, well, you know, we're done debating. Why don't you guys tell me what you think? You guys are here because you know what you're actually talking about. Why don't, why don't you tell me what you think? And he went person by person with, well, what do you think? Well, what do you think? What do you think? And, um, and I just remember sitting there sweating, like, oh my god, what do I think? What do, I, what, do I even know what I'm talking about? What is this meeting that I'm in? And, um, but, it, but it was really clear to me um, then, and it should have been clear before then, <coughs> that I'm, I wasn't in the meeting to take notes. I was in the meeting because I had value and a point of view. And every meeting since, I have gone into ready to provide my value add and my point of view. And I haven't always needed to. It hasn't always been warranted. But I was always prepared to. And you have to always be prepared to know your value and share your point of view. It's like always plan that the professor is going to ask you a question. That's right. And it's refreshing to know that you didn't have a path completely mapped out. Um, I imagined, as I do with a lot of leaders, that you know you dressed up as the NCTC director for Halloween every year when you were a little kid, right? You always <laughs> knew that's what what you How wanted. How did you know? I, I just I felt yeah. that. So um, it is refreshing that not everybody has it has it all figured out um, when when they're in preschool. And so. I was advantaged because I didn't. <laughs> So. so be open to opportunities, and, and I think right. believe in yourself is a, is a good message. So uh, we've talked today about mentors, sponsors, mm -hmm. allies, champions, all very important um, individuals I think that we can have um, at different times or maybe throughout you know, our entire careers. Anyone specific you want to call out who um, you, you would like to credit with um, maybe lifting you up or making you take the job that you didn't think you were ready for, but you really were? Um, I would like to credit a number of people, but they would all be really mad since this is on the record that it I is. put their names out there. Um, but, but what I would say is um, I, have had, I have had lots of different types of bosses. And it wasn't until about halfway through my career how much I realized how much who I worked for mattered. And, um, you know, before I just thought I could do the work, I could do the work in any environment and I'll make it work. But when I all of a sudden was exposed to people who were just a different level of talent, different level of engaged, different level of caring for me as a human being, that, that mattered a lot. And I experienced that in a number of different places in my career. And, and it made me want to seek it out over and over again. And so I would say that. Um, you know, I am really fortunate to be able to work for somebody like Avril Haynes. I was really fortunate to learn from somebody like Lisa Monaco. My, my boss at Dell Technologies is, is phenomenal on so many different levels, and I learned so much about leadership, but humanity and human leadership from him. I saw just amazing work in some of the most difficult circumstances in the West Wing from some of the leaders there. And, um, and, and I've taken something from each of them as I've tried to figure out my own path to leadership. So I feel really fortunate. Well, clearly, like, you've reflected that. So, um, so I want to take some questions from the audience. We have a microphone right here. Who would like to go first? Yep. Christy? OK. Yeah. And we All can right, hear you. Let's so, do it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm with the U.S. Geospatial Intelligence Foundation. Um, I think you and I were probably at DIA at around the same time in Sounds those right. early aughts. Mm -hmm. um, and um, after 9/11, that 
there were a lot of things that I and many other people in the intelligence community were exposed to, I imagine you were too, um, that were horrific. Things that, that, that were scary and just horrific, that, that were classified and that we were, uh, had access to. Um, and it occurs to me that probably in, in your role now, you're still exposed to things that are scary and horrific. Um, how are you personally um, nurturing your own resilience and how are you nurturing the resilience of your workforce given that mission? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. It's actually come up in a couple of different ways, especially you know, as we're, we're here just after the 9-11 the anniversary. It, 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 um, I think it really hits home for so many of us, either reflecting on what we have experienced in the past or, or even, again, to your point, what, what we deal with on a regular basis given the persistent nature of the threat. Um, you know, I, I think that there is more space for this conversation about needed, the need for personal resilience now than uh, was true when we were at, at, in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 and, um, and kind of resilience wasn't a conversation. It was all about mission execution and move on. And, and, and I think to some detriment to all of us. Um, so, that we have created the space for resilience, that I have um, analysts in my organization when tasked with something that is not absorbable for them, they, they can voice that and we can find a different opportunity. We can, um, we can look at different solutions to make that uh, much more manageable for individuals as well as teams. Um, you know, I, I think that's really important. One of the things I love most about NCTC is, is this culture of levity. You know, you, you've got to have it. And, and the quirkiness of our culture is one of the most fun things that creates that environment of family and, and um, creates a space to do something other than kind of reflect so, I don't know, deeply on, on some of the real challenges that we have. Um, we do, uh, every year for Mental Health Awareness Month, we do a mental health awareness panel where I am constantly amazed by the bravery of our officers willing to come up on stage in front of all of their coworkers and talk about their very personal struggles with mental health. And that, that act of normalizing it, um, that, that space that we intentionally create to enable those conversations, I think is a really big deal. For me personally, what I do is uh, I run. <laughs> I need to run. Um, uh, it's better for my team if I run. Otherwise, I'm like not the best person to be around. So I run. I, I try and actually you know, compartmentalize in a way that allows me to leave work and leave work behind, go home. And um, you know, the, the charm of raising a three and a half year old is the questions that he asks that have nothing to do with the crazy things you saw that day. And, uh, and more about bodily functions and other things that you never really thought you'd have to articulate. It's amazing the, the ways to answer the question why, <laughs> depending on the context. Anyway, so that, that really helps for me. Yeah. Other questions? Hi, I'm Jackie Barbieri. I'm the CEO and founder of White Space. Um, so we've heard a bunch of different times today the theme of women not feeling they're qualified for a position, mm -hmm. and you went so far as to say you even talked people out of hiring you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really interesting. Uh, I guess the question is, why? Mm -hmm. And did, was it different reasons at different points in your career? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it's it's sort of amazing that the only time I get to be introspective is in public. But, um, <laughs> but it's a it's a really good question, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, I put it down to sort of self confidence. Um, in some ways, I put it down to kind of the burden of leadership and and how much you kind of understand uh, that is required of you and whether or not you're at the point in your life that you actually want to do it. Um, you know, and, and some of it comes down to this 
you know, the, what you said, Suzanne, this like list of 10 qualifications, nine you have to check every box for when like, you know, the, the gentleman you're competing against maybe check two and talk to the rest, right? This, this idea that um, we have to be the expert, we have to know everything about what we're about to do, about the challenge we're gonna take on, as if we have to have done the job to be able to right. apply for the job. Like to me, that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing you have to overcome. I think the self-confidence issues, I think sort of the, the, is it the right time in your life to take on this big challenge issue? I mean, those are things that you just have to navigate um, at any given time. And, and it, they've certainly come up in different, in different ways for me, depending on where I was in my career. But, but this idea that I'm not qualified and that I have to be perfectly qualified to be successful um, I, I, I think that sort of as women, we have to get over that hurdle. I think as women, we have to be willing, again, to, to take on jobs that you may have never done, but that your leadership will make better. And have confidence not in our expertise, but have confidence in our ability to lead, to manage teams, to navigate complexity. You know, I think about this supply chain organization, this global operations organization in the private sector that, um, that I had the fortune of leading. And you know, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't do that job because of my excellent counterterrorism background. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, yeah, there was nothing that would have told you that that was the next right job for an expert in uh, the intelligence world and US government policymaking around counterterrorism in South Asia. Um, and I did it, and I was good at it and I really enjoyed it and I learned and I grew and I uh, was exposed to a whole different way of thinking, a whole different culture of working and I am so glad that I did it. Um, and so sort of for me, getting out of this tendency to want to be expert at what I was going to do next when that's sort of an impossible challenge for yourself was really important, again, as I thought about this job at NCTC and about taking it on um, and being willing to take it on as a real time of leadership transition, a time of transformation for the community, um, and at a time where you know I'd never thought I was going to be a presidential appointee, and, and yet you know I felt like I was absolutely ready for the challenge and probably for the first time. So, um, so I would say that we've got to get out of our own way as women and be willing to, to go into the unknown and have confidence that we can navigate it and lead our way through it. I really like that, done the job and we're able, able to do the job because I thought that's how everybody thought. Like, I haven't done that job, why would they give me that job? Right, right. right. so uh. anyway. Nazareth? Yes. Oh, go ahead, sorry, you're next Nazareth. Didn't see the mic back there. Just a sec, yep, you're next, thanks. America Camerota from OSD. Um, Ma'am, I really resonated with what you said about being a young woman and you know having a point of view in the room, you're not there to take notes. And so how have you handled the challenge of having your voice heard and your opinions in those larger meetings? During our lunch session, they talked about how a lot of women have their point of view and then you know somebody else gets credit for that point of view. And so yeah. how have you handled that challenge and how are you ensuring that others have that moment to share their point of views? Yeah, no, that, um, that still happens all the time, right? Um, but I, look, I, I think that um, it goes back to, to the advice that I provided, right? Know your value and be willing to share your point of view. And um, kind of having that mentality walking into the room means that you're prepared to do it confidently in a way that actually resonates, right? You know, you, sitting in meetings knowing who your audience is, understanding the energy in the room and what you want to get out of it is really important to being able to walk into that room and be confident in what you're going to say at the point at which it's appropriate to say it. And sort of, you know, I think women are, have really, really high EQ. We're really good at understanding those dynamics. We have to have the confidence to step into those dynamics and shift the room in a direction that favors the, the point of view that we want to, to convey. 
But, but a lot of this is about sort of flexing your style to the moment that you're in and, and really having the confidence to just engage and that your point of view is going to be heard and absorbed. And if you go in kind of thinking nobody's going to listen to me, or if you go in waiting for somebody to override or say what you said but slightly better or different, and so all of a sudden it's their idea, then that's just going to take away from your focus on being able to represent confidently. So um, walk into the room and know you've got something to say. Nazareth Berhane, I work at ODNI as IC Centers for Academic Excellence. Uh, mm -hmm. Pleasure to be here and listen to you uh, share about your journey. Um, speaking of journey, if you were to speak to your younger self mm -hmm. uh, out of college, what would you tell yourself? Mm -hmm. Would you do something differently? And if so, what is it and why? So Ooh, many questions. Man, really good question. Um, Um, I, I would have been more willing to say yes to the challenges, and in fact, I would have gone farther um, and actually sought out the challenges. Uh, when I was a young analyst, I was really fortunate to be in an organization that, again, it was building. They built me from the ground up, and they put me in circumstances where I had an opportunity to succeed. Um, I didn't seek those out. I wasn't really aggressive about, um, about looking for the next briefing opportunity or the, the next deployment opportunity. But when those were presented to me, I was always all for it. And, I was, and it took somebody else to tell me that I was ready to, to actually go for it. Um, I, I probably would have just kind of defined for myself what I wanted and gone for it sooner. You know, as much as I kind of applaud myself for not planning my career, <laughs> um, there, there's also downsides to that. It, I, I avoided it in some ways. Um, I, I, it's worked out. I, I'm so happy to be able to have landed where I've landed. Um, but if, if I could go, go back and do it over, I would be more thoughtful about not the next job I wanted or how to get in front of that four-star general debrief, but I would have been more thoughtful about how I wanted to grow and what the next opportunity would have taught me if I had gone for it. And, um, and, and I would have driven my career as opposed to having other people tell me how to drive it. I'm Kelleen Brusecker. I'm from LMI, and I just want to say thank you um, for what you're doing and keeping the mission alive. I actually served um, in CTC and in NCTC, um, so thank you for everything. Um, thank you. I, I will say as we get farther away from 9-11 and budget shifts mm -hmm. and priorities change, um, you, you talked about this a little bit with recruiting, but mm -hmm. how are you keeping the workforce engaged, focused, yeah. excited? And the other part would be um, positioning NCTC yeah. for the future and keeping this critical mission yeah. in front of the policymakers, even with all the other noise that's going around. Thank you so much for that question. Like, uh, we did, I did not plant it, and you should come back to NCTC. Let me just tell you. Um, so um, when I allude to the time of transformation that we're in in the counterterrorism environment, it's exactly to the point of your question, which is um, other national security priorities are center stage. By the way, you're welcome. Other national security priorities are center stage. We have done a really good job in the counterterrorism community, and this is the broad enterprise of protecting against another 9-11. And that is no small feat, and it's, and it's a job that's never done, right? Eternal vigilance in the counterterrorism fight is absolutely essential. And the longer you're successful at that, the less purchase your argument for it has because people's memories fade. Um, and it's our job to make sure that our memories don't fade. I think it's our job in the counterterrorism enterprise to, to 
to be on watch so the rest of the government doesn't always have to. You know, I, I look back at the 20 years of my career in the counterterrorism field, and I think that um, the focus that we had in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 distracted us from what are today major priorities of you know, an adversarial environment, great power competition, the kinds of technological advancements that we need to stay cutting edge on, the cybersecurity environment, and so, so many different challenges that can and should be front of mind. But to keep them front of mind, we need a foundational counterterrorism effort that allows us to do that. And I think that when I look at the National Counterterrorism Center, when I look at the workforce that we have, when I look across the CT enterprise at the kinds of work that happens in a collaborative fashion that is second nature to what we do, um, it is that core capability that as the leader of the National Counterterrorism Center, I'm really focused on sustaining. Um, for NCTC, I, I, you know, this, we are an organization that was an experiment after 9-11, an experiment in interagency collaboration, an experiment in uh, information sharing, an experiment in, in outcome-driven intelligence, intelligence operations, right? Intelligence-informed operational success. And you know we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the establishment of the center, and, and I am really proud to see the results. In a time of shrinking focus or shrinking counterterrorism community, of shifting focus away from counterterrorism, it's exactly that kind of experiment that you actually need to institutionalize and sustain. And, and as as we think about ourselves internally in the organization, as we think about the role that NCTC should play, not just in ODNI, but as part of the overall counterterrorism, we have an, a really important leadership mantle to hold. And being able to drive the counterterrorism enterprise, to see all parts of the counterterrorism enterprise, to protect what's, what's most needed to be protected in that counterterrorism enterprise so we can continue to perform, there's no vantage like the vantage that we have at NCTC to be able to do that. So I've charged my workforce to take on that mantle of leadership. I've charged my workforce to bear the responsibility on behalf of the national security world for the counterterrorism work that can and must continue. And it's that sort of level of burden, that level of responsibility that uh, every day when I walk in and I see these analysts perform their mission, every day in my morning brief when I get the parade of horribles and ask, well, who has that information? What's this agency doing about it? The fact that we can answer that, the fact that we know that the system is working, and when it's not, that we can fix it, um, that, is, that is core. That's core to national security, it's core to, to why we exist, and it's exactly the reason that we should continue to, to be able to lead on what is, I think, a foundational need for national security. So thank you for the question. I love being part of the CT Enterprise. This is a hard time to be part of navigating the future of counterterrorism, but I'm at a place where there's no place like it, so thanks. We have time for one more question back here in the red. Jill Wood with ODNI, and I have more of a comment than a question for you, Director. Um, I joined uh, NCTC 10 years ago. It was my first foray into the IC after spending about 20 years at the Pentagon at OSD. So I was there before, during, and after 9-11. And to your question on how we keep the mission alive, um, NCTC does an, a 9-11 training course that stood up during my time there. And when they asked me, when my colleagues asked me, hey, Jill, you worked at the Pentagon. Um, you, you know, how can you offer us? Can you give us a tour at the Pentagon Memorial? I said, absolutely. And even more importantly, I can put you in touch with my boss, who was at the Pentagon and worked directly for Secretary Rumsfeld the day the plane hit. Mm -hmm. And to this day, he's still participating yep. in your training program. And I'm now on a joint duty assignment working for him at a different agency. So mm -hmm. I would say, you know, from my experience, it's that connective tissue that we all continue to have with one another, and it's so critical because 
uh, we, we have to keep that, that memory and that mission alive in order to do our jobs better every day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for that. And thanks for being part of that mission. So, Christy, thank you, and um, yeah. thank you for being so introspective and public <laughs> with our attendees. Um, yeah, really I think I might regret it later. No, no, really appreciate cool. your candor. So, I'm going to ask my colleague John to close us out for the afternoon. Okay. Uh, again, thank you, Christy. Can we have another round of applause? Please. Um, and also, join me in thanking all of our panelists everyone who participated today. It's been a really astounding day. I'd also like to thank our sponsors who made this day possible. Thank you to GDIT, Guidehouse, Lockheed Martin, Mantech, Noble Reach, Northeastern University, Raytheon Technologies, and SAIC for your generous support. How about a round of applause? Um, also, we've had some great partners, some who've been part of the panels uh, here today. We've AWIC, Clearance Jobs, the Cyber Guild, Girl Security, the Iron Butterfly Foundation, and USGIF. Um, <laughs> hey, we've covered a lot of ground. It wouldn't be an INSA event if I didn't remind you to provide us feedback when the, the uh, email survey you'll receive later today. We do take, uh, we read all your feedback and it helps shape the programs uh, that, uh, for next year. Also, we did record these sessions. Thank you to SAIC for being our uh, digital playback sponsor. Those will be posted on the INSA website in the coming days. Uh, I hope to see everybody here. I we'll hope you'll stick around for our networking reception. And I forgot my prop. We've got giveaways. We've got INSA <laughs> branded lunch bags with goodies in them. Uh, surprising things. Please pick up one on your way out. Um, hey, at the reception, we'll have lots of food and drink. And we're going to have a cornhole and a putting contest oh. to help raise money Ooh. for scholarships for the INSA Foundation scholarships. Um, there's going to be prizes as well, including the grand prize, wine and cheese, for three people with Tish Long at her penthouse suite in Alexandria. Yeah. And uh, there's also some other prizes as well, uh, including a wood personalized charcuterie board, courtesy of Brian Dennison, um, who also made our INSIF and INSA branded corn holes games. Okay. Anyhow, wow. lots more fun Great out job, there. John. Please consider donating. All the money will go to uh, the scholarships. Um, and thank you for coming today. See you soon at another INSA event. <laughs>